Hi friends, welcome back to my channel. I got hit with a nasty cold and so I sound really funny today. I apologize for that. Thank you all for being here. I'm very, very excited to share Lux's story with you. Lux is probably my favorite Kringle sister and I say that with a grain of salt because I absolutely love every single Kringle sister and readers especially love Stella. She is um, a firecracker and so and she's not afraid to go after what she wants but Lux is a little bit different she's more the quiet studious type and the reason that I love her so much is because she her most attractive quality is her brains even though she's stunningly gorgeous so this is the book that landed me on a watch list on the internet um, apparently you cannot research how to build an electrical substation without triggering some suspicion with the government <laughs> and those who watch these things as i was trying to make this book as true to life as possible and make it as accurate as possible i needed to know what problems lux and quick would come up against as they were trying to build the substation for christmas magic and so i actually was studying substations when um, websites would get shut down on me just randomly it would be like i'd be in the middle of reading paragraphs and it would all of a sudden close out and say this site is no longer available and i was like that was just there <laughs> hit the back button and nothing would happen and so then i do a search and i would go to the next one on the list and i'd be halfway through articles and the same thing would happen and i realized after that what was going on and thought oh no i'm in a lot of trouble <laughs> So rather than have a bunch of FBI or CIA agents show up at my house, I should probably not put this in this video or I'll get shut down again. <laughs> so I just want to reiterate here for anybody who is still probably monitoring me a couple years later, I'm not trying to break America and I just want to write a sweet Christmas romance. <laughs> so I'd like to share that with you now. I hope you enjoy Lux and her story and Matthew, and I'll see you on the flip side. Lux, a marrying Miss Kringle romance novel. Written by Lucy McConnell. Chapter one. Christmas Eve. 365 days until next Christmas Eve. Lux Kringle pushed the rectangular-shaped glasses to the top of her head. The glasses had a special blue coating to protect her eyes from screen strain. Frost, her baby sister, insisted they were better looking than the old glasses she'd worn since college. Granted, college was a decade ago, so ocular fashion could have changed. Lux wasn't really one to keep up on that stuff. Frost, on the other hand, kept up on everything. That was her job and her nature. She couldn't let a catalog, fashion magazine, or letter to Santa cross her desk without devouring the contents. Frost could have her mail room job. Lux much preferred to spend her time creating code and wiring the North Pole to keep it humming. She'd spent the last couple years studying Christmas magic. Her dad called her a pioneer in the science, Christmas magic was an energy source unparalleled in the known universe and basically unstudied. One of her great-great-great-grandfathers had written up a booklet, but it was sorely outdated. Christmas magic was constantly changing. At least, it had changed in her lifetime. Which made studying the magic a necessary endeavor. Luck sat in her mother's chair at the Goliath fireplace in the Kringle family room. On the opposite wall was a flat-screen television where she could watch Captain America hold a helicopter to the ground all day long if she wanted. Sometimes, she really wanted to. Behind her, the wall was lined with bookshelves containing the latest in popular fiction as well as her mother's snow globe collection. Across from her sat the man with the big white beard. This was Dad's first Christmas as a retired Santa and having him home was a bit strange. Ginger and her new husband, Joseph, had taken over deliveries. Right after their last drop-off, they were headed to an unknown location for a honeymoon. Lux considered her dad as she often considered things under a microscope, 
looking for changes she could record in a notebook. Dad didn't look any older. There were no new laugh lines to crinkle around his eyes. His lips were still cherry red and plump. His belly rounded out of his shirt, belaying his penchant for all types of cookies and sweets. Instead of shoulders slumped as they normally were on a Christmas Eve, they were back, strong, and not speaking of exhaustion. He had one black boot resting on his other knee. Retirement seemed to agree with him. Popular science lay open on his lap, and he licked his thumb before turning the page. Lux had given him a three-year subscription for Christmas last year. The gift was sort of selfish on her part as she read every issue, but she always waited for him to finish them before she took the magazine to her room. Blinking as her eyes adjusted to the firelight and lower level of lighting, she tucked red and unruly hair behind both her ears. Dad, she said quietly. Yeah. Lux waited, but he didn't look up from the article. Her gaze lifted to the family portrait above the mantel, where she and her four sisters crowded around their parents who stared adoringly at one another. Lux wasn't loud and flirty like Stella or commanding like Ginger, nor super cute like Frost with her original sense of style, nor charismatic like Robin, who was always the perfect hostess. Sometimes Lux felt as invisible as a kilobyte in the midst of her siblings. And yet, she had something to say, something important. Earlier that evening Lux had informed the family that, though Ginger's marriage to Joseph had saved Christmas this year, their nuptials were a temporary fix. In order to secure Christmas for years to come, all five of Santa's daughters had to get married. Not everyone was happy about the announcement. Dad. She tapped his knee. Yes. This time his twinkling blue eyes focused on her. Lux immediately dropped her gaze to the floor. Censoring herself, she lifted her gaze. She'd been working on making eye contact. We've got a problem. Dad leaned heavily on the arm of the chair. Honey, can you give us a couple weeks, maybe months, to get used to Ginger being married before I have to think about losing another daughter? Lux twisted her lips as she tried to see all this from her dad's point of view. But Ginger and Joseph live here. You didn't lose her. Dad gave her one of his indulgent Santa smiles. I'm not the number one man in her life anymore, that's a hard loss for any father to take. Oh. In her head, this was an addition problem, not a subtraction one. They had not only added Joseph Bear to the family, but also his bright niece, Layla. She'd gotten her first brother and her first niece all in one neat little package deal. She tugged at the ends of her hair. As per usual, she'd miscalculated when it came to social cues and family dynamics. She crossed her arms over her chest and hunched forward. Honey, it's not your fault. Goodness, you take on the world's problems. Dad patted her knee. I know. Putting her glasses back on, she sat up straighter but kept her arms tucked close to her body. Dad, I've examined the setup we have now. We've added new electronics and machinery, things that didn't exist 10 or 20 years ago. They're all running on Christmas power. We aren't equipped to handle a full dose of Christmas magic. What do you mean? If we all get married, we'll blow this place up. Dad's white eyebrows inched up his forehead. He usually wore a red hat. Not always the traditional hat with the pom-pom at the end, but a baseball hat, a beanie, and, once upon a snowstorm, a cowboy hat. His tall forehead was shiny in the firelight. Solution? he asked. She shrugged, the answer obvious. Install a substation. What a brilliant solution. Lux dropped her gaze, blushing under his praise. Will an electrical substation work? We can order parts through our energy company in the Ukraine. Lux had already been online looking at parts. Electricity travels at certain speeds through a substation, Christmas magic matches that to go through our electronics and such, 
but there are other elements in the magic that make me think an electrical substation would need to be modified. He leaned back, stroking his beard as he thought over what she'd said. Problems. Luck swallowed. I don't have the knowledge or education to do this on my own. She had degrees in computer engineering, programming, and physics, but electrical engineering was a specialty she hadn't pursued. Dad smiled easily. So get another degree. While she appreciated his confidence in her, an electrical engineering degree would take two more years at the university. I don't have time. We're barely hanging in there with Ginger and Joseph together. Installing and testing the circuit breakers alone takes two weeks. Or so she'd read. Dad tapped his finger against his lips. Is there someone we can consult with? Anyone who can teach you what you need to know? Lux stuck her hands between her knees to keep from twisting her fingers together. She did that when she was nervous, and thoughts of Quick, the man she'd met in Clearview, Alaska, made her extremely nervous. The small amount of time they'd spent together rewiring the church for the Christmas pageant told her he was the man she needed to make this substation happen. He'd been quiet but knowledgeable, and when she'd slipped in a couple questions about vacuum circuit breakers, he'd rattled off the answers as if they were common knowledge. They weren't. There is, but no one on earth has ever seen this stuff. He'd, she cleared her throat. He'd have to come here. Dad blew out a heavy sigh. Lux, there are limits. She hung her head. Of all the people in the family, Dad would be the one to understand how important this was, yet he was bound by the magical limits as much as anyone. Santa's palace was invisible to the outside world. She could drop a person right on top of the North Pole and unless they were tied to the magic by blood or by marriage, they wouldn't see a thing. She dropped her chin to her chest. I know. Ever the jolly one, Dad chuckled softly. There are ways Lux. Draw up plans and take them down there for him to review. He waved his hand toward the south. We'll do what we can. Maybe we can video chat during construction. Lux nodded. She tucked her hands into the pockets of her boyfriend Cardigan as she got to her feet. Talking to Dad was the easy part of all this, after all, her dad was Santa. One of his job descriptions was giving the child on his lap his undivided attention. Lux was not a child. At 28 years old, she was even beyond the young lady stage. I'll do what I can. His gaze softened. I enjoy our talks, Lux. You're intelligent, you challenge me, and you constantly delight me with your ingenuity. Lux leaned over and wrapped her arms around her dad's neck. He was warm from the fire and smelled of peppermint. Thanks, Dad. He had a gift for making her feel special, because she was different from her sisters, not in spite of her differences. One day, after her sisters were all married and the palace and magic were safe, she'd think about finding a husband who thought as much of her as her father did. He patted her back and then she was off, ready to take on this next adventure. She was always happiest when she was mentally engaged, and nothing engaged Lux like exploring the unknown in science. Christmas magic was the ultimate unknown, and she was the first Kringle to harness the power, sending it into everything from toy-making machines to the kitchen ovens. Lux made her way out of the family's living quarters, down the hall of Santa's past where portraits of her great-grandfathers lined the walls. The gilded frames brought out the gold threading on their Santa suits and, in some of them, the twinkle in their eyes. She'd studied them all many times before, looking for genetic links. Since she and her sisters were all so different in coloring, they each had to look in the past to find similarities. Lux had decided she was most like her great-great-grandfather Earl Kringle. He also had deep red hair though his was much shorter and slicked into place with some kind of grease. At least, she thought there was grease involved, because his hair had more shine than the Santas who came before or after him. 
The portrait must have been done before he married, because most Santas didn't go gray until after they said, I do. His eyes were also green, though his were a light mint green and hers were darker, like moss. Instead of studying the portraits on her walk, her eyes stayed on the jolly, green carpet with the holly design woven in gold and didn't meet the eyes of her grandfather and great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather or their predecessors in their red, green, and white fur-lined coats. Her thoughts were geared toward the future. Up until Christmas magic upset everything and branded Ginger with the snowflake tinsel tattoo instead of Robin, they were all under the impression that the oldest had to be married first. Hence Robin had gotten serious with Elmer in college. They'd recently broken up, which meant that any one of the sisters could be married next. Stella had been chomping at the bit to catch a cowboy ever since she was in college. She was a huge flirt and had several online boyfriends to pick from. She also loved to fly and wouldn't mind commuting anywhere in the world for a date. That could make for a short engagement. The pressure to figure out this substation mounted. If Stella married before the station was up and working, they'd fry everything electrical with one big power surge. As if Lux needed more pressure. The science she could learn, the drafting program she could figure out, and the heavy lifting. Well, that's what they had tractors and reindeer for. No, none of this was too daunting, except working with Quick. He was smart, too smart. Keeping her lineage a secret would be difficult with a man who noticed the smallest details. She'd have to hide the fact that she maintained a steady temperature no matter what the ambient temperature was, and she wasn't that good of an actress. No Kringle could tell a lie to save their life. Okay, maybe Stella could. Out of all of them, she was the closest to the naughty list. The biggest problem with approaching Quick and asking for help was that when Quick was near Lux felt that zap thing Ginger and Stella had talked about. The zap thing that made her insides float like baby reindeer and fly like Blitzen jacked up on sweet carrots. The zap thing that brought to mind things like mistletoe and had her humming, baby, it's cold outside. She couldn't afford to do either of those things with Quick. No, she needed to keep the lid on her zapping and stay focused on the substation. If she wasn't careful, she'd blow up the North Pole while trying to save it. Chapter 2 January 1st 357 Days Till Christmas Eve A New Year's storm was not uncommon in Clearview, Alaska. Matthew Quick had seen his share of them in the last five years. This year's storm was not the raging wind and stinging snowflakes he'd come to expect in the harsh life of a homesteader. The giant clumps of snow fell as if dusting a cake. He had an image of a pillow bursting open with feathers in the shape of snowflakes floating to the earth. He shook off the fanciful thinking. Better to remember that snow like this could bury a man in the space of an hour rather than stand in front of the trading post admiring its beauty. He pushed the door open, bringing an icy blast of air with him. Kazu didn't look up from the crossword book open in front of him on the counter. His grey ponytail was held back with a string of leather and his skin was lined like the grain in a hundred-year-old tree. A five-letter word for an agent that makes things visible, he said. Light, answered quick before he had a chance to censor himself. He slammed his lips together. He wasn't supposed to be smart, and he sure as heck wasn't supposed to be friendly. He was supposed to be a quiet guy who called in about bears and wolves when they passed his outpost. Howdy quick. Kazu smiled as he wrote the answer in block letters. When he was done, he put his pen in the crease to save his place and closed the book, sliding it to the end of the counter. Kazu. Quick dipped his head and made long strides toward the canned goods in the back. We've got a good selection of beans now. Not sure what we'll have next month. Yep. Short answers stopped conversation. Quick packed several boxes of refried beans to the front counter. He added canned corn, soup, stew, tomatoes, potatoes, and sauerkraut, which he didn't particularly enjoy but would eat just to have the variety of something he didn't like on the table. 
Next, he went to the dried foods, selecting deer and beef jerky and noodles. There was a package of peppermints calling to him, so he threw that on his pile as well. That everything? asked Kazu. His hair may have been gray, but his eyebrows were still black. Yep. Kazu began ringing up the items on his ancient cash register. The avocado green machine looked like it had come right out of the 1960s. Kazu could have rung him up while Quick was bringing things to the counter, but he'd gone back to his crossword. Quick didn't watch him work, the prices would be higher than San Diego prices whether he was looking or not. Last year, the price of fuel had gone up enough to cause a stir. Quick was more careful than some. He had a greenhouse where he grew fresh veggies and a pressure cooker he used to can what he didn't consume. Since it was just him, stocking food away for the winter kept him busy, but he didn't feel the constant drive a man with a family or a wife would feel. Now there was a thought. A wife. Not one to be particularly needy Quick's desire for company surprised him. Especially his desire for company of the female persuasion. Perhaps it was the long, cold nights or the way the big sky full of stars made him feel so small, but lately, the desire to find a companion with soft eyes and soft lips snuck up on him. He shoved those thoughts away. There was no use dwelling on what he couldn't have. He'd had his shot at a domestic life, and that hadn't worked out for any of them. He took a moment to look around in an effort to distract himself. He could use a new shirt. This one had a hole at the bottom. Not that anyone had mentioned his disheveled appearance at the Christmas pageant and big wedding on Christmas Eve. He shook his head. He'd never seen anything like Joseph Bear and Ginger's wedding. All those fancy Christmas dresses and Joseph dressed like Santa himself. You wouldn't catch quick dressing like a fool for some woman. No matter how the light caught her red hair and turned it to gold. He flicked himself in the leg. He would not think about Lux. Been seeing a lot of you lately. Kazu handed the jerky across the counter, and Quick put it in the faded olive green army bag hanging on his back. Probably too much, Quick grumbled. He finished putting the smaller items in his bag and grabbed a box of corn. I'll be back for the rest in a minute. His snowmobile was parked out front, lined up perpendicular to the building, unlike the other snowmobiles on the street that were left haphazardly about. In the summer, Main Street was for pickup trucks, four-wheelers, and bicycles. In the winter, the snow was too deep for anything without tracks and skis. Quick set the corn in the small sled behind his machine and went back for the rest. The army pack stayed with him. Hey there Quick. Pastor Willis held the door open for him. How are things? Fine. Quick bent over and picked up two boxes. Pastor Willis held the door again as he went out. As far as pastors went, Willis wasn't so bad. He had a soft approach, not as much crying repentance as Quick was used to from the pastor he'd grown up with, but then people tended to be hard on themselves and didn't need a preacher adding to that. Thanks, Quick grunted. Quick dropped off his load and went back in for his last two boxes. Haven't seen them since the wedding. Pastor Willis shrugged. That's too bad. Those girls sure brightened up this town. Kazu frowned. Quick made the mistake of making eye contact with Pastor Willis. Eye contact was an invitation for conversation. How about you? Have you heard from Ginger or Lux? asked Willis. Quick looked him over. The man was about his age, maybe a little younger. He hadn't grown up in these parts. Quick remembered hearing once that Willis had been called to their region by the Holy Spirit, felt he had to find something up here. People came to Clearview for all sorts of reasons, and they didn't always stay. Willis should. He was a good man. Good man or not, there was no need to chew the fat. Every minute he was in town was one more liability he didn't need. Nope. No reason to. Quick hurried to the door. I thought you and Lux, started Willis with an interested tip to his head. Nope. Quick cut him off. Willis and Kazu exchanged a look. Quick stood by the door. Oh. Let me get that for you. 
Willis crossed the room to open the door for him. Quick hadn't been waiting for him to open it. No. He'd been wondering if these two were thinking he and Lux were connected because of something he had done or something she had done. Had she done, or even said, something that made them think? The cold air hit his cheeks and brought him back to himself. Thanks. Quick. Willis followed him out to the snowmobile. If you ever need someone to talk to, you know where to find me. Quick dropped the boxes in the sled. Hard. The sled sunk several inches in the snow. Great. Don't know what I'd say. It's not good for a man to be alone all the time. It does things to him. Willis's eyebrows wrinkled. He was a good guy, called to serve the people of Alaska. To him Quick must be one of the sheep who wandered off and needed to be brought back into the fold. If only the problems in Quick's life were that simple. He actually felt pretty good about where he was with God, it was where he was with man that kept him up at night. If I start hearing voices or talking to myself, I'll let you know. I guess that's fair. Willis stepped back so Quick could start up the machine. He gave a nod and pulled away, the sled bouncing out of its rut and then slipping along behind him as easy as you please. The trek out to his cabin wasn't marked by road signs. Quick had learned to find his way using nature's road markers. Turn left at the fallen pine. Give the lake a wide berth. Cut between Boulder Valley. Then drive for another 15 minutes. All in all, an hour-long trip that ensured no one came for a surprise visit. If the distance wasn't enough to keep people away, the grizzly bears, wolf packs, and his military sharp glares would do the trick. It may not be good for a man to be alone but it was all Quick could hope for in this life if he wanted to keep the people he cared about safe. The farther away he was from them, the safer they were. Chapter 3 January 26 332 days to Christmas Eve Lux put up a hand to stop Stella from climbing into the small green sleigh. You have a date. An online date. Stella folded her arms. I can do that from Clearview. It's still a date and therefore takes priority over my jaunt to town. We have less than twelve months for one of you, Lux cast a glance to Frost, who was harnessing Kennedy to the sleigh, to include her in the conversation. To get married. Lux checked to make sure she had her magic Kringle purse, no Kringle left home without hers. Ginger's was red leather polished, and poised like its owner. Lux's was an olive green messenger bag. Kids all over campus carried them when she was in college, and she'd wanted to fit in. She kept the design upon her return home. It worked with her layered t-shirts and cargo pants and canvas shoes. Although Frost had talked her into wearing a pair of black boots, winter coat, and a pair of snow pants today. Since they were going to civilization, they needed to blend in with the locals. The less attention they drew to themselves, the better. Lux pulled a beanie down over her hair. Selora, the head elf over stables, walked forward with a brush. Kennedy stomped his hoof and shook his antlers. Selora, if he's got an attitude, I'd just as soon take Dunder. She reached up to unhook the harness. Frost frowned. He'll be fine once we're in the air. Lux nodded. Exactly. His takeoffs are harder than peanut brittle. And just as bumpy. Frost stroked Kennedy's neck. You'll be good. Won't you, boy? Kennedy snorted. A snort that said he had no intention of making flying easy on Lux. She sighed. Stella smirked. If I drive we can take Prancer. Prancer was the Cadillac of reindeer. Within the vast stables, no animal flew as smooth, or as fast, as Prancer. Lux placed her hand over her belly. Flying fast was almost as bad as a bumpy takeoff. Neither Lux nor Frost had the skills to handle Prancer in the air. Stella, on the other hand, was just reckless enough to keep the reindeer on his toes. 
My flying issues aside, Stella, you need to stay here and do what you do best. What's that? asked Frost, her head tipped to the side, causing her long white hair to fall over her shoulder. Flirt. Lux grinned. Stella slapped her shoulder. I am way better at making toys than flirting. Whatever. Ginger walked through the door. She wore a red-tiered skirt and black boots with a white tee. The outfit was casual Santa, and she carried herself with a confidence Lux envied. Ginger laughed and poked Stella's shoulder. You're the Olympic champion of flirts. Stella brushed her nails across her shoulder. Then I'm a gold medal toy maker too. I can't help it if men find me irresistible. The feeling is mutual. Ginger hooked her arm through Stella's. Come on, while they're away you can show me your date's profile, and we can run a background search on him. Stella's eyes brightened. My kind of background search. Stella had mad hacking skills. She could find out what a guy got on his fourth grade states and capitals test, how much was left on his mortgage, and if he'd ever served time. All the information was helpful when weeding out potential husbands, but Ginger was Santa now. Santa had her own ways of finding out if a guy was worthy of her sisters. I was thinking we could check his status on the lists and then go through his old letter requests. Boring. Stella rolled her eyes. We could go to the workshop and watch Joseph carve a bench. He's got one almost done. Naughty list, here we come. Stella swung Ginger around by the elbow and headed for the door. Let me know if there's any new guys in Clearview, she called over her shoulder. What makes you think your date's on the naughty list? asked Ginger as they walked away. Stella cocked her head to the side and swung her hips. Oh, honey, a woman can tell. Lux shrugged off Stella's disturbing idea of an acceptable date. She wasn't there to judge the men her sisters brought home. As long as they loved her sisters, that was all that mattered. With a resigned sigh, she took her seat in the sleigh. Though Kringles weren't susceptible to viruses Lux had a bad case of sleigh sickness. Mom said she'd thrown up on her very first flight and everyone since then. That wasn't necessarily true. There had been at least five sleigh rides where she hadn't tossed her cookies. Three of those were with Dunder. Selora led the aging reindeer out of his stall. He moved slowly, his hips taking time to loosen up. Go easy on him, he's not a first flurry reindeer anymore. She patted his neck. Dunder didn't have eyebrows, but if he did, he would have lifted one to give Selora an I'm humoring you look. He's the one who has to take it easy on me. Lux leaned forward to talk to Dunder. Please. He stared at her long enough that she believed he understood her plea, and then he put himself in the perfect spot for harnessing. Frost chatted as she helped Selora. That's a beautiful vest, Selora. Thank you, Miss Frost. Solora's ears turned pink. I made it special. Frost grinned. You mean you made it to impress someone special? Solora's ears turned positively red. Well, I'm not wearing it for the reindeer. Frost smothered her giggle with her hand. Dunder stomped his back foot. The reindeer didn't like to wait while they stood around yakking. He was a get-on-the-wind-and-get-it-done kind of animal. Lux pulled a thick blanket over her lap, ready to pull it up over her head when the stable doors opened. If she didn't watch the ground disappear below them, then she wouldn't think about falling, and then she wouldn't get lightheaded, and then she wouldn't get queasy and then, her stomach rolled as if she'd eaten too much butter ripple fudge. She should stop thinking about what wouldn't happen. To ease her mind, she checked the compartment under the seat, where her laptop was snuggled between pieces of packing foam. She wanted Quick to check her equations, specifically the equations to evaluate the ampacity of a conductor with no material constants and the ground grid to remote earth without metallic conductors before she drew the plans for the substation. 
Some things weren't spelled out in the textbook she'd ordered and read over the past three weeks. Important things like how to install a substation inside an ice cave. And she desperately needed someone to check her math. Meeting Quick was a stroke of luck. Or fate, if she believed in that sort of thing. Perhaps it was divinely brought about. She did believe in God and miracles and his hand in her life. God was the source of all love. Love was the most powerful force on earth. She had studied love's abilities and knew they were real. Quick had offered to help her rewire the church a few weeks ago for the Christmas pageant. She tried to put him off, worried he'd electrocute them both, but he'd insisted he had a degree in electrical engineering and would be fine. As they worked side by side, watching what the other was doing out of the corner of their eyes, they anticipated needs and handed over tools before they were asked for, making the task feel acutely intimate. So intimate that Lux had begun to wonder if they could do other things as well as they worked together. Closer things, where lips touched. Lux's ears grew warm, and her hands flew to pull her beanie over them in case Celora noticed and asked if Lux had someone special to wear a vest for. Frost threaded the reins through the hooks on the sleigh. You ready? Ha! Huh. Lux dragged her brain out of that place where magic floated around her memories of Quick. Are you ready? Frost repeated. I'm ready to get this project underway. Was she ready to see Quick? Probably not. It's not like there was a potion, herbal tea, or shield that could keep her from going all gooey inside when she saw him. She'd have to focus on the science to make it through. Science would save her, and it would save Christmas. Let's go. Celora shoved the doors open. When the frigid temperatures mixed with the stable's heat, they created a vacuum that pulled at Dunder's fur and inched the sled forward. Frost called, on, Dunder, and they lurched forward, slowed, and lurched again. Lux pulled the blanket over her head. Here we go, yelled Frost as the skids left the ground. Lux groaned. Though Frost probably thought she was trying to hold down breakfast Lux was really worried about what would happen when she was face to face with Quick. If all went well, she'd be back home before dinner. If it all went badly, which included kissing the man with the teddy bear brown eyes, there may not be a home to come home to. Chapter 4 Quick tapped the snow off his snow boots by kicking the closest tree trunk. The noise echoed off the hills and disappeared into the sky. With so few hours of daylight, the Southern California native spent as many of them outside as he could before he turned into one of those men scientists would chip out of an ice block in 600 years. Snowshoeing and cross-country skiing were his favorite forms of exercise, and the tracks were easily lost in the frequent Alaskan storms, often disappearing before he made his way to the wood stove. Contrary to what he'd thought when he chose Alaska as his hideaway, the woods weren't quiet. If he stood in the middle of the forest, he could pick up all sorts of noises, and he'd gotten to the point that he could pick out the unnatural sounds. That's why he stood on the edge of his property and listened. Nothing out of the ordinary reached his ears, so he proceeded. He stood in front of his door to unlatch his snowshoes. Just as he was shaking off the left shoe, he heard a nervous, hello. Quick spun around, his fists at ready by his face. Lux ducked and threw her arms over her head. Don't, she yelled. Quick lowered his hands, but he couldn't bring down the anger. What are you doing here? He hadn't heard them coming. How did you get here? Why hadn't he heard them? His eyes scanned the area, and he cocked his head to the side to listen for a drone. How did you know where I live? Lux grabbed her left elbow with her right hand. She kept her eyes down and kicked the snow. Normally Quick liked to have the upper hand, but he didn't like Lux looking at the ground like she was afraid of him. We came by sleigh, she said, barely loud enough for him to hear. Quick looked past Lux and her fiery red hair escaping the dark beanie to the sleigh behind her. Standing next to it was a small woman with hair as white as the snow. Quick stared harder, sure she had purple eyes. Was that even possible? 
Lux pushed her glasses up on her nose. That's my sister Frost. Hi. Frost's greeting was like a bird's chirp. Quick ignored her and turned back to Lux. I had a couple questions about an electrical project I'm working on, and I was hoping you'd be willing to help me. She gulped. Still not looking at me. He shifted his weight in an effort to relieve the guilt slithering inside his gut for scaring her in the first place. Even though she'd scared the heck out of him first. Still, he could answer a few questions, maybe take the apprehension out of those deep green eyes. A man could get used to looking into eyes that warm. On second thought, he'd never get used to staring into Lux's eyes. There was too much light and intelligence in her gaze to ever find the bottom of the well. With a start Quick realized he'd been staring. He couldn't afford to go soft over some girl, big green eyes or not. I don't have time. He opened his door. Wait. Lux charged after him. It'll only take a minute. She planted herself behind him. It's important. Quick moved to block her view of the inside of his cabin and folded his arms. Not to me. She ripped the beanie off her head, giving her curls free rein. They spilled over her shoulders, capturing his attention. It's important to everyone. He couldn't have that. Projects that included everyone invariably included the wrong people. I don't appreciate you dropping in unannounced. Lux shook her head quickly, making her unruly curls bounce. Quick cursed himself for noticing. I didn't have a choice since I don't have a phone number for you, or an email. I don't have either, and even if I did, I wouldn't give them to you. He stepped across the threshold and grabbed the door. Put some bells on that sleigh. But. He slammed the door in her face and pressed his ear against the wood. After a moment, he heard the crunch of her shoes in the snow as she walked away. Hurrying to the small window, he parted the blinds just enough to watch Lux stomp to the cursed silent sleigh. He'd known volunteering to help with that silly pageant was a mistake. He should have walked away from the whole darn thing. He would have, if he hadn't spied Lux off to the side, unrolling a coil of wire and looking so beautiful in her mismatched mittens and her hair bouncing behind her in a high ponytail. She was young and fresh and so very serious. And she smelled like mint cocoa. Of course, he hadn't figured that out until they were in the church's back room installing a new electrical box. The old one was a fire waiting to happen. Her fingers flew through the tasks, twisting wires together and labeling circuit breakers. When she concentrated hard, her tongue poked out between her lips. It was adorable and distracting. He let the blind snap back into place. The last thing he needed was a distraction, especially one who had a project. He had two jobs, stay alive and stay off the radar. A woman like Lux? She could light up his radar like a Christmas tree. Which was the perfect reason to forget about her. He cracked the blinds again. He'd do just that, as soon as she got off his property. Lux didn't hear the crunch of snow under her boots. She did see Dunder snort and shake his antlers at Quick's door. His anger on her behalf endeared him to her forevermore. Lux splayed her fingers over her stomach. She wasn't planning on taking off again so soon. What the nutcracker just happened? So that would be a no, Frost sniffed. She screwed her pixie face into a scowl. Don't do that, your face will stay that way. The wrinkles and creases around Frost's nose and mouth melted away. It feels weird anyway. Lux tucked her laptop into the storage compartment. She'd never been spoken to in such a manner. He'd slammed the door in her face. Not even the mean girls in her freshman dorm were so rude. Of course, they were more that throw verbal darts behind your back, than that say it to your face, kind of people. She never thought she'd miss their whispers, but it was easier to ignore spiteful whispers from petty girls than it was to ignore a door in your face. A slammed door nonetheless. Even more disturbing was that she'd thought quick a friend, and he'd been undeservedly gruff with her. Had she really been nervous about seeing him? About sparks tingling in her chest when they met again? 
There were sparks, all right, angry gray and ugly black sparks. Those were not nice sparks. If Ginger were here, she'd put quick on the naughty list. After the way he treated her Lux might just do it herself. She wrote the program, she could easily hack in and switch quick over. This whole thing is weird. The dark green velvet inside the sleigh was soft and warded off the chill that Quick's irritated unwelcome sent over Lux's shoulders. I thought you said he was nice. Frost threaded the reins through her fingers. She shed her gloves as soon as Lux got back in the sled. He was. At least. I thought he was. Lux massaged her temples. Frost tossed her hair over her shoulder. Could this have been one of those times you didn't read social cues? No. Maybe. I don't know. They'd flown right into the yard. He jumped like she'd poked him with a candy cane. I think we scared him. Us? Frost squeaked. We are Kringles. We are not scary. Lux chuckled. You don't think Stella's scary? Frost pressed her lips together. Saying not nice things about her sister was difficult for her. She can be intense. Intense like a hurricane. Yes, she can. Frost braced her foot against the front of the sleigh in preparation for takeoff. Wait. Lux touched her arm. You'd better stay on the ground until we're out of sight of the cabin. Oh, good idea. Frost flicked the reins and they glided across the snow. Lux turned in her seat to watch the small homestead recede behind them. The house was exactly double the size of the barn. The wood sat piled with precision along the east side of the house. The garage was locked. The buildings were neat and tidy. Most homesteaders up here had a yard full of tractors, trucks, snowmobiles, and four-wheelers that they harvested parts from. Fences were uneven and the chicken coop leaned. Not here. Here the area was clear of debris, and the fence was taut and straight, made from posts of the same size. If there were chickens, she doubted they dared peck when or where they weren't allowed. It was all very, organized, practically military in precision. What are you going to do now? Frost yelled over the wind. Dunder may have been on the ground, but he was gaining speed. I'm going to have to design it by myself. Can you do that? I don't have a choice. Lux pulled the blanket over her lap. Maybe my old professor can check the math. She hadn't wanted to involve the university. They hounded her to come back and teach or submit a project that would bring in grants. As much as she loved her time at Caltech, despite the freshman trolls, she wasn't interested in living the academic lifestyle. She preferred her quiet life of scientific discovery. Besides, the work she did would impact every child who believed in Santa. That was bigger than department meetings and university politics. Frost pressed her lips together as she steered them through a canyon of boulders. Dunder jerked to the left and was suddenly in the air. Lux screamed and dove for the blanket. He's doing his best. Frost yelled. That's what scares me, Lux returned. Although, now that she had to design the substation on her own, she had a sleigh full of empathy for the reindeer. The worst that could happen if Dunder didn't get off the ground was a crash. If she didn't get the substation up and running before Stella found the man of her dreams, the digitized naughty and nice lists, the toy-making machines, and the candy factory would all come to a screeching halt. Christmas would be ruined for children all over the world. Lux sank into the seat and made a mental note to give Dunder a carrot when they got back to the stables. Chapter 5 February 13. 314 days until Christmas Eve. No! Lux pounded the bedside table, making the lamp tremble. She grabbed her cell phone and pushed the talkie button on the side. Stella. Stella here. I need your mad skills. Lux groaned. Research shouldn't be this hard. It's the day before Valentine's Day. I'm messaging five different guys here. Stella snapped her gum. 
Shouldn't take you long if you're as good a hacker as you claim to be, Lux shot back. 10-4. What's your location? Lux rolled her eyes. Stella made everything a game. When they were kids, she could make folding clothes and cleaning the bathroom seem fun. Having another website block Lux was not a game she was happy playing. I'm in my room. Copy that. Lux dropped her phone on the lavender bedspread and sat up, dragging the laptop onto her legs. She tried the bookmarked site again, only to have it flash on the screen and then disappear. Valentine's Day. She checked her online calendar. She needed to make a valentine for Layla and set an alarm to remind her to deliver it. What's up, Buttercup? asked Stella as she sashayed into the room. Her black pixie hair had silver tips on the end that matched the buttons and zippers on her leather jacket. Besides the metal accents, black fringe ran from one wrist to the other. Her black leggings also shone like leather, and her red top hung low enough to expose a black tank underneath. Lux furrowed her brow. Please tell me you're not dating a hell's angel. Stella cocked a hip out to the side and smiled. Okay, I won't tell you. Lux shoved her glasses up her nose. Either you don't want to get married and are dating the wrong guys, or you're trying to date as many as you can before you have to settle down. I'm not sure which, do you know? Stella shrugged. Axel may look rough around the edges, but he has a good heart, and he's been on the nice list his whole life. Axel. Lux lifted one eyebrow. Stella reached for the computer. I don't think it's short for anything. She started typing, only half listening to Lux. That wasn't the point. Lux rubbed her neck muscles. She'd been at the computer for hours, checking and double-checking her schematic against what was online. One wrong-sized wire or missed grounding switch could send too much magic into their system and blow it out. That would shut down the North Pole and send Christmas back to the Dark Ages. Children weren't likely to be overjoyed to receive hand-carved horses and dolls instead of computer game consoles and plastic dolls with multiple outfits. The situation wouldn't be so intense if they weren't on the verge of an overload already. Ginger and Joseph fed the magic a daily dose of true love. No love was as unpredictable as young love. One day they'd be humming along nicely and the next they'd have sparks flying. Lux chewed her lip. What would it feel like to make those sparks? One-fifth of the love that fueled Christmas magic resided in her heart. Sharing it was the only way to keep the magic going. She had the ability to create sparks like that with someone. The knowledge was both powerful and frightening. Cinnamon sticks. If tomorrow was Valentine's Day, they'd have a surge for sure. We have to shut down tomorrow. Toys, lished, the kitchens, anything that uses Christmas power. Are you kidding? Stella turned her face but her eyes were glued to the screen. No. If you so much as give Axel a peck on the cheek, you'll kill every machine in your workshop. Stella flapped her hand, uncharacteristically unconcerned about losing a day of toy making. Fine. I'll shut it all down. Stella had a date. Ginger and Joseph would be together. Mom and Dad. Robin might have someone new. Lux hadn't checked in with her for a while. If she charged her laptop, she and Frost could hang out. While chilling with her baby sister was fun, it wasn't the Valentine's Day Lux yearned for in her heart. She wasn't much for flowers or gifts, although chocolate was always a good idea, but why couldn't she have someone who wanted to see her on the day the world celebrated love? You're officially on a government watch list. Stella's words yanked Lux away from her lack of social life and back to her bedroom, where Star Wars and superhero posters lined the walls. What? She grabbed the screen and turned the computer so she could see the information better. Stella had tracked the signal that blocked her back to Langley. Fudge Ripple. They think I'm a terrorist. 
Probably. Stella lifted one leather-clad shoulder. Lux closed her eyes. On her desk was an almost complete blueprint for a substation. Without those websites, she'd be sunk. Now what? Stella bounced to her feet. You know what you have to do, she sing songed Lux slammed the laptop shut. I'm not going back there. He's impossible. Rude. And he dresses like a homeless man, added Stella. Lux held her fist out for a bump. Thank you. And you like him. Stella bumped her fist. Who could ever love a, a, Lux scrambled for a word she could use. Grinch, supplied Stella with a smirk. She headed for the door but stopped before leaving. And who said anything about love? With a wink, she disappeared. Lux glared at the open door. Last time I call her for help. The worst part. Stella was right. Not about loving quick, that was ridiculous. She barely knew the guy. Love wasn't an option. She kind of thought he was cute, until he slammed his door in her face. That had lowered his cuteness factor to a two, with ten being the highest. Her sister was right in that she had to go back to Quicks. She needed his help now more than ever. Chapter 6 February 14th 313 days till Christmas Eve The dark can be peaceful. In the middle of a frozen lake, with a blanket of stars and a pillow of fresh snow, nighttime was downright pretty. Quick hadn't been able to sleep well lately. Thoughts of a red-haired woman, frightened and bewildered by his outburst, haunted him at night. He'd wake up with her minty chocolate smell in his nose and the sense of something magic dancing across his skin. During the day, he could keep busy enough to keep his thoughts where they should be, far away from Lux. But at night, his subconscious made up for all that lost time, and she invaded his dreams. He tipped his head back and looked out through the small window, taking in the moonlight on the lake. Moments like this quick could believe there was goodness in the world. He set his line and caught a trout within a minute. Fresh meat was always appreciated in the dead of winter. He could have snared a rabbit or two, but fish weren't as greasy, and he liked the lighter fare after eating jerky and beef for a couple of weeks. He smacked his hands together a couple times to keep the blood circulating. Man, it got cold fast. Especially after reaching in the hole to pull out his catch. The small wood stove in the corner was just starting to heat up. He'd filled it with tinder and kindling when he first arrived. There was enough of a flame going he could add a log or two. That's all the stove would hold, but it was enough to get this small space nice and toasty. The ice fishing shack was a project that had kept him from going crazy last winter. He'd spent hours drawing up the plans, checking and double-checking the calculations just for something to do. The actual building process took much longer. Using a hammer and nails was therapeutic in a way, using nothing but his strength and ingenuity to bring his vision to life. His cabin had a much larger stove. Hailing from Southern California Quick faced the real possibility that he may never get used to Alaska temperatures. Living here would be much more bearable if he had someone warm to snuggle up to at night, and in the morning, and the middle of the afternoon. He smiled to himself. Luck certainly was a warm body. She practically radiated heat. How she didn't melt right through the snow was a mystery. Not that she was what he would consider hot. She didn't wear tight dresses or high heels or even lipstick. And yet she was an undeniable beauty that held his attention. Perhaps if he could figure out what exactly she did that captivated him, he'd be able to put the fascination aside. He liked mysteries. Always had. His brain was wired to find patterns and connect the dots, which had helped make him one of the top engineers in his field. That was a different life, one he had run away from as fast as he could. Shoving aside thoughts of Lux and running, he checked his bait. Once he was satisfied with the setup, he kicked his legs up on the piece of wood nailed to the wall just for that purpose and settled back into his camp chair to watch the low-hanging moon move across the sky. 
Twenty minutes later, the stove was burning hot, and Quick was feeling drowsy. He should open a window. Getting too hot was just as dangerous as getting too cold. He wanted to care about being warm, about the sweat that trickled down his cheek. His eyelids were so heavy and he hadn't been sleeping. Just a little rest, and then he'd open that window. He glanced at his line and then let his eyes fall shut. Chapter 7 Luck steered the sleigh through the Alaskan wilderness. She'd landed in clear view under the cover of darkness and stuck to the ground. Dunder was happy flying or on the ground. He was good like that, and she appreciated the way he made long arcs around bumpy patches. At 9 a.m., the sun was just barely coming up, and she was only halfway to quick solitary cabin in the woods. Lux was a quiet person, introverted, some might say. However, the thought of living away from all people like Quick chose to do was like putting on an ugly, itchy Christmas sweater. What made a man want to be so alone? Pride. Stubbornness. That could certainly be the reason. He was stubborn. And sometimes he wasn't very nice. Maybe he decided to remove himself from polite society because he wasn't polite. She sighed. He'd been fine at the church. His behavior turned South Pole when she'd surprised him. She hoped he was awake now. She didn't want to surprise him with a knock on the door if he was still in his pajamas. Surely Quick didn't sleep all the dark hours away. No one could sleep for that long and not turn into a lump of coal. Quick was anything but a lump. He had strong arms under all those layers, she'd felt them once while they were working on the church. Her foot had slipped and she'd grabbed onto him to keep from landing on her backside. What she'd felt under those flannel sleeves had stolen her breath away. Lux reached the edge of the lake and skirted the bank. This time of year, the ice on top would be at least two feet thick, but Dunder didn't like ice, he usually flew right over the top of a frozen lake or river. The reindeer was older and set in his ways, and she wasn't going to change them with one sprint across a lake, even if it would save them half an hour. Lux's thoughts went back to the shut and she was going to have to convince to come out of his cabin. Or let her in. That would work too. In fact, getting inside his cabin was the goal. She'd worked too hard on these plans to roll them out in the snow. Up ahead, the entrance to Boulder Canyon, as she decided to officially name it, loomed. The trees in this area were thick, obstructing the view of the lake. Just before they reached the canyon, the trees disappeared and a stunning view was laid out before her. Not far off the bank was a fishing shack with smoke billowing out the pipe through the roof. She didn't want to attract any attention and wished she'd kept the bells of Dunder's harness until they were closer to Quick's. Crack. A deep rumble shook the ground and Dunder skidded to a stop, his ears twitching to find the danger. He turned his head to make eye contact with Lux. Another crack snapped through the air like a whip. Lux jerked in her seat to take in the lake. She gasped. The light gray smoke tumbling out the pipe in the roof turned black, and orange flames danced behind the window. One corner of the building sunk into the ice. The opposite corner jutted into the air. A chair crashed through the window and a man followed soon after. Lux pulled heavily on the reins. Go, Dunder, she ordered. Dunder shook his antlers in protest. Lux slapped the reins on his back, making the bells on his harness jingle. He snorted and pawed at the ground before taking off across the ice. The ice jolted as the building sank lower. The man scrambled away from the structure, his feet scraping against the ice. Swish 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 swish. His arms windmilled as if they could help him move out of danger. Around him, the ice fissured and jarred. He caught sight of Lux and waved his hands over his head, shouting something she couldn't make out. Just as Lux lifted her arm to return the wave, he disappeared, falling beneath the ice. 
muttering words that would set off Santa's naughty list radar Lux urged Dunder toward the hole. She shed her coat and threw her gloves on the floor of the sleigh. Dunder moved with the speed of a reindeer half his age, sensing the danger. He slammed on the brakes, nearly tripping over a half-inch crack. Good boy. Lux climbed down as fast and carefully as she could. If they'd gotten any closer, the weight of the sleigh and reindeer would cause the ice to shift and possibly close off the hole where the man disappeared. She reached into her magical carrier bag while simultaneously wishing for a long rope. The coils filled her hand and she tied one end around the sleigh. Wait here, she told Dunder. He didn't need to be told twice. His eyes were the size of snowballs as he stared at the crack three feet in front of him as if it would jump up and attack. As Lux ran, the ice bobbing beneath her feet, she tied the rope around her middle, leaving a long tail. Her boots crunched ice and snow and her breath trailed behind her as she ran. Up close, she could see Quick holding to the edge of the ice. Quick, she called, though her voice didn't get far. Fear wrapped its icy fingers around her ribcage, and for the first time in her life Lux went cold. Her whole soul cried out for her to save him. Her legs couldn't pump fast enough. He panted, his face red and his jaw set in determination. He lunged up out of the water and tried to grab at the ice to keep from falling back in. With a yell, he slipped under the surface. No! Sliding on her belly like she was trying to steal home Lux plunged her arms into the slushy water and grasped the hood of Quick's coat. She heaved, barely moving him. He was heavy, soaking wet and all muscle. Pull, dunder, she screamed. Panic made her clumsy and she wished she had on her climbing gear with spikes in her toes. Dunder dug his hooves into the snow and ice and thunder rumbled through the valley. No wonder he didn't like ice, he could break through with legs that powerful. His movement tightened the rope around her middle and dragged her backwards in the snow. The ice cut at her exposed arms and bumped her knees and hip bones. That was going to hurt later. Quick's head surfaced. He had on layers and layers of clothing, and her arms shook with the effort to hold on to him. The cold didn't bother her. The water felt like a bath thanks to her magical heritage, but her muscles weren't going to hold out. She wedged her elbow against the ice and used her other hand to wrap the tail of her rope under Quick's arms. His blue lips and blank stare unnerved her, but he blinked several times, so she knew he was still alive. With the rope in place, she called over her shoulder, Go, Dunder. Within moments both she and Quick were pulled to solid ground. She chuckled as relief poured through her system. Dunder hadn't just gotten them away from the hole, he'd taken them all the way to shore. He was fast when he wanted to be. She could hear him panting. Sitting up, she shook the water off her bare arms. She was wet, sore, bumped, and bruised, but otherwise fine. Quick, on the other hand, wouldn't live long if she didn't hurry. Rolling him over, she found his weak pulse. His breathing was shallow, and she didn't like the color of his skin at all. Dunder wandered her direction, sniffing Quick's hair. He'd lost his hat in the water. We need to get him warm, she said to the reindeer. Dunder snorted at the sleigh, the enchanted sleigh. Good idea. She grabbed both of Quick's hands and pulled with all her might to slide him onto the floor. He looked rather pathetic lying there with his arms above his head and his face tipped to the side, but Lux's muscles were shot. She was running on willpower now. Wearing out a Kringle usually took 24 hours of toy delivery. She panted as she plopped onto the velvet seat. A large puddle grew under Quick. The sleigh maintained 72 degrees. With all those clothes on, he'd freeze in Hawaii. Dunder stomped his front foot, ready to fly them there right this minute. Whoa! She held up a hand. As tired as she was, 
flying would do her in. She was Quick's best shot right now, and if she was incapacitated, he'd, she squeezed her eyes shut against scary possibilities. Gritting her teeth, she stripped off Quick's coat, boots, snow pants, scarf, and one remaining glove. Her hands hesitated over his chest, which was making bigger movements now that it wasn't smothered by twenty pounds of wet cloth. With a one, two, three, she unbuttoned his flannel shirt, trying to shake the dirty feeling of someone who peeks at Christmas presents. She tossed everything in the corner of the sleigh. For the love of fudge. She bit her cheek and pulled his white t-shirt over his head. She'd been right, Quick was no lump of coal. He had a nice set of muscles and a flat stomach. She let out a low whistle. Dunder snorted, his eyes wide again. I'm keeping it PG, she growled out. She reached into her magical bag and retrieved a pair of sewing scissors, which she used to cut his pants into shorts. Short shorts. Yikes. She quickly reached into her bag for warm blankets and wrapped Quick up tight. Finally, she retrieved a thermos of warm chocolate laced with peppermint and was able to get him to take a few sips. The chocolate was for comfort and the peppermint was a zing to wake him up. He still hadn't opened his eyes, but he'd started to shake. She took that as a good sign. With Quick's immediate needs met, she removed her own wet clothes down to her tank top and jeans. Now she wasn't dripping on Quick and undoing all her hard work. She quickly rolled up the long rope and stuffed it into her bag, feeling it disintegrate beneath her palm, and then took up the reins. Dunder turned to look at her. She could imagine him raising an eyebrow and asking her, Can we fly now? Reindeer don't have eyebrows, she said. Dunder pawed at the ground in response. He was anxious to get into the air, flying relaxed him. Lux rubbed her forehead. I can't believe I'm saying this. On, Dunder. They were above the treetops before Lux could change her mind. With her stomach spinning, she scanned the ground for Quick's cabin. They flew over Boulder Canyon and a wisp of smoke caught her eye. She followed it down to land Dunder at Quick's front door. Her stomach lurched as they stopped, and she leaned over the edge to dry heave. Dunder growled. Every other Kringle had an iron stomach. Lux broke that mold and apparently offended Reindeer because of it. It's not you, boy, it's me. She flopped to the floor next to Quick. His face was still white, but his lips weren't blue. That was good. He needed to be indoors and fast. Quick. Lux nudged him. She'd never be able to carry him inside. It wasn't far from the sleigh to the door, but the distance was too much for her. And now that she'd taken off all his clothes, she didn't feel right about dragging him over the snow. Quick coughed twice and slowly opened his eyes. Chapter 8 Quick stared into a pair of entrancing green eyes. The last thing he remembered was throwing the chair through the window and then somehow water filled his ears, hitting his eardrums like icicles. Did I die? He croaked. Almost, replied the angel with wet red hair. She seemed familiar, like he'd known her in a happy place at one point. She pressed a cup to his lips. The warm liquid burned down his throat, and he coughed, shoving her arm away. He caught a whiff of mint chocolate from the cup. Lux? His head was working, just not as fast as he was used to. His throat still burned. So did his skin. He twisted and shoved against the heavy blankets. Hold still. Lux tossed the cocoa into the snow, leaving a brown trail. Your, um, she averted her gaze. Not dressed. An animal snorted. I'm what? He tucked his face under the blankets and found only a wet pair of cut-off jeans and his belt. What? He snapped. Lux's cheeks dusted pink. With her red hair and fair skin, she should have flushed bright red, but only this sprinkling of pink appeared, like she'd been dusted with pink powdered sugar. 
Why did this woman bring to mind sweet things like powdered sugar and chocolate and kisses at sunset? He gave his head a mighty shake. You fell in the water. I know. At least, he thought he knew. Everything had happened so fast. He'd fallen asleep and woken up when the ice cracked. He plopped his feet to the floor only to have them land in several inches of water. His stove had tipped over and the hot metal had melted clear through the ice. There must have been a crack in the ice nearby. We pulled you out. We? Quick adjusted the blankets over his arms. He could only imagine Lux and Ginger and Frost tearing his clothes off. Lux made to adjust her glasses, but they weren't there. She looked around like they'd fallen off and she didn't know how. So he wasn't the only one thrown off by all this. Quick's eyes traveled lower to find her bare shoulders and her skin-tight tank top. He jerked his eyes back up to her face, hoping she hadn't caught his wandering eye. Me and Dunder. She chewed her lip. My reindeer. Of course. The situation was going up in weirdness. Having used up all his ability to care about propriety Quick leaned back against the seat. He was in the bottom of a fancy velvet-lined sled. Yep. Weird. His eyes dropped shut. You cut my pants, he asked. I'll get you new ones, offered Lux. Did you cut my shirt too? No. She was offended. That was kind of cute. Too bad. I needed a new shirt. He half smiled. Lux tossed her hands in the air. You are much more at ease with almost dying than I would be. Lux poked him through the blanket. Time to get you inside. Can you walk? Not without boots. He waved his bare foot outside the blanket. His foot was white, too white. To his surprise, the temperature was comfortable. That wasn't right. He must be suffering from frostbite and lost the feeling in his foot. He frowned. Lux pulled a long carpet out of her bag and unrolled it across the short distance to his front door. You should be fine for a few steps. Just make sure you hang on to me. Quick used the seat to pull himself to standing. He should have felt a chill as the blanket slipped, but instead he continued to burn with the sensation of putting frozen flesh under warm water. The pins and needles were uncomfortable, but the alternative was worse. The pricks meant his circulation was working, or rather, starting to work again. The feeling of trying to kick his way out of the water and being sucked back down dug its icy fingers into his lower back. He hunched forward. Lux took his hand and stepped out of the sleigh. There was a nasty red scrape down her elbow. She glanced worriedly over her shoulder. Quick's muscles were slow to cooperate. He stumbled out of the sleigh and let go of her hand so he didn't pull her down with him. He landed on his hands and knees on the carpet. The cold enveloped him once again, as if he'd been dumped back into the lake. The cold sharpened everything, including his thoughts. Lux was a warm body. She was somehow able to regulate her body temperature, and his with a touch. Lux muttered something that sounded like peppermint fudge and pulled him to his feet. He swayed, unsteady and unhappy, standing on a thousand pins. He didn't mean to lean so heavily into Lux, but her touch was affecting him like no woman's had before. The previous chill was cast off the moment their skin connected. His head spun with possibilities, none of which made any sense. He stared down at her, tracing her cheek with his eyes, glancing at her bare and beautiful neck, and then moving up to her lips. If just touching her created this much warmth, not only on his skin but inside his soul, kissing her could cause him to positively melt. Now that was an experiment worth trying. The blankets fell away as Quick moved his hand to cup the back of her head. He leaned forward, ready to commence the kissing test. Lux squeaked. Placing both hands on his chest, she steadied him. He liked the feel of her hands against his skin. His gaze traveled over the thin straps of her tank top, the smooth skin underneath, and his hands moved to her slim shoulders and graceful neck, and then he brushed his thumb over her plump bottom lip. His thoughts scattered to places the pastor would blush over. Lux? 
He looked down at her and she looked up at him, and his gaze dropped to her lips once again. Why are you here? I need your help, she whispered. He nodded. At least, he thought he did. He didn't remember much that happened after his eyes fell shut and he swayed towards Lux once again. Had he been trying to kiss her? Maybe. She just saved his life. She deserved a kiss. He walked a little, and he might have changed into pajama bottoms, and then he was in his bed and so very sleepy. Chapter 9 Fatigue, unlike any she'd known before, had pulled and tugged and scraped at Lux on the ride back to the cabin. However, being close to Quick, his body pressed against hers and his gaze continually dropping to her lips, her heart rate accelerated like thunder flying off a frozen lake, bringing her fully awake. He mumbled and was clearly confused. But his joke about wishing she'd cut off his shirt moved his cuteness factor up three notches. That put him at a solid five. Though why she was even thinking along the lines of cuteness factors when he'd almost died was beyond her. He's not the only one confused. She pressed her palm to her forehead. Quick had stayed awake, but maybe not aware, long enough to change himself into a pair of fleece pajamas. Lux stood over his bed, watching his bare chest move up and down and his skin turn pink. Staring at that really nice-looking chest gave him another two notches. She waved her hand in front of her face, feeling the heat spread all the way through her chest. When she was sure the danger had passed and that he would live, she allowed herself to look around the cabin. Quick's bed was on the west wall, positioned so he could see the stars through the high window while his head rested on the pillow. Nice. He was so out of it, she could probably snuggle up next to him for a while and watch the day turn into night. The days were getting longer, but it would be dark soon. Shaking off the idea, she turned away from the bed. A wood-burning stove was in the corner, a couch was on the east wall. There was also a small round table and a counter with a sink. She flicked a light switch, surprised that the lights actually worked. He had to have solar panels somewhere on the roof. The water coming from the faucet was a welcome sight. Melting snow took forever, and Quick would need something warm to eat and drink. The two-burner stove had one clean pan on top. The shelves held one plate, one cup, one bowl, and a couple books and maps. His clothes must be under the bed in the plastic containers. Smart. She ran her finger over the shelf, looking for dust, and didn't find any. Everything in the cabin had a place. There weren't any knick-knacks or personal effects. She rubbed her hands over her arms. It was all so very formal and imposing. Still not able to settle down after her close encounter with Quick Lux brushed her hands and went out to take care of Dunder. The reindeer was waiting out front. He shook his antlers as she softly shut the door behind her. I'm coming. She bent down and rolled up the carpet, returning it to her magical bag. Stopping alongside Dunder, she rubbed his neck. You did good, old boy. He huffed as if exasperated that she'd called him old. She laughed. I'm sorry. She gave him a good scratch under the chin. He allowed her affections and then began walking toward the small barn just past the house, dragging the sleigh behind him. He probably wanted to rest up. Celora would want him rubbed down, watered, and fed. Hold up. She took off the harness, the bells jingling as she did so. Dunder shook, sending hair floating through the air. Lux laughed. He was getting old, all right. This way. She led him through the sliding door and into the two-stall barn with an empty hay storage. She used her bag to make hay for the reindeer, followed by a bowl of oats and three large fresh carrots. Dunder's ears perked up at the sight of the pretty vegetables. Quick might need something to eat too. He was becoming quite the project. A handsome project. 
She shook the thought out of her head like shaking sprinkles out of a shaker. No such thoughts were allowed. Quick had made himself clear the last time she was here, she wasn't welcome. He tolerated her now because he was too cold to care. And she'd saved his life. That had to count for something. Lux closed the stall door behind Dunder. He wasn't likely to wander, and if he decided to fly out of there, a door wasn't going to stop him, but she wasn't taking any chances. There were other animals up here, wolves being one of her biggest concerns. She closed the barn door behind her to keep the heat in and predators out and headed back to the house. With a sigh, she stopped at the sleigh to retrieve Quick's wet things. He would need them if he was ever going to go outside again. For all she knew, this was his only shirt. Project. She wrung the water out of the wettest gear. His coat alone weighed forty pounds. How he'd ever managed to keep his head above water until she arrived, she'd never know. Laying the coat over her arm, she added to the pile until she was down to her own coat, now soaked because it had been under all the other wet stuff. She sighed as the water seeped through her clothing. Standing in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness in a tank top wasn't exactly keeping her cringleness a secret. Hopefully Quick had been out of it enough that he hadn't noticed. She closed her eyes. That was a horrible thing to hope for. She was beat, that was all there was to it. The weight of the clothes made her stagger into the door. It slammed open. Lux froze in the doorway, peering over the pile in her arms to check the bed. Quick rolled and groaned but didn't wake. Phew. She hung clothing on the backs of chairs, over hooks, and off the stove handle. The wood stove needed wood, so she threw in three logs and brushed the dirt off her hands. She went back out to the sled to get her blueprints, which she set by the couch, wanting to keep them close. With that taken care of, she suddenly became day after Christmas tired. Eyeing the large bed with longing, the mattress looked so comfortable, she opted to take the couch. She retrieved a pair of pajamas out of her bag and changed quickly before falling onto the lumpy cushions and drifting off to sleep. With any luck, she'd wake up before quick and be able to cook something to revive him. Robin would know exactly what to make. Lux vaguely remembered seeing a can of stew. Yes, stew would be good. She yawned. Just a short nap. Chapter 10 Quick slowly came into consciousness. For a while, the sensation of his mind outside of his body lingered, taking in the room and him in the bed. He understood it was warm, but he couldn't get his body to wake enough to throw off the covers. Finally, he rolled over and pried his eyes open. Clothing hung all over the room. Even on laundry day, when he washed his clothes in the sink, he didn't have this much of a mess. He groaned. His room hadn't been this messy since he was fifteen. His eyes traveled around the room and landed on a patch of red on his couch. Squinting, the red came into focus, followed by a long and lean creamy-skinned body. What the? The day's events came back to him slowly. His ill-timed nap. The fire. The ice cracking. The cold. Lux flying him home. He rubbed his head. Flying? That can't be right. He slowly sat up to get a better look at his guest. Lux's hair hung in giant waves, like a beach beauty who had spent the day in the sun and surf. Her skin was the color of fresh cream with a tint of pink. He rubbed his eyes. Somewhere in the jumble of memories, he found himself holding on to her shoulders, they were soft and warm. He threw his legs over the side of the bed and stumbled to the window to let out the excess heat from the wood stove. He cracked it open to allow the heat to escape. Lux must have thrown on several logs and fallen asleep. He filled the large pot with water and set it on top of the stove. It would heat faster there than on one of the propane burners. The room was full of moisture as his clothes dried out. Now that he was on his feet, he wiggled his toes. Yep. 
They all worked. His fingers too. He touched his ears, feeling for dead spots. Nothing felt off. He'd need a mirror to really look for the telltale whiteness that indicated frozen skin. He glanced down at his bare chest and then over at Lux. She'd pulled him from the ice and stripped him down. The idea of her hands on him made his heart thud and heat pool in his lower belly. What good was falling into an icy lake if he wasn't conscious to enjoy an attractive woman taking his clothes off? He scratched at his chin. He must have been through something, because he was reverting back to thinking like a man who'd been on assignment for too long. He looked around for the only pair of jean shorts he'd ever owned or would ever own. He might as well throw them out in the snow and let a squirrel use them for insulation in its nest. There was no reason to be angry about the pants. They were pants and nothing compared to his life. He could almost remember joking about them with her, but that was all fuzzy. He'd said something and she'd smiled. It was the smile that grabbed hold of his thoughts. A smile like that wasn't easily forgotten. The split second he'd dropped through the ice, he'd known he was going to die and he'd blacked out. Not fainted. He never fainted. But when the cold water filled his ears, a switch flipped and he couldn't stay alert. He stepped closer to the couch. Lux lay there without a blanket or anything. It was hot in here. She had on a green tee with a picture of the Hulk sporting a Clint Eastwood sneer. Under the face were the words, go ahead, make me green. He smiled at the pun. When he'd first seen Lux, he'd been struck by her beauty and then knocked flat as she'd spliced into the church's power and added a new breaker box, and he wasn't sure where that windmill had come from, it was like magic. If he believed in such a thing. More than likely, the solitude was affecting his brain. He leaned close, catching a hint of peppermint cocoa. He bolted upright. She'd made him drink cocoa in the sled. Where did she get warm cocoa in the middle of winter in the middle of Alaska? Lux sighed in her sleep. Quick took a step back, kicking a roll of paper. It unrolled right before his feet like a giant scroll. He leaned over to roll it back up and caught the words, North Pole Substation Project, printed in block letters in the bottom left-hand corner. He recoiled. Had his past come after him? If he'd kept his nose out of high-level, confidential blueprints, then he wouldn't be up here in hiding while his son grew up without a father. He moved back to the stove, pressing his backside into the warm metal to create as much space between him and that project as he could. He should roll them back up and pretend that he hadn't seen anything. He looked over his shoulder so his thoughts wouldn't be drawn off track by the wonderful view on his couch. A substation at the North Pole? Could be for a scientific research facility. There were hundreds of scientists vying for time at the outpost to conduct physics experiments. Lux was certainly smart enough to be one of them. He found himself standing over the papers, his eyes scanning the schematic. That's not right. He tapped his chin. Lux had specified oil circuit breakers, but if this was going in at the North Pole, then dead tank gas circuit breakers would be ideal because of the lower ambient temperatures. His fingers itched to find a pencil and mark changes. And over there. The latest developments in plus 660 kV days technology in China, showing that maintaining levels with advanced insulation technologies was possible. He scrubbed his face. Of course, she wouldn't know that. The information was classified. He picked up the plans and laid them across the table, flipping pages, looking for clues as to what this thing would power. On page 3, he found specs for radiation proofing. Could be some form of nuclear power. Or perhaps something more sinister. His heart sank. Lux wasn't one of the bad guys. She couldn't be. There was such an innocence in her eyes. And when he'd raised his voice, she ducked. Anyone military trained would have instinctually moved to block him. He combed his hand through his hair and cursed. Lux stretched and their eyes met. For the second time that day Quick froze. He'd been caught with his hand in the substation plans and there was no way to deny it. Chapter 11 Quick glanced down at the plans and then back at Lux. 
She stretched her arms over her head, lengthening her thin body in a wonderful way. The worst part about noticing something like that was that Lux had no idea what her movements did to him. She wasn't trying to seduce him, to draw him to her, and yet she'd done just that. He glanced down at his bare chest and then at the bed, where his clothes were neatly folded in plastic bins. Lux didn't appear worried that he was looking at top-secret plans for a nuclear electrical power substation. Nor that he was sitting there with his shirt off. Crap. Maybe she was used to military guys. Crap. Crap. Oh good. Lux smiled and sat up. You're alive. She rose gracefully and glided to the table, her eyes dropping to his chest and the tips of her ears turning pink. Thanks to you. Quick jerk to his feet. Awkward or not, he needed some sort of barrier between them. He pulled a shirt out of a tub, not even bothering to check which one he grabbed before shoving his arms into the sleeves and pulling it over his head. How are you feeling? She moved the tangle of red waves over her shoulder and started braiding. Fine. Quick tipped his head, watching her fingers nimbly taming the waves. Good. Why are you here? Lux's plump limps turned down. Had he asked that before? He couldn't remember. You're looking at why, she responded. Looking around, she found the rucksack he remembered always being near her. She reached in and retrieved a hair band to finish off the braid. Once done, she flipped it over her shoulder and leaned over the table, indicating that he should join her. He warily took a seat. I need you to help me build this, she said. Quick bolted from his chair. Steam rose from the pan and he retrieved the cup from the shelf. Um. Do you want, something? He looked around for his tin of hot chocolate. Lux pulled a cup and cocoa powder from her bag. Sure. You keep a lot in there. He eyed the bag, not quite trusting it. It didn't look full. She shrugged. It's good to be prepared. Especially out here. He lifted a shoulder. She had that right. He made them cocoa and leaned against the wall, preferring to keep as much space between them as possible. He couldn't allow the attraction between them to cloud his judgment. You don't need me to build that, you need Bruce Banner. He lifted his mug to indicate her shirt. Lux looked down as if she'd forgotten what she was wearing. Maybe she had. She didn't seem the type to obsess over every outfit like his ex-wife had, probably still did. Lux cupped her drink in her hands. Actually, I was looking for a Tony Stark. She lifted the cup and challenged him over the rim as she took a sip of cocoa. He remembered smelling peppermint and cocoa on her and wondered if she'd taste like it too. Don't go there. As you can see from my mansion, I'm ill prepared to fund such a project. I don't need your money. Lux set her cup down. I need your brain. I'm afraid that was frozen in a freak drowning incident just this morning. She clapped her hands. I'll take Captain America, any day, any time. She grinned and her eyes crinkled at the corners. For some reason Quick suddenly wanted to take on the man with the shield who made Lux sigh like that. He shook his head. What's this meant to power, anyway? A toy factory. She met his gaze head on, and he got the distinct impression she wasn't lying. That would explain the name on the schematic. Although he'd never heard of the North Pole Toy Company before. He shook his head, setting his empty cup in the small sink. There are plenty of people you can hire. I don't need the money, and I don't want to be involved. I like my little corner of the world. I understand wanting to live off the grid, trust me. Her shoulders hunched forward. It's really just my family around. No one will ever know you were involved. I can promise you that. Really? He stared at her, writing his doubt across his face as if it were a whiteboard. She swiped her finger in an X across her chest. His eyes drifted to the plans. Curiosity was always a weakness for him. Apparently, so were redheads. My spidey senses are telling me there's more to this than you're letting on. She bit her lip. 
Aha! He smacked the counter with his palm. What? What's this really about? Lux pressed her hands over her eyes and then dropped them in her lap. Fine. We have to be up and running as soon as possible. Christmas is a make or break for us this year. If I can't get this to work, then Christmas is ruined. Christmas is ruined? That's a bit dramatic for a bunch of toys, isn't it? It's my family's business. We've invested everything into Christmas. Bleeding hearts unite, muttered Quick. If Lux was playing him, if she were some sort of spy or agent, she was a darn good one. And she had saved his life, putting her own on the line to do it. She must be stronger than her lithe frame indicated to get him out of the water. He could just as easily pulled her in with him. He held out his hand. Lux eyed it. What? He sighed. Give me a pencil. She reached into that bag again and came out with two folders, a purple textbook labeled Electric Power Substation Engineering and a mechanical pencil with a brand new eraser. He started at the beginning, slowly combing through the many layers of paper. Lux sipped her cocoa, watching him over the rim of the cup as she did so. The way her full lips pressed against the edge was a distraction he could do without, or maybe not. You did well grounding. Thanks. Her smile was like a thousand watt bulb. But your power input is much too strong. Lux shook her head. If anything, it's underestimated. That can't be right. Lux traced the edge of the paper with her finger. There was one power source coming in before, but now there's five. Five? Are you insane? You could blow up the factory with that much power. I know. Why do you think I'm dumping all my time into this project? Shut down a source. Her eyes widened and she rasped, that's not possible. He sighed. You're crazy. Her whole family was probably crazy too. Ginger had seemed nice enough, and he'd met Lux's mother briefly. Her little sister looked like a snow fairy with her white hair and purple eyes. The more he thought about it, the stranger her family seemed. They drove sleighs with reindeer and owned a toy company. Wow! They'd hopped right off the reality bus. I'm telling you, you have to slow down the incoming. Lux met his gaze and for a moment, he was lost in her avocado green eyes, stumbling through her gaze. Quick, I know it doesn't make sense, but you have to trust my stats. We can't lose a power source. That would be, Lux shuddered. Disastrous and horrible, she croaked, as if the idea were emotionally distressing. He stroked his beard and leaned back in his chair. If she were building something dangerous, she'd be trying to amp up the power, not tame it. No matter what she was really up to, this toy factory thing was not sitting right with him. They'd have to make more toys than Hasbro. He couldn't get involved. He couldn't. There was too much at stake. Just by having her here he was exposing himself in a way that could cause problems for people he cared about. I'll make you a deal. I'll help you with the plans and you leave me alone. Lux's eyebrows dropped low. He could imagine they were attached to her heart and it had sunk in her chest at his request. No, wait, that was his heart. His heart was sitting low and scraped and scratched at the idea of never seeing Lux again. Now that the words were out there, he couldn't bring them back. She swallowed once and nodded. It's probably for the best. Though it was what he wanted to hear, her answer didn't make things better. Probably for the best could mean so many things. It could mean, it's probably better that I don't see you again because I don't like you. It could also mean, it's probably best we don't see one another again because a hit man's on my trail. Or it could mean, it's probably best if I don't come back because I like you and might let you kiss me. Though he shouldn't, he was rooting for the last one. So many possibilities in one little statement. It was a puzzle. Quick liked puzzles. Although he wished he knew the answer to this riddle, because he was at war with himself over whether he really wanted to kiss Lux or if that was the peppermint cocoa talking. He moved her book and files to the floor next to his chair and got to work. Chapter 12
Lots of fixed Dunder's harness. You're ready to head home, aren't you? She rubbed his neck. Dunder bumped her with his head to get her moving. I know. We need to get home. She patted his backside and smiled up at the starry sky. Quick had taken hours to go over every part of her plan. He explained the changes she needed to make and complimented where she'd done well. For a while there, she was back in the classroom with the professor all to herself. A cute professor. Yes, his cuteness level had gone up several notches. The way he continually combed his hands through his bed head without realizing he only made it stand on end. Oh my. Sleigh bells, said Quick as he stepped out of the house. Excuse me. You put sleigh bells on the harness. His cheeks were already turning pink in the cold and their breath mingled in clouds above their heads. Someone yelled the suggestion at me once. Lux smiled shyly. She wasn't used to teasing a man, especially one as smart as Quick. He could so easily think she was nothing more than a co-ed with a crush. Well. Most yelled suggestions are usually good ones. He clapped his hands together and stomped his feet. You're really leaving now. Lux took the plans out from under his arm. Yep. There wasn't a minute to spare. There were parts to order and she and the elves would weld what she couldn't order. Langley was watching her, so she needed to figure out the best way to get supplies without looking like a terrorist. It's dark. Quick step from foot to foot. That's what happens when the sun goes down. It's cold. His breath puffed. She smiled a knowing smile. She had made it through the day without telling him about Christmas magic or the enchanted Kringle bloodline. As a man of science, he wouldn't have believed her anyway. Yep. You know what? He shook his gloved hand at her. You're strange. Lux laughed like she hadn't laughed in years. The sound was joyful and triumphant. She turned quick into, well, not an admirer, but a friend. That was something to be happy about. Thanks. She gave him a quick hug and climbed into the sleigh, taking up the reins. He stepped up to the sled and placed a hand on the driving bar to keep her from taking off. Why do I feel warm when you hug me? he asked. Lux laughed again. You'll have to figure that one out on your own. What's next? He leaned against the sleigh, and his shoulders relaxed, the enchantment taking the chill off the night. I'm going to build a prototype. That'd be interesting to see. I'm afraid I made a bargain never to darken your doorway again. A note of sadness rang between them. Listen, Lux. She didn't want his pity. He was her first friend outside of her family for quite some time, and though she could feel the temptation to see if there could be more, she wasn't about to push him into it, not when Christmas was on the line. It's okay, Quick. I've taken advantage of your generous hospitality for too long as it is. His face fell. She meant to sound teasing, to flirt but her words had been too close to the mark. She flicked the reins and Dunder headed north at a trot. Town's the other way, yelled Quick, his hands cupped around his mouth. I'm not going to town. I'm going home. Stay out of trouble, she called as his home receded from view. He waved once and ducked back inside. Lux faced forward. She'd gotten exactly what she'd come for, so why did she feel empty inside? Quick. The emptiness was Quick's fault. The time they'd spent with their heads bent together over the plans had been the most enjoyable, the most fun, the most spirited, sucker sticks, was there anything hotter than a man who could do calculus in his head? He said he wasn't Tony Stark material, but she'd be willing to bet her Avengers Blu-ray library Quick could outmath Tony any day. She allowed herself to get all warm and sappy over him for a brief moment. Then, slowly, deliberately, she pulled out the memory of the moment he offered her the bargain. 
I help you, you leave and don't come back. Needing as much distance as possible from Quick and his cozy cabin in the woods, she flicked the reins. On, Dunder, she called, her voice catching on his name. He didn't need any encouragement. With a mighty leap, he took them into the sky and headed toward home. She braved a glance behind her as Alaska faded from view. A sense that she'd left something important behind itched at the edges of her mind. Chapter 13 Quick would have liked to stand out in the cold and watch Lux drive away, just to see if she waved before she took the turn, but the cold was too much. He hurried into the house and let out a breath that had been trapped in his stomach. The world wasn't as cold when Lux was around. Even standing near her sleigh was warmer than being alone. He pulled off the scarf she'd given him. His red one, a gift from Ginger last November, was lost, probably in the fire. When he'd gotten dressed to see Lux out, she'd pulled a navy blue scarf from that bag. That bag? A ragged olive green messenger bag fit Lux to a T. He couldn't imagine her carrying a red leather purse like Ginger. The image was disturbing. So was the number of items Lux pulled from the bag that hung as if it were empty. He picked up the mug Lux had left behind, washed it in warm water, and set it on the shelf next to his mug. A smile tugged at his lips. He gave in and just grinned. His tin cup was blue with black specks. Lux's had Thor's hammer on the side. He chuckled, remembering their banter about Tony Stark and Bruce Banner. She was, something. What had he said? She was strange. That was a good line, he berated himself. He may not know much about women, but he knew enough to know he'd said something stupid. Thankfully Lux hadn't seemed all that offended. She was good like that, easy to get along with, didn't take herself too seriously. He sat down at the table. She took the substation seriously though, soaking in every word that dropped from his mouth and applying it with amazing speed. Her mind was like a supercomputer processing at the speed of light. He shifted in his seat and his foot kicked something by his chair that landed with a thump. He scooted back and saw Lux's textbook. He reached for it and paused when he spied a folder with his name on the tab. Gathering everything off the floor, he dropped it on the table and stared. He shouldn't read things that didn't belong to him. Then again, his name was on the folder. Whatever it contained was his business. Scratching his chin, he flipped open the folder. A picture of him and his sister sitting on Santa's lap stared back at him. What? He stared, trying to remember when this was taken. He had to be four, which meant his sister was six. The Santa was jolly, his beard real, and his blue eyes full of Christmas mirth. Emily had on a red dress and a pair of white tights. Quick looked closer and saw a grass stain on her knee. That brought a smile to his face. His sister wasn't one to wear a dress often. He wondered what mom had bribed her with that day. His attention turned to his younger self. Chubby cheeks, hair shaved on the sides and a little longer on top. It was straight back then. He still had the cowlick in the back. Wearing his hair longer helped tame that. He tugged on his beard. Emily wouldn't recognize him if they passed on the street. A weight settled in his stomach. He wouldn't be seeing his sister again, not for a long time, if ever. The next page had a heading that read, List Report Matthew Thomas Quick. He sat up straighter, his gaze focusing like a sniper's. Nice list until age 12. What followed was a detailed list of what he'd asked for each Christmas until he stopped writing Santa. Behind that page were his letters, the handwriting improving over the years. The last two letters were typed. Writing Santa was an assignment in his keyboarding class. Mrs. Mist loved ugly Christmas sweaters, especially ones that lit up. After that was a summary of his grades, then his college application essay, followed by his official college transcripts. Confused and peeved Quick closed the folder and looked for information that would tell him why Lux had all this in her bag. If it was a background check, it was the strangest one he'd ever seen. He dug his fingers into his hair and cursed himself for believing the whole toy factory lie. 
Lux had checked into his past. If she knew he was here, then others might know as well. In two steps he was at the bed, where he yanked out a storage tub. Inside was an iPad. He turned it on and checked into the email account only one other person on the earth knew about. The inbox was empty. His shoulders relaxed. If his cover was blown, if anyone had searched for him online, he would have received notice. That didn't explain how Lux got this information. Wondering over her methods picked at his mind like an unfinished puzzle. She could have raided his parents' storage unit. But if she'd gone that far into his past, she was into something deeper and more sinister than her avocado eyes let on. He didn't want to believe Lux wasn't what she seemed, and that was what made her so dangerous to him. He chewed his lip. She'd promised not to come back, and he had no way to contact her. That was for the best. He looked around the quiet house. Only an hour before, the room was warm and the air crinkled with the connection between them as they worked. Now, the place was silent and sad. Quick got to his feet, needing to move. He powered down the iPad and returned it to the tub and then added the folder and Lux's book. He slid the tub in place and straightened his blankets. He put the picture on the shelf, leaning it against the books so it stayed upright. He promised himself he would take it down tomorrow. He just needed a friendly face to keep him company for a day or so while he tried to forget about Lux. Not that he wanted to, but because he had to. He may not have seen his son in years, may not have rocked him to sleep when his teeth came in, may not have seen his first steps and or walked him to his first day of preschool, but every bit of quick loved that boy and would do all he could to stay under the radar so his kid could grow up without his dad's shadowy past looming over him. Chapter 14 March 26 273 days until Christmas Eve Lux? Mom's voice came over Lux's phone. The walkie-talkie feature came in handy when they were all home. The Kringles Palace was designed like a dumbbell with the family's living quarters on one end and the workrooms and elves' quarters on the other end. Until Dad's time, the elves handmade all the presents. They enjoyed their work and never wanted to be far from the toy factory, the kitchen, the wrapping room, the mail room, or the nice list. Included in the family living quarters was the wood shop where Ginger's husband, Joseph, spent most of his time. He had a wood carving company that he continued to run from the North Pole. Most of his orders were online and since they had flying reindeer, shipping was easy. Each time a daughter had been added to the family, a new room appeared like a spoke on a wheel. When Ginger married Joseph, her room transformed into a suite with an extra bedroom and bathroom for Layla, Joseph's niece, a kitchen, and a family room just for them. Besides all the rooms needed to produce and store toys and stocking stuffers for most of the world, there were several specialty workrooms. Just off the toy production facility was a welding room. Back in the day, this was where tin soldiers, toy cars, and other such toys had been built by Santa and the elves. Now, it was where Lux worked night and day on a miniature version of the substation. With Christmas magic being new and untested in the world of electricity, building a smaller version to test was the safest path. She lifted her welding mask and reached for her phone. I'm in the welding room, she yelled over the sound of sparks flying. Dad was putting the finishing touches on a cable ceiling chamber. I know that, dear. If you don't come to dinner tonight, I'm going to send your father in to drag you out. Dad must have heard, because he killed his torch and lifted his welding mask too. Lux laughed as they made eye contact. Santa looked guilty. His rosy cheeks lifted as he smiled sheepishly. He's already here, she said into the phone. Mom sighed heavily. You two are like Dasher and Dancer. She referred to the two reindeer who continually got into mischief together. They couldn't stand to be harnessed without the other, but if you didn't have a full eight reindeer, then they followed whichever wind blew their way and hauled you off to all corners of the earth as they chased clouds. Dad ho ho hoed. 
Mom chuckled when she heard his laugh. Being angry at Santa was difficult to do, even if you were married to him. He had a general jolliness that filled the air and broke down even the thickest of walls. Dinner starts in thirty minutes, Mom announced. We'll be there. Luck set a timer on her phone for twenty-five minutes. Shower first. Robin's voice cut over the line. It's my birthday. Luck squeezed her eyes shut. Nutcrackers. She'd forgotten Robin's birthday. She didn't even have a gift. Not that her magic purse couldn't help with that, but because gifts were so easy to come by at the North Pole, the family tried extra hard to make them personal. They'd have to leave now if she had to shower, and she needed time to come up with something good. She and Robin didn't spend that much time together. Maybe a new apron. She wrinkled her nose. That was boring. If only the live-action Beauty and the Beast was on Blu-ray. Robin had played the soundtrack non-stop in the kitchens. Five minutes, Dad mouthed. We'll be on time and showered. Lux grinned and set the timer. With five minutes, she could finish this weld and clean up. And bring the dishes, Robin added. Lux's eyes cut to the pile of plates and bowls on the workbench. The elves had kindly brought her meals as she worked and covered her with a blanket when she fell asleep at the drafting table. The harder she worked, the less freedom her mind had to think about quick. Avoiding falling into a fit of daydreams inspired by his strong arms and lightning-fast mind had become her new life goal. She couldn't help but wonder what would have happened if they'd met in another time and place. A college lab would have been perfect. That's where she'd shown the brightest academically and socially. Most of her friends had been men, but in the engineering and physics departments there were few women despite their efforts to recruit more women into the programs. If she'd wanted friends at all, she had to branch out of her tiny snow globe of confidence and actually talk to a man. Turned out, they weren't the enigma she'd made them out to be. Most of them had been snatched up by large corporations. They'd shed their plaid shirts and unruly facial hair for designer suits and shaved jawlines to become clean-cut corporate men like butterflies spreading their wings for the first time. Lux accepted the melancholy that invariably came when thinking of the guys who used to send her Batman memes. As far as they knew, she dropped off the face of the earth, reappearing with a Christmas card at the holidays. If only putting quick in the back of her life was possible. He had a way of popping into her thoughts at the strangest times. Like when she was just drifting off to sleep, his face would appear in her mind, smiling, handsome despite his scraggly beard. She'd spent much too much time pondering that beard. The unkempt look was deceiving. Nothing in Quick's home was out of place. His clothing and bedding were clean, his barn in order, his house laid out with precision. The beard simply didn't fit. She didn't mind it, though. With the beard, his warm brown eyes stood out all the more. His eyes were the hardest to forget, and that was saying something after seeing him without a shirt on. She didn't work as hard to push those memories out of her head. But his eyes? They were mysterious, cautious, and as they went through the plans, so darn intense. Lux? Robin's voice cut through her thoughts. The dishes. I'll bring all that I can carry, Lux promised. She finished her immediate task at the same time Dad finished his, and the timer went off. They cleaned up their tools and he loaded her arms with dishes. I'm going to take these to the kitchen before I shower. Sounds like a plan. Dad held the door for her. Don't trip on the rug. I'll be careful. Lux stopped. Thanks for your help, Dad. His blue eyes twinkled. My pleasure. Lux's heart warmed. Her dad really was the best. Books and movies said that he was all things to all children. That was true when he went out as Santa. 
He spoke all languages, knew every child's heart and deepest desires as well as fears. He gave compassion, laughter, and happiness, dishing them all out like Christmas pudding. For his daughters, he was exactly what each of them needed. Lux needed a welder, so he was a welder. Ginger needed a sandimenter, so he was a mentor. Stella needed an overprotective father to keep her out of trouble, so he was overprotective. Speaking of Stella, her sister bounded down the hallway, wearing a sparkling black tank top, a creamy lace skirt, and Santa boots. Her magic bag, made of black leather with heavy buckles, was slung over her arm. Let me get the door for you. She bumped it open with her backside and waved Lux inside the kitchen with a flourish. Someone's in a good mood. Mom smiled. She was at the stove, several pots bubbling. Chili spices filled the air. A large cake, probably vanilla if she knew her older sister frosted with chocolate buttercream and topped with thirty candles waited for celebrating to begin. I'm thrilled to see Lux, I thought she'd gotten lost for good. Stella twirled, her skirt flying out around her like a nutcracker fairy. Robin rolled her eyes and went back to checking the baked potatoes in the double ovens on the wall. Bye, Mom. Stella gave Mom a one-armed hug. Mom tipped her head to hug her back as she continued to stir. Where are you going? Lux leaned over the counter and slid the dishes onto the stainless steel countertop. Birthday dinners were a big deal around here. Dishwasher. Robin pointed at the industrial dishwasher next to the counter. I just set them down. At least give me a chance to be naughty. Lux pulled the handle to lift the casing around the industrial dishwasher. She picked up a tray and set it on the rollers so she could slide it inside once fully loaded. Stella glided past. I'd give you a chance to be as naughty as you want, want a double date tonight. That explained Stella's happy mood. She had seen Axel every weekend this month. Lux suspected there were a few other meetings Mom and Dad weren't supposed to know about and that she hadn't been privy to because she'd locked herself in the workroom. What's that supposed to mean? asked Mom. Her hand was on her hip, and the wooden spoon dripped chili sauce to the tile floor. Robin glanced at the mess and headed to the sink. She used a wet cloth to wipe up and threw the rag in the dirty clothes basket in the far corner, all without Mom noticing. Nothing. Stella was all innocence, but Lux wasn't buying her act. Neither was Mom. She shook the wooden spoon in Stella's direction. I think it's time we meet this. Axel. Mom almost choked on the name. Lux stifled a laugh. The idea of Santa and Mrs. Kringle sitting down to a nice meal with Axel the tattoo artist was pretty funny. Of course, if Stella married him, then they'd be sitting down to a lot of meals together, family dinners. Stella shook her head much too quickly. He's a flight risk, Mom. Mom narrowed her eyes. He had a bad experience with a couple of his ex-girlfriend's families, and I don't want to scare him off. Lux opened her mouth to point out the obvious warning sign in that statement, but Mom spoke first. I am not scary. Mom's fist tightened around the wooden spoon. Say that without threatening me with a spoon. Stella smirked. I was not. Besides, it's not you I'm worried about. It's Dad. Robin snorted. Yeah. Cause Santa is so mean. She opened the top oven and rubbed butter over the rolls. They would turn dark brown and beautiful with a few more minutes in the oven. So, are you coming? Stella asked Lux. Thanks for the offer, but no. Lux lowered her voice. It's Robin's birthday. You're no fun. Stella turned to Robin. How about you, sis? Wanna throw off that apron and raise some candy cane on the big 3-0? Lux didn't bother to tell her the phrase was raising cane. 
Stella had her own way of looking at life, and Lux wasn't going to change that. She didn't want to. Stella was pretty awesome, even if she was drawn to trouble. Lux finished loading the tray and slid it inside the dishwasher. She lowered the casing and pressed the button to start the machine. Robin lifted one eyebrow. As tempting as that sounds, I'll pass. Then I'm off. Stella headed towards the door. Oh. She reached into her purse and pulled out a small box wrapped with gold paper. Happy birthday, sis. Robin's posture softened a fraction. You didn't have to get me anything. I told everyone I wanted to pretend this birthday didn't exist. What? Stella's hands flew to her chest, and then her arms wrapped Robin in a squishy hug. Without this birthday there would be no you, and that's not a family I want to be a part of. Robin chuckled. You're far too dramatic. Me? You're the one wishing presents and cake away. That's a cry for help if I've ever heard one. Stella released Robin and swiped her finger through the chocolate icing. She winked at all of them and stuck her finger in her mouth as she walked out the door. Wait. Lux called. Give me a heads up if you see any power surges coming our way, would you? Lux. Mom gasped, her hand covering the chest of her red and green polka-dotted apron. That's not appropriate. She rounded on Stella. But highly important information. I expect Lux to inform me and your father of any power surges that take place. Lux shrugged as she pulled out her phone. It's kind of obvious, Mom, the lights will flicker. Besides, I created an app last winter when Ginger was dating Joseph. She looked up from the screen to see all three women staring at her. Stella, behind Mom, was twisting her fingers over her mouth, telling her to lock her lips and throw away the key. Mom looked like a woman who had unwrapped a pair of diamond earrings. Robin's mouth hung open. You can monitor our love lives. Robin asked. Lux looked back and forth between their faces. I, yeah. Is that bad? Mom smiled sweetly. Only for some. She took Lux's phone and rounded on Stella. Have a great time, honey. I'll be right here, she tapped the phone. Waiting for you to get home and tell me all about your date. Stella glared at Lux for a brief moment before smiling at Mom. Can't wait. Keep the cocoa warm. She twirled around and ducked out the door. Mom laughed and handed Lux back her phone. You don't want it. Lux asked, confused. She could rewire a church in under two hours, but figuring out what undercurrent flowed in this conversation was making her head hurt. I trust Stella. Mom smiled at the two of them. I trust all my girls. Then why? Lux pointed from the phone to the door. Mom laughed. It never hurts to be reminded Santa knows if you've been naughty or nice. Lux smiled. Robin folded her arms. I don't like it. Why? Lux closed the app and put her phone in her back pocket. You haven't caused any surges. Robin threw her hands in the air. Exactly. Lux drew her eyebrows together. Mom put her arm around Robin. He wasn't the one, sweetheart. When you're ready to get back out there. Robin stepped away from Mom's embrace. No. I'm not meant to find love. I thought I was, but I thought I was supposed to take over for Dad one day, too. And, well, look how that turned out. The timer went off, and Robin rushed to get the rolls out of the oven before they burned. Lux watched Robin's intense interest in the oven. She must have been trying to avoid the conversation about all of them getting married. Quick's words came back like an echo of doom, remove a power source. There was no avoiding the inevitable. 
Lux followed Rob into the ovens. It's going to take all five of us falling in love to keep Christmas alive, Robin. You can't give up. Easy for you to say, Robin quipped as she pulled out a pan of rolls and moved it between them like a weapon. Lux took a step back from the hot tray. It's not easy. The one guy she actually liked, admired even, had kicked her out. Not once, but twice, and then made her promise not to come back. I don't have a line of suitors like Ginger did, men don't flock to me like they do to Stella. I don't have your natural grace or Frost's adorableness. I'm the geek of the family and stand out for all the wrong reasons. She shoved her glasses up her nose. She didn't even need to wear them if she wasn't in front of the computer, but they'd become a part of her, and she just left them there. Robin frowned. Lux took off the glasses and tucked them into her back pocket. I don't feel sorry for myself or anything, I just know the truth. But if even I can have hope, then you should be fine. She looked back and forth between her mom and Robin as they stared at her with shock. Lux, mom began. Lux held up a hand. Mom, I'm not fishing for compliments or reassurances that there's some man out there just waiting for me. I'm not sparkly like a perfectly wrapped gift under the tree. But that's okay. The man who loves me will have to love me for my brain. But I'm good with that. Robin giggled. Lux, your brain is a supermodel. Mom nodded. Lux lifted a shoulder. What can I say? My cerebrum's got curves in all the right places. Robin laughed, and even Mom chuckled at that one. Lux dusted her palms together. I'm going to go shower. I'll be fast as a reindeer. The hallway from the kitchen to their rooms was deserted. Like the rest of the palace, the walls were a blue-white color. This hallway had family portraits and a few positive affirmation statements. The carpet was red with gold binding, thick enough to wander around without socks and shoes. She used the walk to free her hair from the tight French braid that held it back and kept her safe in the welding room. Loose hair, especially long, loose hair like hers, was an accident waiting to happen. Once through her purple door with a silver knob, she took a moment to consider herself in the mirror above the dresser. No makeup. Dirt smudges on her shirt. Oil stains in her nail beds. Yeah, the man who loved her would have to see past A all that. Though she told Robin she had hoped for finding such a man, she was bluffing. Only one man had seen the real her, the total geek who got excited about formulas and experiments. He was locked away in Alaska with one cup, one plate, and one bowl on his shelf. There wasn't room for Lux in Quick's life, no matter how much she wished there were. She turned away from the mirror so she wouldn't see the frown lines that appeared. She needed to get through dinner and back to the shop, where she could work herself into exhaustion. Maybe tonight she'd fall asleep without seeing Quick's smile in her dreams. Yeah, and maybe the ice castle would melt and she could float to Mexico. Chapter 15 April 12th 256 days until Christmas Eve Lux stripped off her leather work gloves and grinned. She found her phone on the workbench, now dishes free, to take pictures of the cutest little substation ever built. It could be the only mini substation in the world. Ah, she had a one of a kind. A grin split her cheeks as she took image after image to send to her sisters. For the last three and a half weeks, one Kringle or another had dragged her to the dining room for family dinner, where they'd asked relevant questions about her work. They'd never spent this much time discussing what was interesting to her, and she suspected her conversation with Mom and Robin regarding her lack of feminine wiles was a motivator for the increased attention. She didn't need the confidence boost they all seemed to think she did, but she was super grateful they cared about her enough to make the effort. And she was super proud of what she was doing, so talking about it was no hardship. 
she wiped the back of her arm across her forehead. If they thought she worked too hard on the prototype, just wait until she had the go-ahead to build the real thing. She grinned, rubbing her palms together in anticipation. She'd need a crane. Not a new tractor-type crane with a diesel engine that would belch smoke inside, they had no way to vent the room where the substation would reside. She was still working on a name for the room. She'd seriously considered everything from the Gryffindor room to the Black Pearl and Bag End to Arendelle, but nothing fit. Shaking off the distraction of naming the room, she thought more about the crane. It would have to be an old-timey one with ropes and pulleys. One of the reindeer could provide muscle. Dunder had all sorts of powerful legs. Gil tugged at her lunch. She hadn't been to the stables in almost a month. She hadn't been anywhere in almost a month. When she thought about the last time she'd left the North Pole and the way she'd flirted with Quick, she wanted to tuck into the snow and stay close to home. She hit the walkie-talkie button on her phone. There was no sense dwelling on what could have been. The phone beeped and she said, Dad, I'm ready. Ho ho ho, I'm on my way, Dad replied. His good cheer infused Lux with excitement. The prototype was finally done and ready for a test run. She didn't want to take it into the magical room, she tried out the name and wrinkled her nose. They needed a much smaller test than the magic in that room would allow, so she opted to test things in the welding lab Dad said he had an idea and to make sure he was a part of the experiment. Dad's round tummy came through the open door first. He wore a pair of jeans and a red button-up shirt with a white t-shirt underneath. What was left of his hair was cut close to his head. He'd start growing it out in another couple months for those trademark Santa curls at Christmas time. The only Kringle that didn't give in to the hair-growing gene was Stella. She had to cut her pixie look every two weeks to stay on top of it. Let's give this a whirl. Dad rubbed his hands together in anticipation. Lux smiled. Whirling was exactly what they wanted. Okay, this wire connects the mini-sub to that generator. The Christmas tree is plugged into the generator. So, the magic should flow through the mini-sub and into the generator and light up the tree. The prototype should be able to take Christmas power and reduce it to a steady stream three-quarters as strong. Why three-quarters? That's the highest amount of power our systems can handle without overloading. Will three-quarters allow us to expand in the future? Yep. And I should be able to make adjustments in the future if needs be. Kuh, she pressed her finger to her lips. She'd almost said his name. The closer she got to completing the prototype, the harder it was to think of her time with Quick. As short as it may have been, being with someone who got her, really got her, had been wonderful. Someone recommended we use a linear layout to allow for expansion in the future. Dad didn't say anything about her almost slip. Got it. Let's feed it magic and see what comes out. Lux handed him a pair of safety goggles and a thick leather apron that covered him from chest to knees. She wore a matching apron. Once Dad was ready, she flipped the switch on the generator. The motor whirled and chugged. The hairs on Lux's arm stood up. A high-pitched whistle screamed through the air. Lux and Santa covered their ears. The prototype began to shake. Lux snapped off the generator and frowned. Dad walked around the prototype. Magic's going in, look. The incoming lights glowed a bright gold color. She checked to make sure the valve was open. It was. Could there be a block of some sort? asked Dad. She shook her head. I remember putting that together. I pushed my fingers through to make sure it was open and clear. With a huff, she circled the mini-sub. What's in the holding tank? Lux glanced up. Air. Why did you choose air? Lux pulled at her lower lip. I'm on some sort of watch list. 
Any inquiries I made into purchasing SF6 were met with a firm government denial. Water works fine, I just need to make sure I perform regular maintenance. Besides, air is not flammable. I didn't want to blow us up. She took a deep breath. I wonder if it needs a jump start. Dad wiggled his fingers and gold dust gathered around his hand. Luck stared in awe. He just conjured Christmas magic out of thin air. No Kringle had done that before, that she knew of, anyway. Dad's merry blue eyes twinkled. We aren't dealing with electricity. Electricity would jump from finger to finger. Conduit to conduit, Lux amended. Right. Magic doesn't jump. She reached out to touch one of the sparkles. It was warm and tickled. It floats. Like fireflies. Lux groaned. How am I going to harness the power of fireflies? Let's try a more direct approach. Dad wiggled his fingers again, directing the magic towards the input valve. The magic went in. The input lights glowed. The holding tank filled. And nothing happened. Lux dropped her face into her hands. The smell of metal and oil was strong. I need a new conductive material. What conducts love? asked Dad. Lux threw her hands in the air. Like I know. Dad chuckled at her exasperated reaction, his big hands on his round belly. I've been married for many years, and I'm still not sure what conducts love. It's not like you can fill this thing with kind words and hand-holding and kissing. She scowled. An expression that didn't feel right on her face. She rarely scowled, but this prototype was supposed to work and they were supposed to move to phase 3 and Christmas was supposed to be safe and Stella was supposed to get married to keep the magic flowing. Lux rounded on her dad. You conduct Christmas magic, she said excitedly. Her shoulders dropped. But I can't stuff you into the machine. Don't think I'd fit anyway. Dad patted his belly. That earned him a small smile. Come here. She pulled him over to the large farm-style sink where they washed their hands. The copper glistened in the light. She plugged the sink and then turned on the water. Once it was halfway full, she motioned for Dad to come closer. Do your wiggle thing and see if the magic moves through the water. Dad lifted an eyebrow. My wiggle thing. I'm not talking about your cookie jar. She patted his bowl full of jelly. He swatted her hand away. Watch me work. With a quick move of his fingers, he had a trail of magic in the air. He thrust his hands into the water. The magic stayed there, like snowflakes in a snow globe. Excited Lux grabbed a bowl and scooped water into it. The magic stayed in the water. Bingo! The old substations used water to transfer the electricity. The newer ones use SF6 because it doesn't have a shelf life and won't erode the tank, but before that, they used water. Lux considered using SF6, but with her high-profile status on the watch list, she didn't want to risk exposing the whole Christmas operation. Yeah. Dad pulled his hand out of the sink and high-fived her. Water dripped everywhere but neither of them cared. Lux scooped another bowl full of water before watching the magic dots swirl down the drain. I still have tests to run. She lifted both bowls. So far, the magic stayed bright. How long do you think before this fades? To tell you the truth, I've never tested it. You've never had a reason to. We've got a reason now. Lux nodded. March was almost over. Building this prototype had taken a month and she still had to make adjustments so it actually worked. With any luck, she'd be done before Stella said, I do. Otherwise they'd all be saying goodbye to the North Pole, the Elves, and Santa Claus. Chapter 16 April 16th
252 days until Christmas Eve. Quick rummaged through the boxes under his bed for something to eat. The rubber totes kept mice and any other unwanted guests out of the food. He hadn't made the trip into town since New Year's Day, and his supplies were getting low. The greenhouse garden was far from yielding anything edible, which left him dependent on canned and dehydrated goods. He found a stray can of chicken noodle soup and a package of noodles. Not exactly a feast. 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 His hands dropped as he considered the calendar where he marked every day since Lux's visit off with a red pen. Red because her hair was red. February had blended into March, which inevitably went out like a lamb. April, now there was an interesting month. Trudy at the Grizzly Café would have an Easter feast. All were welcome as long as they contributed to the meal. He could bring his paltry supplies, and they'd let him in without question. He may have to share a table with a few other outcasts, but that was amiable, as outcasts preferred not to engage in engaging conversation. He needed to go into town for supplies anyway. Might as well make it a holiday trip. No one would think his appearance was strange, especially considering the number of shut-ins that rode their sleds to listen to the pastor's Easter sermon. For some, it was the only time they made it to church. With a nod, he wrapped his blue scarf around his neck and took a deep breath. The yarn smelled like peppermint cocoa, like Lux. If ever he wanted to conjure her face, with her black rectangular glasses, slightly upturned nose, and full lips, all he needed to do was wrap himself in this scarf and she was there. Well, not really there. She wasn't real. No, she was real. There really was a Lux out there in the world. She just wasn't here. Which was a shame. He threw open the door to let the cold air take his mind off women and full lips and a missed opportunity. The wind bit at his cheeks, and he burrowed deeper into the scarf. It hadn't snowed in a couple of days, and his footsteps crunched. The snowmobile started right away and he took off, not wanting to waste any time. It could take two hours or more to make the trip. On the outskirts of Clearview, traffic picked up, and Quick had to slow down to allow a dog-sled team to merge into his snow-covered lane. The dogs panted and pulled, straining against the leather ropes. The driver wasn't someone Quick recognized, and he didn't wave. A steady stream of heavy coats and wool hats poured into the church. Quick glanced around, making sure no one watched him. He ducked his head and made his way through the throng of neighbors catching up to the back pew, where he sat by himself. Just before the pastor took his place in the front of the room, someone slid in next to Quick. He glanced out of the corner of his eye and then jerked his head around to stare at Lux's sister Stella. She had short black hair, a black fur coat, like teddy bear fur, not real bear fur like some wore around these parts, and a red skirt that landed just above her knee. She wore black boots that came to her knees and no gloves. He stared at her hands, then at his own, which were bright pink, and he'd worn beaver fur gloves. She turned his way and dropped a wink before settling her attention on Pastor Willis up front. Quick tried to do the same. He put his gloves in his lap and folded his hands for prayer. He mumbled through the hymns, never having been much of a singer but enjoying the exuberance of those who were. Through the preliminaries, his thoughts kept going back to Lux. He'd hardly thought about her on the ride, choosing to focus on the path before him and his shopping list. His mind straying to the red-headed beauty was Stella's fault. He'd been able to hold back the curiosity while alone but with Lux's sister sitting right next to him, he fought the desire to pepper her with questions. Since Lux left, she hadn't contacted him again, sticking to her end of the bargain and leaving a trail of loneliness in her wake. Not a day went by that he didn't touch a finger to her mug and wonder if she thought of him. Her disappearance, headed north nonetheless, multiplied his questions a hundredfold. Had she finished the prototype? Did it work? Where did she get the list report? How did she have access to his exceptionally personal information? Why was she really building the substation? When he could stand the speculation no more, he bumped Stella with his elbow. Hey, he whispered. She scooted away from him and pointed at Pastor Willis as if he should be paying more attention to the sermon. 
He paused. Willis placed his palm over the New Testament. Christ set the perfect example and asks us to follow in his footsteps. Quick lasted another three and a half minutes before he closed the space between him and Stella. I need to ask you something. Stella shook her head. Shoo, she glanced around to make sure no one was looking. I'm not supposed to be here. Quick leaned back slightly. If you wanted to blend in, you should ditch the princess apparel. Stella's jaw dropped and she glanced down. Taking advantage of her speechlessness Quick plowed ahead. Does the prototype work? Stella's eyebrows came together. It's blocked. They won't let her build it. Probably too much red tape. Governments could slow a project down by holding a meeting or wanting to hold a meeting or scheduling a meeting for three years out. The question was, what government had stood in Lux's way? In his past life, he could have made a few calls and found out all he wanted to know, maybe even help push the project along. Up here, he was useless. A rock settled in his stomach and didn't sit well. He shouldn't even think about making phone calls to the generals, ever. No, Stella shook her head. She built it, but it's blocked and the, she looked around again. Power can't get through. He nodded his head. She's using the wrong conductor. The old stations used water, she'll have to watch out for corrosion issues, but... Stella cut him off with a shake of her head. It's too cold. Right. Because it's the North Pole. Stella's eyes went huge. She told you that? It's on the plans. Oh. The man across the aisle gave them a dirty look. Stella wiggled her fingers and blew him a kiss. He turned red and stared straight ahead. Quick stifled a laugh. He put a respectable distance between him and Stella. She didn't blow him a kiss, thank goodness. Stella was fun and all, but she wasn't his type. Not that he had a type. But if he did, well, he was partial to redheads. He tipped his head back and stared at the white ceiling with the long, thick beams running back and forth and diagonally. Running wires through the beams was impossible, so he and Lux had attached wires to the sides to make the loop for electricity to flow. His chin dropped. A loop. She needed a loop. Quick scooted over, put his hand under Stella's arm and encouraged her out of the pew and out of the church. She made a small protest but nevertheless allowed him to take her outside without drawing too much attention to the two of them. He tucked his beaver gloves beneath his arm. Stella seemed to emit heat like Lux. Not like Lux. Lux radiated heat and created it inside of him. Stella just kept the cold at bay. Once the door shut behind them Stella glared. What's your deal? He waved off her irritation. Sorry. But this was too big to whisper. K? The conductor won't work because of the sub-zero temperatures and water would freeze, but if Lux can build a loop for the water to circulate by the core, then the water will stay warm enough to work. She blinked. I speak a lot of languages, but Geek is not one of them. He grunted. Tell her she needs to run the water through a heat coil of some sort. Stella put up both hands. Quick barely noticed they were bare and in perfect health before she dropped them again. I'll do my best. She reached for the handle to go back inside. Wait. He stopped her. What's this for, anyway? Christmas, she replied with a shrug before slipping back inside. Quick was getting tired of that answer. He wanted specifics. He scrambled to get his gloves on. Stella was gone and his chapped hands hurt. With a grunt in the general direction of the church doors, he spun on his heel. The only person likely to give him honest answers wasn't likely to return to his cabin door. He wrapped his arms around his middle. The church stoop suddenly seemed much colder. Or maybe that was the cold inside his chest when he thought of never seeing Lux again. An animal snorted. There were lots of animals around. Dogs, horses, a goat. But the one animal that drew his attention was a reindeer hitched to a sleigh. He narrowed his eyes and stomped in that direction. 
If Lux and Stella wouldn't give him answers, then he'd find them on his own. No one was outside, but the final hymn floated through the windows. He didn't have much time to see what he could find in the sleigh, but he'd give it a shot. The reindeer was not the same one Lux had driven the day she rescued him from the lake. That one was calmer and had a grey tuft of hair on his chin. This one was dark brown with a large rack and a crazy look in his eye. Oh, boy. He lifted a hand up to let the reindeer sniff him. The reindeer moved as slowly as quick, and then suddenly made an attempt to bite his hand. His teeth snapped together loud enough that it cracked in Quick's ears. Quick stumbled back. There would be no inspecting the sleigh with that beast on guard. Growling and grumbling, he started up his snowmobile and headed down to the Grizzly Café for a hot meal. He entertained the idea that some questions were best left unanswered for about two seconds. The sisters were different, and he would find out not only how but why. Chapter 17 Luck stared into the fireplace. She still wore her Easter dress, designed by Frost. The V-neck dipped lower than she was used to, but the royal blue floral print lit up her hair like a classy Christmas tree, and she loved it. Frost was amazing like that, sharing her talents. She'd gone so far as to make a dress for Grandma. The family traveled to Mexico for Easter. They attended services, ate dinner with her grandparents, and spent the evening on the beach. Luck still had sand stuck to her legs, where it glistened like a thousand sparklers in the firelight. With a sigh, she dropped her chin to her hand. Easter Sunday, and she wasn't any closer to finishing the prototype. Thankfully Stella was closer to her goal. She'd flown off to spend time with Axel and his family for the holiday. Such a big step, meeting a guy's parents. She'd never stepped that far into a relationship before, and her desire to move forward bolstered Lux's hopes they'd be engaged soon. Stella breezed in, a northerly chill following her. Speak of the sister. Lux considered the snow on Stella's boots with a raised eyebrow. I thought Axel lived in Southern California. He does. Lux pointed to the puddle forming on the Turkish rug. Stella stomped her feet. Don't go all Nancy Drew on me. You're going to find out anyway, because I have news. What? Lux sat up taller. Stella tucked her hands behind her back. I saw Quick. You went to see Quick. Lux had the strange urge to kick her sister in the shins and pull her short hair. I went to church in Alaska on my way home. She took off her fur coat and threw it over the back of Dad's chair before sitting down. Her red skirt and black blouse were amazing. So perfectly tucked and untucked in all the right places. Why? That doesn't matter. Stella waved away her question. What matters is that Quick asked about the prototype. He asked about the mini-sub. Lux deflated. Of course he would ask about the project and not about her. Here she was, doing all in her power to keep her thoughts on the nice list when it came to him and his body and his mind and his bare chest. Blast that lake for sucking him under. If she'd never touched his skin, as innocent as the contact had been, she wouldn't have been branded with the feel of him. And the way his wet hair felt between her fingers. That was something to behold. And he said you need a loop. Lux blinked away the naughty list images in her head and lifted both hands. I have no idea what that means. Stella tipped her head to the side and swirled her finger in the air. Something about moving water around. Lux closed her eyes. Did he mean move the tank? To where? How should I know? I've told you time and again, you need to learn to speak geek. Lux bolted to her feet and began to pace. You're getting sand all over the rug. That's why we have a robot vacuum. A gift Lux had given their mother for her birthday. Mom loved the little helper and immediately named him McFly. 
Frost glued googly eyes on him and giggled every time he made his way through the palace. Lux blocked Stella out as she recapped her time in Alaska. If I move the tank, I'll have to change the whole design. She couldn't do that without quick. Stella. Stella jumped. What? I need to contact quick. Will you? Lux hesitated. She could do a lot of things, but she'd never applied herself to hacking. She could learn, but they were running out of time. She had less than eight months to build a substation, a project that normally took two years. A wicked little smile formed on Stella's bright lips. Will I what? Lux squeezed her eyes shut. I should not ask her to do this. Will you look up quick? Stella clapped her hands together quickly. Yes. Follow me to my lair. When you say it like that, I feel like I'm following a spider. Stella walked backwards in front of Lux. She mimed reeling Lux in. That's not funny. It is, you're just too stressed out to laugh. They made their way into the hall and headed toward toy production, where Stella's office overlooked the elves' workroom. You should be the one stressed out. Lux swung open the office door. I just have to build a machine, you have to fall in love and get married in less than eight months. Stella paled slightly. No problem. She sat on her chair and rolled under the desk. Her fingers flew across the keyboard faster than reindeer hooves. Here you go. She hit print and a sheet popped out of the industrial printer. Quick's email address gleamed in green ink. Okay. Okay. Lux shook her hands in front of her to work up her nerve. Stella lounged in her chair, examining her fingernails. What's taking so long? Not all of us are proficient at this. What's this? Stella's neck strained as she worked to not laugh. Nothing. I'm going to my room. Lux let the door slam on Stella's laughter. Cackle was more like it. With every step, her legs moved faster until she burst into her room at a run. She ran right to her laptop, not pausing to think about the consequences or if this was the right thing to do or if she was breaking their deal by sending an email. She dashed off a quick question to see if Quick would even answer her. He might be upset that she made this move. Not that she was making moves on him. A small smile teased her lips. She'd like to make moves on him. Actually, she would like him to make the moves. The idea of being pressed against the wall with his arms on either side of her wasn't entirely a bad one. She chewed her thumbnail. Nothing happened for a while. Instead of standing around and obsessing over why he hadn't answered Lux headed to the welding lab. She stared at the machine, trying to make sense of Stella's cryptic message. A loop? He couldn't have meant an energy loop. The whole point of this thing was to have Christmas magic flow through it, not circulate. She sat down on the workbench and placed her phone next to her, tuning her ear to the chime that would indicate an incoming email. Time ticked slowly by, the cuckoo clock chirping out the hour. She couldn't remember seeing a computer at Quicks, but there were solar panels on his roof. She'd seen those when she flew over. He could have a phone. Her phone worked anywhere in the world, and satellite phones did well in remote locations. She dropped her head to her arms and groaned. Who was she kidding? He wasn't going to answer her. They'd made a deal. But then, by talking to Stella, he'd opened the door. It wasn't like Lux had gone back to his cabin, she hadn't even gone to his town. He was the one who talked to Stella a fact that bothered her as much as a crushed candy cane in her shirt. She shivered and shimmied at the thought. Just when she was ready to find some hot chocolate, her phone dinged. Chapter 18 As per his usual routine Quick checked his email after being in town. The account was his only contact to his past life and the security of an early warning. 
His work on a classified U.S. project had earned him a medal he would never wear and a target on his back. Several nations had pointed their sniper rifles his way. After a failed attempt on his life in which his bodyguard had been killed quick took his commanding officer's offer to disappear. His enemies knew he was still alive, but they had no idea where to look. He'd been dropped into the Alaskan wilderness with the admonition to stay out of trouble. If he was found out, there wasn't anything his old battalion could do for him. The only protection they promised was to warn him if his location was leaked. It wasn't much, but he wouldn't ask anyone else to sacrifice their life for him. No matter what he could do, his life was no more important than those who were assigned to protect him. That's why, as he stared at the computer screen, two parts anger and one part fear mixed to make his hands shake as he typed a reply to Lux's question. How did you get this email? He didn't have to wait long for a reply. Stella. As if that explained anything. How did she find it? IDK. She has mad Google skills. He ran his hands through his hair. Some of the best hackers in the world were scanning the internet, looking for him. If Stella could find him, that meant they could too. Cold sweat trickled down his back. He had to get rid of her, she could be in danger too. The idea of sweet Lux, with her glasses and thin frame, facing off with the kind of men who wanted him dead made him sick. Bye. Wait, what is this loop Stella mentioned? He cursed. Find a way to heat the water. You could run pipe like a loop, past the core. Son of a Grinch that's brilliant. He stared at the screen. Did you really just type, son of a Grinch? Sorry. Christmas curse. Smiling face. Quick couldn't help but smile. Lux was two parts childhood wonder and seven parts fascinating woman. Before his life of solitude, he was divorced and in the military, surrounded by scientists, eating, sleeping, and breathing their top-secret project. There wasn't a lot of time for diversions. At least, not the kind Lux offered. Which made it harder for him to acknowledge that after this conversation, he would have to shut the email account down. Perhaps that's why he left himself an out. Christmas curse forgiven. Hope the adjustments work. Let me know how it goes. Her reply didn't come through as quickly as before. He could imagine her long and graceful fingers hovering over the keyboard, her hair brushing across her forehead as she wondered if he'd lost his senses. Maybe he had. I will keep you posted. Over and out. It was his turn to hesitate. Over and out, was that a reference to his military service? Was she trying to tell him that she knew who he was? Out. He got out of the account and proceeded to delete it from existence. If Lux wanted to talk to him again, she'd need to show up in person. That was good. He felt safer looking her in the eye. He typed Lux's name into a search field. Nothing came up without a last name. He glanced around the room, looking for inspiration, when his eyes landed on the blue scarf she'd given him before she left. That fancy letter K had to stand for something. He added the K to the last name field and hit search. Four possibilities came up. He ruled out the barista in WA, the stripper in Wendover, NV, and the mother of four in Tennessee, which left him with Lux Kringle, last known residence Pasadena, California. He clicked on the More Information button and was rewarded with a list of her degrees. Impressive. Now that he had her name, he put it into another search engine hoping for updated contact information. He got nothing. Not a cell phone number, not an address, not even a former employer. Lux Kringle was off the grid, a fact that both impressed and unnerved him. The question was, were they on the same side or enemies? That was a question he couldn't answer without more data. In order to get more data, he needed more time with Lux and her mysterious machine. He closed his eyes, knowing he shouldn't, but he prayed for Lux's return. Chapter 19 May 21. 217 days until Christmas Eve. Quick trudged up the half-mud, half-ice river bank. With his fishing shack at odds with the lake, he didn't go out that far on the ice. 
The feeling of fading into the cold, becoming part of it, woke him at least once a week. He had a lot of bad memories to deal with, but that one lingered. Besides, the ice was melting. It was May, after all. Knitted in with the scary moments of that day were the warm ones with Lux. He'd gone over and over the time in her sleigh and decided that it must have felt warm in comparison to the frigid waters, and that's why he'd thought something weird was going on. He'd been in shock, suffered a trauma, and his mind wasn't processing information correctly. For example, there was no way Lux wore a tank top outside and didn't freeze. Her beautifully rosy skin would have been bright red if she had. No, that must have been his imagination filling in the blanks after the fact. Having decided all of that, he had to admit that his imagination was pretty convincing. His heavy boots slipped and his knee landed on a rock, taking his mind off Lux's skin and onto the sharp pain in his leg. He cursed and headed for the four-wheeler parked on the edge of the lake. Three large trout, almost frozen, clicked together in his sack. The auger used to break through the ice balanced on his shoulder. The blade was dull, and he'd need to sharpen it before he went out again. The sun was dropping faster than he liked. Getting caught out at night wasn't smart. He should have headed back earlier, would have if he hadn't been distracted by thoughts of Lux. He stowed his catch in a plastic tub that he'd bungee corded to the machine before turning the key and pressing the gas. The four-wheeler fired right up, the lights falling across the pathetic patches of snow. What was once a stunning landscape with fluffy mounds of fresh snow was turning into a mud and muck mess. The back of his coat would be covered in mud splatters by the time he got to the cabin. Most parts of the world were warming up, getting ready for school to let out and the splash pads to turn on. Not up here. A couple weeks still remained before the roads would harden enough to travel into town and back. Nighttime temperatures were still below freezing, and his wood supply was running low. He pointed toward home and gunned it. When he rounded the entrance to Boulder Canyon, the engine sputtered and died. Cursing, he turned the key only to have it grind pathetically. He looked down, considering his options. The cabin was still a couple of miles away, and he hadn't brought his snowshoes. He'd freeze before he got there. His mind went into survival mode. The machine was good for warmth for another ten minutes. With a grunt, he looked for a place to build a cave. There. One long and skinny tree had fallen against a rock and left just enough space for him to fit. He'd hunker down until sunlight and then hike home. If he didn't freeze to death in his sleep. Thirty minutes later Quick was tucked inside his shelter. He had a military-grade silver blanket wrapped around his back like a super cape. Another worked as a barrier between him and the hard-packed snow floor. Outside, the wind howled and the trees swayed. He prayed his one lopsided tree would hold and he could get some sleep. Several hours later Quick hadn't slept a wink. His hands shook from the cold. That was a good sign. When they stopped shaking was when he needed to worry. He needed sleep, but at this point, he was afraid that if he closed his eyes, he wouldn't open them again. No one would find him here. He took in the small, rectangular space he'd been able to carve out and shuddered at the idea that he'd dug his own grave and crawled right in. Can't think that way. Stay positive. His eyes watered with the cold. Inside the cave was probably 20 degrees warmer than outside the cave, but that wasn't saying much. He'd been exposed to the frigid temperatures for far too long. Despite his best efforts, his mind continued to bring up subjects he didn't want to think about. His son was one of them. Most of the time, he could imagine Oliver happy and healthy and oblivious to the horrible people who used him as blackmail to keep Quick under their thumb. Quick's eyelids drifted shut, and it took monumental effort to lift them again. He stared numbly at the wall. For a second, he thought he heard sleigh bells. Now I know I'm losing it. The world was quiet, and then the bells came again. Moving with frustrating slowness, his limbs stiff, he crawled forward and stuck the top half of his body out the opening. Seeing the sleigh and the reindeer and the figure with the fur-lined coat was too much. Several bells were attached to the harness, and they glinted in the pale moonlight. 
Quick could only stare as the lantern bobbed closer to his cave and then stopped. The figure hopped off the sleigh, snagged the lantern from its post, and approached his four-wheeler. Hello, called a distinctly female voice. The voice shot enough warmth through Quick that his mind jolted into a state of awareness. Hello, he called, waving his arm above his head. Quick, came the reply. Is that you? Yes. He laughed with relief. Struggling to get his back end free, he ended up rolling out of the hole and landing at his rescuer's black boot-clad feet. His eyes trailed up a green velvet cloak, lined with white fur, to find Lux's wide eyes peering down at him. There was a small line of confusion between her brows that he wished he could smooth away. Would you mind giving me a ride home? he asked. Lux reached down to help him up, her hands bare. Strange. At her touch, the chill fell away like pine needles on a dead tree. How long have you been out here? she asked, her hands still on his arms. Too long. He should ask her what she was doing here, the reason she was out at night, without gloves. He closed his eyes and shook his head. He must be seeing things. What was he thinking about? Lux looked at his four-wheeler. Is that yours? He nodded, wondering if he'd ever feel his ears again. I'll take a look. She released him, and he stumbled back. Careful, she said over her shoulder as she grabbed her messenger bag off the seat and tromped over. She pulled off the seat to get a look at the engine and sniffed loudly. Smells like a fuel leak in the line. I just replaced it. His teeth chattered, and he gathered the foil blanket closer as the wind picked up. Lux gave him a look that said I've got this. Can you hold this? She held up the lantern. Quick made his legs move, they were stiff but not useless. The reindeer with the grey patch on his chin followed Quick, his snout by Quick's boots. Is he tame? Lux brushed her hair off her forehead. Dunder's as tame as a reindeer can be. Dunder nipped at Quick's pants. Hey! Quick jumped away. Lux shook her head. Here, give him this. She reached into her bag and pulled out a carrot. Quick took the bright vegetable and stared. The orange flesh was crisp and the green stalk wasn't limp. Carrots this fresh and this large wouldn't be around these parts for a couple of weeks, even in his greenhouse. Quick brought it to his nose and drank in the fresh scent. Dunder bumped him with his antlers. The pokey parts. Quick took in the animal's lowered head and flared nostrils and handed over the vegetable without an argument. Dunder turned his attention to eating, and Quick turned his attention to Lux and his four-wheeler. To his surprise Lux was installing a new fuel filter. Quick pointed. How did you? We have the same model. Lux patted the engine. She touched it as if the metal were at room temperature instead of below freezing. Lux pulled a rag from her bag and wiped her hands clean. That should do it. What about the leak? A loose hose, no biggie. She shrugged. Start her up. Quick stepped around her, removing the key from his pocket as he moved. She placed a hand on his arm, and his shaking stopped but his heart rate accelerated. For over a month, he wondered who Lux worked for and how she knew so much about him but staring into her deep green eyes, the only thing he wondered was if she would stay for dinner. He laughed to himself. When he got cold, he got loopy. He turned the key and nothing happened. Dead battery. He tried again. Nothing. Lux's eyes were large as she looked at where her hand met his arm. Try again. He leaned over to see if there was any reading on the gauge. Something sparked red and gold, and the four-wheeler roared to life. An alarm on Lux's phone went nuts. What's that? he yelled over the engine. What? Lux cupped her hand around her ear. That spark. Did you see it? She lifted both hands and shook her head. Quick was too cold and too tired to carry on a conversation by yelling. Follow me. She stepped back breaking their physical connection, and he shivered. The ride to his cabin was miserable. 
he continually glanced over his shoulder to make sure the swaying lantern was still behind him. He pulled into the garage and shut down the engine. Turning, he saw Lux go for the barn. This was his chance to get answers, and he wasn't going to let it fly by. He pushed open the wooden door to find Lux adding wood to a small stove. A stove that hadn't been in the barn the last time he looked. Where did that come from? I brought it. She shrugged as if people carried wood-burning stoves with them on a regular day. He shook his finger at Lux. See, that's exactly the kind of thing that makes me wonder what on earth you are up to. The temperature was already starting to rise, but that might have been because he was standing close to Lux. She had a way of making his heart beat faster, which raised his metabolic rate, which in turn raised his internal temperature. Only this time there were no sharp pins and needles as he thought out. She shut the door to the miniature stove and stood tall. She was just tall enough that he could kiss her with ease. Not that he was thinking about kissing her. Kissing took easy conversation to a whole other level that made interrogation difficult. I'm not up to anything. She walked to the other side of the sleigh, where there was a large object covered by a blanket. Then what's that, he demanded. She whipped the blanket off to reveal a miniature substation. What do you think? She clasped her hands in front of her chest. He slowly made his way over, taking in the amazing details. It's stunning. She blushed. Thanks. By the tip of her shoulder and the way she moved her jaw, he could tell she'd slaved over the prototype and was proud of her work. She should be, the contraption was darn near perfect. He pulled at his beard. What is this for again? She dropped her shoulder. A toy factory. Her hands got busy folding the blanket and then stowing it in the sleigh. Yes, you said that. What's it really for? She flipped around. Excuse me? A toy factory would hire a US-based company to build their substation, they wouldn't have their daughter or sister design it. They would if she could. But you couldn't, you needed me. Which leads to my second question, how did you find me? Find you? You came to Alaska looking for me, didn't you? The church rewiring was a trap to get me to reveal who I am. Who are you? You tell me. Okay, your name is Matthew Thomas Quick, and you're an electrical engineer. Keep going. She shrugged. That's all I've got. She pulled a wrench out of her bag and tightened a bolt. Quick watched. I've got a hundred reasons not to trust you. I don't know anything beyond your name and that you're building this modified substation at the North Pole. I should kick you out and tell you not to come back. She rolled her eyes. You already did that. Yeah. A lot of good that did me. She pushed her glasses up on her nose and checked the other bolts, effectively avoiding eye contact with him. However, this wasn't a liar's trick. The way she avoided him was more like she was shy. Which was endearing. What do you want to know, she asked quietly. He thought for a moment, wanting to pick a question that would test her honesty. What's your last name? That was something he'd figured out on his own, and she didn't know that he knew the right answer. If she lied, he'd be able to catch her right quick. Kringle. What's your dad's name? Harvey Kringle. How many sisters do you have? Four. Brothers? Zero. Reindeer? Twenty-eight with a new one expected soon. Dunder snorted in agreement. Lux winked at him. Dunder is going to be a grandpa. Quick filed the information away because it wasn't important. He wanted to know about her. Where do you live? North Pole. Quick nodded. He'd heard of the Alaskan town that looked like they'd hired elves for city planners. Do you always tell the truth? Of course. She looked properly offended. I'm a Kringle. It's a family trait. Who do you work for? My dad. Does he pay you enough? Money? No. But there are other perks. She tucked a loose strand of hair behind her ear and leaned against the sleigh. 
Quick took the spot next to her. He expected Lux to be defensive or at least annoyed by his questioning, but she was chill. Like using the company reindeer, he supplied. Dunder stamped a hoof. Exactly. Quick scratched his neck. Lux's face was open and clear, she didn't fidget, and her breathing patterns were regular, which all added up to her telling the truth. There was something weird going on with this woman, and he couldn't figure it out. What he did figure out was that he liked being with her. He enjoyed her openness and her relaxed personality. There wasn't any stress to look right, dress right, talk right, or entertain. Lux gave him space to be himself and yet she made him feel valued. He turned, leaning his hip on the sleigh, and looked deep into her eyes. They swirled with emotions, nervousness, and something else he couldn't name. Are you a good guy or a bad guy? A broad grin lifted her cheeks. I am one of the ultimate good guys. Our family mission is to make children happy. What could be more good than that? He had no answer because he'd fallen into her gaze, trapped by her beauty and the overwhelming attraction growing between them. Lux leaned closer and his temperature bumped up by several degrees. He brushed his fingers up her arm, and his gaze dropped to her lips. An alarm went off on Lux's phone. She frowned slightly and stepped back, putting distance between them as she shut it off. There was a crackling noise, and Stella's voice came over the speaker like a walkie-talkie. Stella to Lux. Where are you? Lux's face blushed pink. I'm in Quick's barn. We've got some nice surges going on up here. Are you sure it's not your fault? There was a pause. Yeah. I'm in the office. Okay, I'll, uh, why don't you shut down? We're going to look over the prototype, and I can't control it right now. Stella hooted, and Lux shoved her phone in her back pocket. My turn. Lux was suddenly busy stowing her tools. How do you survive out here? He paused for a moment to consider whether he was willing to let this game go any further. He could stomp out of here right now, but he'd already spent a month berating himself for not taking a chance when it was before him, he wouldn't do that again. He wasn't a man to run from a challenge, and getting to know Lux while maintaining his invisibility in the world would be a challenge. Well, I have a small garden in the summer. I hunt for game and I fish. Yeah, I get that. But who rescues you when I'm not around? She looked up at him from lowered lashes. You seem to court trouble. I do not court anything. She lifted one eyebrow. Today was a fluke. Did you ask Ginger to move out here? That was a question he wasn't expecting. He hooked his thumb in his pocket. I asked her to homestead with me. She was resourceful, nothing like you. I mean, you would be great out here. It wasn't anything romantic, I'm not that kind of guy. You're not romantic. Not usually. But that's not what I meant. He stepped a little closer, testing to see if she would let him near. She jumped away pretty quickly when Stella called. Maybe her family didn't approve of him or something. Ha! Huh. Lux bit her lip, but she didn't move away. Ha huh, what? Well, if you're not usually romantic, I'm wondering what constitutes an unusual romantic situation. Well, usual romance is candlelight dinners, bouquets of red roses, teddy bears, chocolates, evening strolls on the beach. She nodded. So an unusual situation might be in a barn. Her eyes went wide as he closed the distance between them. With a reindeer. Dunder snorted. He was still harnessed to the sleigh, so there wasn't much he could do to interrupt them. And a very smart, kind, beautiful woman. He brushed his fingers over her cheeks and she gasped. This would be an unusually romantic situation. Oh, she breathed. He moved his left hand to her waist and pulled her closer. His right hand cupped her cheek. Soft particles of light danced in his peripheral vision. Quick. Her voice was low and husky. Is this you being romantic? Quick placed his forehead against hers. This is Alaskan romance at its finest. She sighed and nestled into him. 
He began to sway the two of them, wanting to dance with this beautiful creature. What's your favorite song? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. How appropriate, with the fire and the lingering snow outside and the warm woman in his arms. He began humming, all of his best Christmas memories from childhood flashing through his head and creating a glow around them. Before long, he was carried away in the moment. He took Lux's hand in his and led her in a small box step. Violins and violas and flutes and drums picked up where his humming left off. Lux tipped up her chin, her eyes wide with wonder. Once their gazes locked, they couldn't tear them away. Fairy lights twinkled in the air, and they were transported from his musty barn to a ballroom with smooth, polished floors, a buffet table full of sweets, and a giant Christmas tree in the center of the floor, decked with red bows and gold balls and white snowflakes and ribbons. Quick began to sing, quietly, wanting the melody to be just for him and Lux. This was her favorite song, and he wanted her to hear it from him. With the symphony drawing out the final notes, he dipped Lux. Her hands threaded into his hair and he was done for. Before he knew what had happened, their lips came together in a soft caress. Boom! The rafters shook. Their lips broke apart. He whipped Lux to her feet and gathered her close to his chest. The conductor. Lux shoved his chest and tore herself out of his arms. The prototype substation whirled and twirled. There were no sparks arching between circuits, but a large stream of the twinkling lights was going in one end and a smaller stream came out the other. Disoriented Quick leaned on one of the heavy beams that held up the hayloft. Where had the ballroom gone? The machine sparked red sparks. Like the one he'd seen early with the four-wheeler. That's not possible, he mumbled. A low rumbling built. Cut the power, he yelled over the increasing din. Lux whirled on him. I can't. Why not? Because we're the power source. What? She wasn't making any sense. You have to leave. She went to push him toward the door and recoiled as green sparks joined the red ones and bolts shook, clanking ominously. Quick reached for her. I'm not leaving you in here. You have to. She scrambled for her bag. No, I don't. He squatted down, grabbed her legs, and threw her over his shoulder. A whistling joined the humming and clanking. Quick sprinted for the door. They cleared the threshold just as the ground shook. He stumbled. Metal ripped and quick dove for cover. They rolled a couple of times, stopping in a pile of snow. He put his body on top of hers, expecting a repercussion of some sort. When the noises all died down Lux wiggled out from underneath him. The mini-sub. She stumbled into the barn. Quick stared at the structure. Not a beam was out of place. Not a board was crooked. Nutcrackers. Lux yelled. Metal clanged together as if she'd thrown something. He hurried over, wondering if he was going insane. Had he imagined the whole thing? The symphony, the explosion? Reality was slipping away. He poked his head in the door. Is it safe? Chapter 20 Not for you. Lux didn't mean the words to come out like she was angry. The truth of the matter was that Christmas magic didn't pose a threat to her. Because she was a part of it, the magic couldn't harm her. In fact, the magic had protected everything around them, making a bubble around the prototype to contain the explosion. She kicked the base. It shouldn't have exploded like that. Quick came all the way into the barn, but he kept his distance. Substations don't usually go boom. She rolled her eyes and folded her arms. We've already established that this was an unusual situation. What? You think I did this? He poked his finger into his chest. Lux pressed her lips together to hold back the resounding yes that threatened to burst forth. We both did. A thrill went up her back as she remembered their kiss. It was heated and strong and yet soft and gentle, everything she'd imagined it to be and so much more. 
but it shouldn't have gone into overload. Someone else must be kissing, holy holly. She yanked her phone out of her back pocket. The screen was cracked from when Quick rolled on top of her. He was solid and strong, and she'd had a difficult time thinking for a minute there. She pressed the talkie button. Stella. What? Stella's reply was garbled. Are you with Axel? I'm with two guys right now. Ben and Jerry. Quick chuckled. Lux shot him a look. I've got a situation here and I need to know if you're, you know. There was a pause. It lasted long enough that Lux checked to make sure her phone hadn't died. Stella finally came back on. We broke up. Lux's arms went numb. What do you mean, you broke up? How can you break up? It's May Stella. 217 days till Christmas. I know, all right. I can feel the matrimonial pressure. I don't need you piling it on. Lux tapped her phone against her forehead. Seven months may seem like forever to a child waiting for Christmas, but in the adult world, seven months could disappear faster than you could say Black Friday sale. Seven months was not enough time to find true love. Well, maybe for Stella. She tended to fall in love a lot. But that was just it. Stella went through a lot guys, but none of them stuck. If she couldn't make the leap to marriage before Christmas Day, that would be the end of everything. And if Lux didn't get this machine done in time, they'd be carving toys by hand. I'm coming home. Save some peppermint ice cream for me. Over and out. The phone beeped and they were no longer connected. Quick perked up and then made a face. He tucked his hands into his pockets. His coat had a tear down the side and the stuffing poked out. The fabric must have snagged when he rolled over to protect her. Lux's mouth went dry and her hands became clammy. She fisted and flexed her fingers, not used to the sensations he created in her body. Kringles maintained steady temperatures no matter their surroundings. She hadn't ever been truly hot before Quick took her into his arms. The mini-sub coughed as if trying to restart. She needed to keep her thoughts in line, no more zingy kiss thoughts or dazzling waltzes in the barn. She and Quick stared at the machine, waiting to see if it would go off again. You're awfully quiet, she finally said. With his barrage of questions before, she'd expected him to hound her about this. When the mini-sub settled, she reached down and lifted one edge of the platform onto the sleigh's floor and then went around to push it all the way into the sleigh. I'm still trying to figure out what happened. Quick's eyes roved the barn as if he wondered if it were real. She couldn't blame him. The afternoon felt like a dream for her too. You're leaving. His arms were still folded and his eyes hooded. She nodded, her throat feeling tight. She didn't want to go. That kiss was truly magical, proving that she had fallen in love with Quick. Walking to the front of the sleigh, she took Dunder's harness and guided him around so he faced the door. Quick opened them wide to give the sleigh room enough to exit. If she'd been looking for a clue that he wanted her to stay, that wasn't it. In fact, opening the barn doors was a clear sign that he wanted her to go. Lux's chest tightened. The whole valley shook as a military plane flew low. Dunder growled. He hated military planes. They liked to chase reindeer and had wicked tailwinds. Quick swore, and not a Christmas swear either. Lux's eyebrows shot up. He turned fast, his movements precise, and ushered her into the sleigh. That explosion must have registered on a satellite. He climbed in next to her and pointed to the doors. Head to my house. Now. She snatched up the reins, his steely command startling her into action. It shouldn't have registered anywhere. Not even as a power surge. She thought about it. 
Christmas magic was part electrical, it had to spark in the machine the way it had. Maybe. He cursed again and jumped out of the sleigh, pausing only to take her by the shoulders and insist, don't leave without me. I know where we'll be safe. Kay, she managed to squeak out. Safe. Meaning they were currently in danger and would be out of said danger soon. He ran through the door and was back in seconds with a survival pack and a plastic tote. With the prototype at their feet, the sleigh was getting crowded. The plane came back. Quick pushed her head down to hide her face from view. After the noise receded, she glared. What are you doing? You blew my cover, literally. He kicked the prototype. Head that direction. He pointed up into the hills, away from Boulder Canyon. There's a cave up there. It's my fallback. She snapped the reins and Dunder was happy to get moving. What cover? I'm supposed to be off the grid. Your boom put a big X on my back. America is after you. America, Russia, China, he continued to list other countries who wanted nuclear programs. Lux focused on following his directions to the ice cave. Dunder struggled over an icy spot, grunting and glaring in turns. We're trying to avoid the planes, she reminded him. Quick gave her a sidelong glance when she talked to the reindeer, but he didn't comment. It's just up ahead. If we can get there before nightfall, then we should be safe. They'll have a harder time tracking us in the dark. I need to check in with my family. That's a negative. They'll be looking for any signals, digital, analog, even stereo. She gripped the reins so tight her knuckles went white. What if they find us? Bad things will happen to some really good people. Lux chewed her lip. Her Kringle instincts screamed at her to help quick, but her head was telling her to stay as far away from him as possible. If they blew up the prototype with one kiss, who knew what would happen if she fell for him? Well, fell deeper than she already had. Ignoring that her feelings existed was impossible when the results were right there at her feet. Liking Quick had always been the gamble. From day one she'd been attracted to him. There were a precious few individuals she was comfortable enough to work alongside, and Quick was the easiest of them all. Even easier than Dad. Dad would kill her if she didn't check in tonight. Peanut Brittle. He was expecting a debriefing on the new design. She could leave quick in the cave. Alone. And hope he didn't get caught. Then she could run home, explain the situation, and return for him the next day. But he'd almost frozen once already today. The likelihood of him lasting a full night without her there was slim. Besides, there was a very strong part of her that wanted to protect him. Being caught between a rock and a hard place made her ornery. Lux preferred things cut and dry. Like in science. An experiment worked or it didn't. If it did, you moved forward. If it didn't, you figured out why and fixed it. A black hole just large enough for the sleigh to fit through appeared before them. That's it. Quick pointed. Yeah. It's kind of hard to miss. Quick's jaw tightened. Lux lit the lantern and coerced Dunder through the opening. Once inside, the cave opened up to be the size of the family room at home. Lux took out her phone and shut it off. Her family was going to go nuts. Another plane, or maybe it was the same plane, approached. Lux extinguished the light and they all crouched low in fear. Chapter 21 Something brushed Lux's arm and she gasped. Relax. It's just me. Quick's voice was low and close. I can't relax with you touching me. You're going to cause another explosion. To add weight to her argument, the circuit breakers began to hum. Quick pulled his arm away and the cave quieted. We'll have to stay the night. She gulped. 
Here. Are you afraid of the dark? His voice was low and sultry, implying he knew a few ways to get her to like the dark. She retrieved a stack of red and green glow sticks from her messenger bag and cracked one, spilling red light into the dark. Not at all. She faked a relaxed tone. Reminds me of home. Quick took the offered glow stick. Reminds me of my ex-wife. Luck stumbled out of the sleigh. Why you were married? He nodded. He cracked the glow stick, and green light shot out. His face was guarded once again, the same look he had when he did the opposite of what she asked and hauled her out of the barn. Lux wondered if he loved his ex. She pressed her palm to her forehead. If he did love her, then why did he kiss Lux? Dunder stamped his powerful hoof, making Lux's feet tingle. She put her hand in her bag and wished for straw, which she used to make a bed for Dunder. They couldn't fly out of here with that plane going back and forth. They'd need to wait out the initial air support. Do you have kids? She forced herself to ask. Quick didn't pause in his perusal of the items in his survival pack. One. He's five. Lux unhitched Dunder and led him to his side of the cave. Thanks, boy. You did good tonight. Dunder leaned into her scratches and his jaw dropped open. She chuckled and placed a bowl of oats on the ground. Now that she didn't have the excuse of taking care of the reindeer, her hands were heavy and awkward. Five's acute age. Quick's shoulders dropped. I, I haven't seen him since he was a baby. That saddened Lux. She couldn't imagine growing up without her father. He was so kind and had a listening ear. When no one else cared about what was on her microscope slide, Dad did. Quick put his hand over hers, the movement soft and tender. Tell me who you are, please. She took a deep breath. I'm Lux Kringle, Santa's second-born daughter. Excuse me. He leaned closer as if he hadn't heard right. She offered a quick smile, hoping to reassure him. I'm the daughter of Santa Claus. Aha. Uh -huh. He nodded once. And that? He pointed to the blown substation prototype. We need a way to take large amounts of Christmas magic and reduce it to an electrical flow that will power our toy-making machines, the kitchens, and candy rooms, everything, really. She pulled the prototype out of the sleigh to make room for them to sleep, preferring to work instead of check Quick's face for disbelief. She'd never told anyone who she really was. A couple of her sisters had and things worked out fine, but Lux was already the odd duck without adding the whole Santa's daughter thing to the list. Quick removed his hand as if she were sparking again. Well, she didn't spark. They sp, never mind. I knew it. I'm going nuts. He paced for a minute. They said it could happen. Long periods without human interaction do strange things to a person's head. I thought I was tougher than that, that I would outlast the solitude. But, he waved his hand in her direction. Clearly I was over-exaggerating my mental stability. He laughed. Like I could make up a woman this pretty who drove a reindeer attached to a sleigh. I'm crazy. He went back to the sleigh and took a seat, running his rough hands over the green velvet. This even feels real. Instead of trying to convince him Lux decided to let the magic speak for itself. She opened the flap to her messenger bag and began pulling out pillows and blankets and sheets and quilts. Finally, she handed him a green toothbrush with a picture of the Grinch dressed as Santa. She rolled her eyes. She'd only asked for a green toothbrush. Christmas magic had a sense of humor. That's a neat trick. I once saw a magician pull a hundred handkerchiefs out of his sleeve. You don't believe me. It wasn't a question. Lux could tell by the hollow look in Quick's eyes that he was having a breakdown. 
She huffed and began making her bed on one side of the sleigh. He could have the other to himself, the big old Scrooge. Are you upset? he asked, clearly confused. Yes. Why? For a smart guy, you're being dumb. He lowered his brow before throwing himself into the task of making his bed and ignoring her. Fine. He thought she was a figment of his imagination anyway. Let him believe what he wanted. She climbed into her makeshift bed and flipped onto her side with her back to quick. Maybe her dad and Ginger could get used to it, but nothing hurt more than quick not believing in her. That one stung. She sniffed. One giant Hershey's kiss-sized tear landed on her pillow. She squeezed her eyes shut and held her breath, hoping to stem the flow of tears. Maybe it didn't cut them to the core because they weren't in love with the unbelievers. Maybe the more she opened her heart to Quick, the more pain he could cause. She snuggled deeper into the blankets. Kringles could stay awake for over 24 hours, but she was pushing 48. She wouldn't sleep long. She yawned. Someone needed to stay alert in case the planes came back or they were discovered. With a deep breath, she relaxed into the sleigh bed and drifted off to sleep. Chapter 22 Quick held still, waiting for Lux's breathing to even out. He couldn't be sure, but he thought she might have cried. The idea that he made her cry was like an ice pick to the chest. He had no desire to hurt her. He just freaked out, sort of. She'd thrown him off, Santa's daughter. Who said something like that? Then again, who said things like son of a Grinch or Nutcracker or Christmas swear in April? Only Lux. He shifted positions, embarrassed by his outburst. Truly, of all the horrible situations he'd conjured up over the past two months, this one wasn't even a blip on the screen. If he wasn't crazy, then she was. And he could almost believe that if he hadn't met her family. The whole Santa wedding. Maybe she was part of some weird joy-spreading Saint Nick cult. He rolled, taking the blanket with him. If he could just get the chill out of his bones, he would be able to think clearly. The sleigh was warm, but Lux was warmer. He scooted closer as a plane went overhead. They weren't letting up in their search. Neither would he. If he'd seen an energy release like that show up on a report, he'd swayed the area with surveillance. The military was probably assembling their elite crew of soldiers now. They were in transit. It was only a matter of time before he and Lux were caught. The planes were scanning for heat signatures. The cave should be deep enough to hide them for now. Once the cave was discovered, they'd be trapped. He rolled so he could see Lux. She'd turned toward him in her sleep. Her red hair spilled over the pillow. Upon close inspection, her eyelashes were a dark brown, her skin soft and inviting. He reached out to run his fingers over her cheek and she leaned into his touch, humming softly. She'd said the substation was for Christmas magic. Ridiculous. You couldn't quantify magic. Magic didn't exist. He leaned close enough to smell Lux's minty cocoa scent. She was intoxicating. If there was magic, it was in her. He closed his eyes and leaned in to press a kiss to her forehead. He'd wake her up and tell her he was sorry for whatever he'd done and they could talk about all this. A soft growl reverberated in his ears, and he opened his eyes to find Dunder hovering over Lux, glaring. His antlers looked especially menacing from underneath. Dunder may be a grandpa soon, but he had all the fire of an overprotective father burning in his eyes. Quick removed his hand from Lux's cheek and shifted away. See, I'm moving, he said to the creature. Lux shifted and moaned. Dunder snorted right in his face, his breath hot and oaty. Quick put both hands in the air. Got it, he told the guard reindeer while scooting back to his side of the sleigh. His apology would have to wait until Lux woke up on her own. And not a minute more. Chapter 23 May 22nd 
216 days until Christmas Eve. The sky didn't lighten, but Lux awoke as if it were 7 a.m. She checked her watch, cringing at the cracked screen. Not even the high-tech coating had been enough to withstand the pressure of her and Quick's bodies. The screen lit, momentarily blinding her. It was 7 a.m. She blinked, staring at the inky black ceiling, trying to reorient herself. Dunder lay on her side of the sleigh, his head resting on his front legs as if he'd watched her sleep. Creepy reindeer. Trying not to wake quick, she shoved her blankets back into her bag, not bothering to fold them, and braided her hair. She turned to find Quick sitting up and rubbing the sleep out of his eyes. Morning, sleeping beauty, she teased. His longer hair stood up in odd places, and his beard was a fluffy mess. He looked like a wolf man, all dangerous and hot. Suddenly wishing Frost hadn't convinced her to read that sweet werewolf romance last Halloween, she yanked his blanket off and stuffed it into her bag, too. He shivered, and she felt bad for making him cold. Until she remembered he was an unbeliever. Then she didn't feel bad at all. She would personally write his name on the naughty list when she got home. That would show him. The sooner she got home, the better. They were probably in fits trying to find her as it was. Everyone wanted to find her, the U.S. government, her father. Peanut butter fudge. I have to get back to my family. They're counting on me. He scrubbed his face and ran his fingers through his hair, taming it just enough that visions of wolves faded. Lux, about last night, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to. She clenched and unclenched her hands. My job isn't to make you believe. Her words rang true in her own ears even as they echoed off the cave walls. Making someone believe isn't an option. She dropped her gaze to the sleigh floor. That's why it hurts so bad, I guess. You chose not to believe in me. What do you want me to say? I'm a man of science. Her hands fell to her sides, her fingers splayed open. Hello. Scientist right here. He tipped his head to the side. I didn't mean that you aren't one. Sure sounded like it. She grabbed the sheet he was lying on and yanked, sending him rolling out of the sleigh. He yelped and got to his feet, hugging his arms close. His breath rose around him in a white cloud. Without the sleigh for heat, he'd be as cold as he was when she picked him up yesterday. Was that only yesterday? Sleeping meshed with the clock in his head. Are you going to be okay? You're not going to turn into an iceman, are you? Icemen were not attractive. Something flew overhead. It had a lower tone and didn't make the impact that the last plane had made. Military drones, Quick informed her. They're taking photos, looking for tracks. Our tracks go right into this cave. Lux held the sheet close to her body. You like deals, let's make a deal. Quick hopped back into the sleigh. I will help you build the substation for your. He paused as if he couldn't believe he was about to say the words. Toy factory, and you let me lie low in North Pole. It's at the North Pole. Potato, potato. He still didn't get it. Sounds like a great deal, but I can't make that happen. Maybe I could fly you to Mexico to stay with my grandparents. Yeah, cause no one ever runs off to Mexico to escape imprisonment. She looked him up and down, shrinking away. When you say it like that, I'm a little worried that I shared a sleigh with you last night. He chuckled. Come on, take me to the North Pole. She noticed the shift in his attempt from bargaining to charming. Man, he was good at all this flirting stuff. Compared to him, she was a preschooler. That didn't change her answer. Only Kringles allowed. It's one of the rules of Christmas magic. Isn't Joseph with Ginger? They're married, so technically he is part of the family. 
Layla, too. Christmas magic isn't very picky about who it lets into the family. Dunder snorted awake. His huffing was overdrawn and menacing. He swung his large head back and forth between her and Quick. She petted his muzzle and pulled a bowl of grain out of her bag for him. He grunted once at Quick before burying his nose in the meal. His behavior was off character for a reindeer, even an older one. We'll get home soon, she promised him. I don't think he likes you very much, she whispered to Quick. I got that feeling too. Quick rubbed his palms together. So we need to get married, then. Yule. Lux grabbed the sled. You can't be serious. What's the problem? There are so many. Biggest problem first. Okay, if you and I get married, the whole North Pole would boom. She mimed an explosion. We blew up the mini sub with a kiss. Her cheeks warmed. They kept doing that when she was around quick. So we won't kiss. He said it so naturally, as if not kissing her would be the easiest thing in the world. She threw her bag on the seat. That sounds like a fun marriage. He had to have felt the magic yesterday. Unless it only came from her. Perhaps it wasn't necessary for the other half of the couple to love the Kringle in return. Unrequited love was still love, wasn't it? What happens if you don't get the substation built before Christmas? He stepped closer. Well, assuming Stella can find another boyfriend, turn him into a fiancé, and then marry him before Christmas Eve, we'll overload the system and send the whole factory into the Dark Ages. We'll lose years of work on the list, and forget making electronic toys. She twirled her braid. Of course, now that Stella and Axel broke up, the likelihood of any of us getting married this year flew off like a teenaged reindeer. One of you has to get married this year. Quick steepled his fingers. One per year, or the magic fades and dies. Stella was our best shot. She's been dating this guy since before last Christmas, so we put all our candy canes in her basket. None of the rest of us were even trying. This is perfect. Quick scooped up her hands and held them close to his chest. The glint in his eyes said he'd already won this argument, but Lux wasn't ready to concede. You can get married and save Christmas, and I will help you build the substation. But... Lux, can you think of another way? I'm open for suggestions here. He brushed his thumb over her knuckles, sending thrills over her skin. She extracted her hands. I need to think. Stomping to the edge of the cave, she took a deep breath of the crisp air. Out of all her sisters, she was the one most likely to elope. The other Kringle women wanted fancy dresses and delighted in pomp and circumstance. Lux preferred the background. She liked being a wallflower. There was very little pressure outside the spotlight. But that didn't mean she hadn't dreamed of her wedding. Instead of focusing on the flower arrangements and the number of guests, she'd always focused on the groom. In all her little girl playtimes and her teenaged fantasies, her husband had loved her. And they'd kissed. Kissed good. Kissed lots, mistletoe or no. She wasn't a child anymore. She was a Kringle and she had a responsibility to her family and to children all over the world to make sure they woke up on Christmas morning to find gifts from Santa. What was her heart aching to be loved, compared to all their Christmas hopes and dreams? She turned quickly, before she could change her mind. Okay. Okay. Quick dropped his feet off the velvet chair and stood where he'd taken up an I-don't-care-how-this-turns-out posture. Yes. She nodded once. Let's get married. Good. Quick wasn't as enthusiastic as a man who just proposed should be, but then they'd just become engaged, so that might have been something of a shock. He scrambled to pick up the cave and put the prototype back in the sleigh. Lux approached Dunder with the harness. 
The bells jingled, reminding her of home. She was suddenly homesick, wishing her sisters were here to help her navigate these dangerous winds. Dunder slammed his powerful hind leg to the ground, shaking the entire cave. He shook his head and backed away. Lux's shoulders dropped, and she reached out to scratch his neck. I'm sorry you don't approve, but I've got to do this, Christmas needs me. She scratched a little harder. He leaned into her hand, and she slipped the harness over his muzzle. If it makes you feel any better, you're not the only one who is going to be upset about this. He shook his head again. You can say, I told you so, later. Right now, you need to get us back to Clearview. She ran the reins through the loop and climbed aboard the sleigh. Besides the pile of straw on the far side of the cave, there was no sign that they'd been there. Somehow, she doubted Quick would be able to leave her life as untouched. With a sense of hopeful trepidation, she slapped the reins, and they were off to swim in uncharted waters. Chapter 24 Quick grabbed the side of the sleigh as the crazy old reindeer took them straight down the side of a mountain instead of following the snowmobile trail that zigzagged at a reasonable descent. He proceeded to hit every rock and pound through gullies as if he were aiming for them. After the way Dunder looked at him last night Quick wouldn't put it past him. If you're Santa's daughter, shouldn't your reindeer fly? Lux flipped her braid over her shoulder. She wore her cloak, the emerald green doing amazing things with the color of her eyes. With the drones and planes flying low, we're better off staying on the ground. They hit another gully and he flew off the seat. That's debatable. Trust me, this is much better than flying. Her jaw flexed as she pulled hard to the right, her arms tightening, her feet pushing against the brace, and her hair flying out behind her. Man, she's gorgeous. They bounced over a river. And crazy. Convincing her to marry him was a calculated risk. Sure, he was getting a wife who thought she was Santa's daughter and believed in flying reindeer. That was a lot to take on. Although, he had to admit, not as much to take on as his first wife. Now, she had been a handful and a half with her wild mood swings, anxiety of their social standing, and constant pressure for him to rise in the ranks and be a general like her daddy. He hadn't been half as attracted to his ex as he was to Lux. And that kiss that felt like the whole world exploded, that was, incredible. Then again, a machine had exploded, so maybe it was the electricity in the air that made him tingle all over and not the kiss. He hadn't thought of that before. Any other time he'd work for a second opportunity to test his new theory, purely for the sake of science, of course, but he'd promised Lux he wasn't going to kiss her, so that left him without recourse. He wished he'd never made that promise. The closer they got to town, the easier the roads. The sky was lighter, and warm sunlight spilled over their shoulders, giving the scene a sense of rightness. Quick may have calculated the risk, but he hadn't calculated the feelings that stirred inside of him at the knowledge that this woman would be his wife. He didn't take that lightly, no matter what his clandestine proposal may have portrayed. His attraction to Lux was strong, he admired her intelligence, and he enjoyed her company. Marriages based on much less had survived the test of time, this could too. They pulled up to the church, right next to another sleigh where Stella was unloading baskets full of cookies. Schnitzel. Lux cursed under her breath. Quick leaned over and whispered in her ear. No Christmas cursing. Lux shivered. He took much too much satisfaction seeing her affected by his nearness. Stella waved. Lux! We've been searching all over for you. What are you doing here? Her eyes jumped back and forth between the two of them. Lux twisted the reins around her hands. We, um, we're, well. Quick lifted his chest. If Lux believed she was Santa's daughter, her sister either believed the same thing or knew she was nuts, so announcing their plans would be tame in comparison to all that crazy. We're getting married. You're what? Stella dropped the basket in her arms, and cookies crumbled all over the snow. Their scent filled the air, 
reminding Quick of putting cookies out for Santa. He tried to shake off the memory of frosting sugar cookies with his mom and sister. Emily liked to make red snowmen, and he'd made a chocolate snowflake. Stella linked her arm through Lux's elbow and hauled her off. Excuse us, please, she called over her shoulder as they hurried out of earshot. Don't be long. He began to pace behind the sleigh, far away from Dunder. He didn't have a backup plan. Following Lux home to her Christmas cult family was his only option. If this didn't work out, he was a dead man. Chapter 25 Lux, what in the bells is going on? Lux yanked her arm free from Stella's grip. Stella had dragged her halfway to the tea house, where donuts were a dollar. The sun was in earnest now, turning patches of snow into puddles. Main Street was sad, the colors dimmed by the low light and the street full of mud. No one wandered from the diner to the trading post, and the mayor's wife wasn't out looking for volunteers for her latest project. Dad's tinsel is twisted, he's been out looking for you. Mom's called the four corners of the earth, and Ginger is pacing the floor. Robin has made one welcome home meal per hour, and Frost is starting a missing sister campaign with your picture. But. Your phone is off, nitwit. Stella shoved Lux's shoulder. Lux glanced back at Quick. You have to buy me ten minutes. This shouldn't take long. Stella shoved her shoulder. Are you seriously getting married? Stella glanced at Lux's left hand. Lux cupped her left hand with her right. It's not like that. I need him to help me build the substation, and he can't go to the North Pole unless we're married. And since you and Axel broke up, Stella's lips clamped together and then went slack. I tried, he. No, Lux waved her hands to ward off an explanation. It's okay. This works out well for everybody. But the whole point of us getting married is to provide true love to feed the magic. If you guys aren't in love, then this is pointless. You don't even know if the magic will let him in. It's going to work. How do you know? Because I love him. Lux shook Stella's arm. He doesn't have to love me back to feed the magic. My love is enough. Stella yanked her in for a hug. Is it enough for you, though? Lux leaned into her sister. A kissless marriage wasn't exciting nor thrilling, but there would be good things, there had to be. I can't let Christmas, the family, or the children down. Lux's throat tightened again. She let Stella go. Let's get this over with. Stella linked their arms together. You should try to smile. It's your wedding day. Lux laughed, though she felt more like crying. She pulled Stella back toward the church. I'll smile when the substation is running and we've averted disaster. Talk about a bridezilla, Stella teased. That brought a smile to Lux's face. Sisters were awesome. She headed back to her intended and found that looking him in the eye was difficult at best. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. Quick rubbed his palms on his pants. Just what every bride wants to hear. Stella glared daggers. I didn't mean. I'm a little nervous. Quick threaded his fingers together and laid his hands on the back of his head. What's the plan? Stella is going to buy us a few minutes' time to get back home. I wouldn't like to be in your shoes. Stella gathered up the basket and cookies that weren't ruined. I'm going to text Robin that I found you and I'm bringing you home. Good idea. Lux's stomach ached at the thought that she'd caused her parents worry. She'd never done that before. It's going to be okay. Quick touched her elbow and then jerked it back when the mini-sub hummed. Lux stared at the contraption. I certainly hope so. She twisted her fingers together. This is either the smartest thing I've ever done or the dumbest. How will you know which it is? 
She glanced at Quick out of the corner of her eye. Um, our palace will explode. No pressure, then, he quipped. He waved for her to go first up the steps. Luck set her jaw in determination and took the first step toward life as a married woman. Chapter 26 Sweat trickled down Quick's back. For the first time since he'd met her Lux's skin was cold, and he had a feeling he'd caused the change. He didn't like that, not one bit. A husband, even one as unconventional as he was, should bring joy into his bride's life. He'd have to work on that when assassins weren't hot on their tail. Thankfully, they hadn't seen anyone carrying a rifle, yet. If Pastor Willis didn't get the vows going, they'd be sitting ducks. He held both Lux's hands in his while Pastor Willis spoke about sickness and health, better and worse. With those words, the marriage aspect of his plan got real, like deep down in his heart real. He stared at Lux, her long and luxurious red hair glistening with golden highlights, like tinsel woven into the strands. Her spectacular green eyes were guarded and hard to catch. She'd hardly looked at him after talking to Stella. No, her avoidance went back to the moment he'd suggested they marry. No, it went back to the night before, when he'd mocked her belief that she was Santa's daughter. There wasn't much he could do about that one. Feeding into delusions wasn't a good idea. He just wouldn't talk about it. He brushed his thumbs over the back of her hands, eliciting a small gasp. Her eyes rose ever so slowly to meet his, and he poured sincerity into his gaze, praying she would feel just a hint of what he felt in this moment. That there was more to this ceremony than a bargain. That he did care for and about her. That he wanted to help in whatever way she needed. He wished things were different. Wished they could have met at a time when he was free from the threats that hung over him, free from worry, free to just hold her as his wife. You may now kiss the bride. Pastor Willis grinned. Lux's brown lashes brushed her dusted cheeks. Quick had promised not to kiss her. He now believed that was the stupidest decision in his thirty-two years. He cupped her cheek, leaned down, and pressed his lips to her soft skin. The words I love you, wife caught on his tongue. He closed his eyes and hugged her tight, soaking in the warmth only Lux could provide and breathing her minty cocoa scent. Well, that was, interesting. Stella pulled Lux out of Quick's arms and hugged her as well. Willis shook Quick's hand. I have to say, I didn't think I'd be marrying this one off any time soon. He slapped Quick on the back. Quick forced a chuckle. Congratulations, you too. Willis shook Lux's hand and then moved to Stella. It was wonderful of you to come. I hope we see a lot more of you in the future. Stella stared. I, I came at Easter. I noticed. He winked. Quick's jaw dropped open. Pastors don't wink. At least, not the pastors he'd grown up with. Willis wished them all a good day and headed back to his office. Are pastors supposed to wink? Stella asked, still staring at the closed door. Lux and Quick exchanged a look and lifted their shoulders in unison. Quick's cheeks burned, they'd been married less than five minutes, and they were already reading one another's thoughts. Stella. Lux touched her arm to get her attention. We've got to get going. Quick needs to be out of town ASAP. Quick nodded. They will have been through my house by now. They might already be at the cave. Lux nodded. Be careful when you fly out. Military planes are all over the place. Stella's eyebrows disappeared beneath her heavy bangs. You have a lot of explaining to do. Lux nodded. I'll catch you up at home. Let's go. Quick put his hand on Lux's lower back to escort her out of the building. He'd done the same thing at his cabin without thinking much about the action. It was amazing how a few words spoken by a man of God could transform even the slightest touch. Heat ran up his fingers, his arm, and across his chest. A wonderful, warm, inviting heat. As if that was where he was supposed to be, and his body knew it, his mind was just slow to catch on. 
he didn't like feeling slow, and so, when they went through the door, he didn't touch her again. For all he knew, the mini-sub was humming away and ready to add another energy pulse that would give away their position. As he headed to the sleigh, he realized he didn't feel cold. Pausing mid-step, he bent down and put his palm on a pile of snow. It was scratchy, the tiny crystals catching his hand, but there wasn't a chill. He grinned, picking up a handful and making a ball. His skin didn't change colors, his hands didn't burn, and the snow didn't melt into a puddle. Ha, he laughed. Are you coming? Lux called from the sleigh. She had the reins in her bare hands. If this was how she felt all the time, he could understand why she smiled easily. His steps slowed, she had smiled easily when they first met. Now she wore a slight frown as she watched Stella's sleigh head east. He stepped into the sleigh, riding on a high he'd never known. He had to grab the side of the sleigh as he tamped down the urge to grab Lux, dip her low, and give her a real first kiss as husband and wife. She eyed him warily. Why are you so happy? We just got married. He chuckled, lifting his hands in front of his face. My skin's tingling. I feel like I've been dropped into a bowl of Christmas punch. She pressed her lips together as she slapped the reins and steered Dunder south. You'll get used to it. He watched her, wondering why she was so serious when the world was so beautiful, she was beautiful. She took them out of town, over one mountain, and into a clearing in no time at all. Dunder chewed up the landscape with his powerful legs. Trees whooshed by. Please keep your hands and arms inside the sleigh at all times, Quick joked. Lux rolled her eyes. What is with you? I don't know. I feel drunk, but I don't drink. She considered him. It must be the magic quick. You're becoming part of it. Christmas magic? She nodded. You mean I'm becoming jolly? He snickered. That was funny. You should probably sit down. You should probably call me Matthew. She chewed her bottom lip but didn't respond. He lounged in the velvet-lined seat and threw his arm over the back. He could hear the wind but only felt a light, pleasant breeze. Hold on. Lux called over her shoulder. She lifted the reins high and gave them a mighty slap. On, Dunder. With a powerful leap, Dunder left the ground, taking the sleigh with him. Quick swore and pressed himself into the seat. Lux glared at him. They rose high enough to clear the mountaintops and leveled off. In the distance, a plane dropped behind the horizon. I don't think they saw us, Quick said. We're in the clear. I don't see Stella, though. She's probably halfway home by now. Her cheeks paled and her overall color tinted green. Are you okay? I hate flying. Do you want me to? He reached for the reins. Dunder bellowed and turned right and then left and then spun in a full circle, sending Quick back to his seat. Dunder! Lux yelled. You're killing me. He straightened out, snorting loud and long. I'm driving, okay? Jeez! Chill. Quick laughed. It's not funny. Lux's hand went to her stomach. You just told a flying reindeer to chill. Quick bent over, laughing. Laugh it up, jolly man. We're in for a bumpy landing. If Dunder doesn't let you drive, you can bet our reception at home isn't going to be smooth. She muttered something about her dad. That sobered Quick, a little. I should have talked to your dad before we got married. He'd seen Lux's father at the wedding pageant for Ginger and Joseph last Christmas. He was a large, imposing man, but he looked reasonable enough. We'll explain the situation, and I'm sure I can win him over. Dunder made a strange noise in his throat. What's that? Quick asked. He's laughing at you. Quick's heart sank. Lux pulled hard to the right and they circled down, down, down toward the ice and snow. Welcome home, she said as they flew into a small opening in the ice. Chapter 27
Luck set the reins in the loop and stepped out of the sleigh. The stables were in a flutter. Reindeer stomped their hooves and butted their antlers against the beams, making the stables shake. Kennedy, who was being led to his stall by Selora, kicked his back legs like a bucking bronco. Selora expertly dodged his antlers as she rubbed his nose and spoke in low tones. Stella was nowhere to be seen. She couldn't have had that much lead time on them if her reindeer was just unharnessed. Quick, no Matthew stared at everything, his mouth hanging open. He slowly got to his feet. It's real, he whispered. Lux watched him take everything in. This shouldn't have been a surprise, she shouldn't have married a man who was surprised to see a stable full of flying reindeer. When Ginger brought Joseph home, he was overwhelmed but not because it all existed, her family could be a lot to take in. She cringed. Matthew had a big dose of Kringle coming his way in a short amount of time. Perhaps she should have warned him, but a part of her, the part that should be on the naughty list, believed he deserved what was coming after the way he'd not believed in her. Of course it's real. Selora stomped up to the sleigh and shooed Matthew out. Unbeliever, she muttered under her breath as she began brushing the velvet seat as if it were full of crumbs. Bumble hurried forward, skinning his tongue and sniffing intermittently. The elf was Dad's best elf friend, and he didn't look at all happy. You've done it now, Miss Lux. He picked up her left hand and huffed. Not even a ring. T.S.K., T.S.K. Quick ran his hand through his hair and turned in a circle. They're angry elves. Lux put her hands on her hips. You bring out the best in all of us. Sarcasm does not become you, my dear, quick, Matthew, quipped. Calling him by his first name was going to take some getting used to. You're much too beautiful when you smile. You should smile all day, every day. Lux's eyebrows climbed her forehead. Matthew had been Christmas punch drunk since the ceremony. She'd have to ask Joseph how long that lasted. Her brother-in-law had seemed normal when he and Ginger came back from their honeymoon. He was happier than he'd been alone in his woodshop in Alaska, but she'd attributed that to him having Ginger in his life. Maybe there was more to his good mood than love. Because Quick's compliment wasn't from love. He didn't love her, not like she loved him. If he did, he wouldn't have promised not to kiss her. Instead of feeling twitterpated that her new husband called her pretty, she was angry. His words mocked her. Don't call me that. Lux took her bag from Selora and headed for the door. She needed to find her family and set the record straight. Rumors could grow like icicles up here. She was a couple feet from the door when it burst open, her dad filling the whole frame. Seriously, he looked much bigger. He could shrink to get down chimneys, but she'd never seen him grow. Wow! That would be an interesting study. She could see how small he could get and contrast that with how big. You! He pointed directly at Quick. His face was as red as his flannel shirt. Lux's eyes widened. Angry Santa was not to be trifled with. Quick stood his ground, strong and straight back like a soldier, with his arms stiff at his side and a half-smile spread across his face. Lux wanted to warn him to tread carefully, but there was no time before Dad was in his face. You're on my list, Dad growled. Quick snorted a laugh like he just couldn't hold it in. I'm on the naughty list. No, Dad got even closer. You're on my list. Dad's chest expanded, overshadowing his cookie jar belly and making him bigger than the abominable snowman. The rest of the family piled through the door at a run. They stopped short when they saw Dad towering over Matthew. Mom's hand went to her mouth. Frost ducked behind Stella. Robin narrowed her eyes, and Ginger said, Whoa. Remind me never to tick you off. 
Joseph turned his niece, Layla, around and shoved her ahead of him as he left. Dad! Ginger snapped. Dad whipped around in time to see Layla leaving. He let out a deep breath and his face returned to its natural color. He might have shrunk a little, too, although he managed to stay the same height as Quick, whom he poked in the chest. You! A deep rumbling interrupted Dad's warning or tirade or lecture. The cave's expanding. Mom stepped to Dad's side. Christmas magic has accepted him. He's part of the family now. Dad poked Quick again, hard. Quick didn't flinch, didn't move. He just stood there and took it, but he took it like a soldier getting dressed down by his superior officer. He didn't shrink into himself, his shoulders were square, proud even. He set his jaw firm. Lux's stomach took a sugarplum fairy leap at the sight. Come on. Frost waved to Lux. I think it's coming from your room. No one wanted to stand there and wait for Dad to say something else or grow or change colors again. Even the reindeer had disappeared behind their stall doors. The family hurried out of the stable, gathering Joseph and Layla as they went. Matthew looked at Lux and then down at her hand as if he wanted to hold her hand as they half jogged through the hall of Santa's past and toward her room. She couldn't do it. Not only would it cause a magical surge, it would hurt her heart to pretend that he loved her while knowing he did not. This way. She waved for him to follow her and kept enough distance between them that his hand wouldn't find the small of her back. The family had opened her purple door with the silver handle and stared in wonder at the sight. Lux breathed a sigh of relief. She loved her purple door. Elbowing her way to the front of the group, she stopped just inside her door and took in the new arrangement. What had once been her small reading nook was now a large living room and kitchen area. Her bookshelves had expanded, leaving empty space for Matthew to fill in with his library. If he had a library. She wondered if he was a reader and what titles would line his shelves. Hers were mostly non-fiction, books on writing code and electrical systems, and she stored all the manuals for the toy machines here. There was a new bathroom just off the living room. The floor was white tile with a fluffy white rug against the pedestal sink. The walls were white with a row of glass tiles and a rainbow of blues and greens behind and surrounding the mirror. There was a tub and shower with a turquoise shower curtain that matched the tiles. She instantly liked it and turned to see what Matthew thought. He was staring at the two open doors on the other side of the room. The one on the right opened into her bedroom. Everything was just as she'd left it, including the unmade bed. The purple coverlet was in a lump in the middle of the bed because she'd kicked it to the floor in her sleep and then tossed it aside while looking for her shoes. Her Captain America poster hung over the headboard. She wished she'd had warning to hide her Star Wars and Marvel collectibles. It seemed silly for a married woman to have toys in her room. The door on the left was also open, revealing another bedroom that looked like the inside of Quick's cabin. He had the large bed with the plastic totes underneath, the couch, and the minimalist shelves. Lux's eyes bounced back and forth between the two rooms. She hadn't thought past the wedding and certainly hadn't thought about the wedding night. She pressed her fingers to her cheeks. This is what Stella must feel like when I track her love life with the energy app. She wanted to burrow under the bed and not come out until December, put a do not open until Christmas sticker on her door, and call it good. Dad put his fists on his hips, a satisfied look on his face. He'd gone back to normal size, apparently pleased with the sleeping arrangements. Mom smacked his arm. Did you do this? I wish I knew how. Dad kissed her temple. His eyes crinkled at the corners. If Kringles could lie, she'd suspect him of covering his tracks. Her sisters all exchanged looks of wonder and wariness. Joseph tugged on Ginger's and Layla's hands. 
Come on, we've got schoolwork and Christmas preparation waiting. Layla pulled her hand away and trotted over to Matthew. Lux's favorite niece wore a pair of leggings with puppies on them and a t-shirt trimmed with lace. Her long hair had been crimped with overnight braids, and her eyes shone. Here, this is for you. She handed Matthew a folded piece of paper before skipping back to her dad. Matthew's smile was warm, and his soulful brown eyes softened. Thank you. He lifted the paper in a wave as they left. Robin linked arms with Frost and Stella. Well, as exciting as this is, we're going to fly to Minnesota for plant a tree day. Stella filled in. No, Robin dragged her along. It's spring break in Florida, Stella offered. Robin shook her head. We're going to finish lunch preparations. There are lots of worried elves that need to eat. Ah. Stella kicked the carpet. Frost waved, staying out of Robin and Stella's argument but going along to help with the meal. Her smile said she was happy for the couple, but her eyes betrayed worry for her sister. Lux tried to reassure them all with a watery smile, but her half-baked attempt was pathetic. With her sisters gone Lux felt the weight of her parents' stares. She turned to face them, pulling the elastic out of her hair and fidgeting with her braid. It's a long story. Dad folded his arms. I'm immortal. Get started. Lux pushed her glasses up her nose. You're not immortal. If you were, then Great Grandpa Earl would still be alive and... Lux, said Mom. Yes. Quit stalling. She sighed. She filled them in on everything that had happened over the last two days, leaving out that part about how much she loved Matthew and that he didn't love her back. That wouldn't win him, or her, any points. Her story painted a picture of a convenient marriage struck from a bargain that benefited them both. When she was done, they all turned to look at her groom. He gestured to Lux. She's right. Well, at least you agree on things. Mom brushed her hands down the front of her emerald green sweater dress. She was normally a jeans woman, but every now and again she pulled out all the stops. Dad grunted. I expect that substation to run exactly how Lux envisioned. That's why I'm here, Matthew agreed. There was an awkward goodbye where Mom hugged Matthew. Dad glared and said, I know when you are sleeping, in a deep, chilly voice. Both she and Matthew shivered. And then they were alone. As husband and wife. In the apartment they shared. Lux shut the door behind her parents and leaned her forehead against it, needed the support. The introductions had gone surprisingly well, all things considered. Matthew was still here and not an ice cube in a snowbank somewhere. Maybe that's why Selora had unhitched the reindeer so quickly, she was removing temptation. As draining as the wedding and arrival had been, what sucked the holly out of her was seeing the two separate bedrooms. With the creation of that second room, Christmas magic confirmed Matthew didn't love her. The confirmation burned as strongly as cinnamon oil in a wrapping paper cut. Chapter 28 Quick wandered down a hallway lined with paintings of Santas. The further back they went, the more severe their looks. Or maybe that was just the way he perceived them, since just about everyone here hated him. The red baroque carpet kept his footfalls to a whisper. Which was exactly what he wanted. This place was full of angry elves and one seriously ticked off father-in-law. The last thing he wanted to do was bump into one of them unexpectedly. They were in an ice cave at the North Pole, the very definition of nowhere. Bodies easily disappeared in nowhere. After everyone had left Lux had walked slowly across the living room and shut her bedroom door behind her without a word. She wasn't the blushing bride he'd imagined her to be right after the ceremony. This Christmas magic was powerful stuff. He still had a slight buzz, but at least his head was clear. Clear enough that he knew he'd disappointed his sweet wife somehow. 
the feeling sat like too much starch in his dress shirt. As much as his bedroom looked like the cabin he'd called home for the last five years, it wasn't home to him. He'd intruded in Lux's personal space and her life. Instead of sticking around, he left the apartment with nowhere to go. Finding Joseph would be a good idea. At least he could get some pointers on how to handle the not-so-jolly elves. At the end of the hall, the hallway split. The right was noisy with machines, voices, and an intercom that he couldn't quite make out. That must be the toy factory. The left was quiet. He could use some quiet, and so he went in that direction. About twenty feet later there was a wooden door with the word, letters. Now this I gotta see. He tested the door and it swung right open, slamming against the wall. Cranberries. Frost exclaimed. She dropped her pen, and it rolled right off the desk and landed at his feet. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? Quick bent down to retrieve her pen. He crossed the green shag carpet that reminded him of Lux's vibrant eyes and placed it on Frost's desk. I'm reading through a couple letters that came in today. Letters? Like letters to Santa. Isn't it a bit early for that? Lux's violet eyes widened. She was the picture of innocence. We get letters all year round. Of course, the number of deliveries increases substantially the closer we get to Christmas, but Santa is never far from some children's minds. He snapped his fingers. Is this where my list report came from? Frost grinned. We keep diligent records on every child and their status on the list. But the list report would come from Ginger's department. Amazing. He breathed the word as he turned to take in the miles of filing cabinets. Every so often, an elf could be seen carrying files. Most everything is digitized these days. She spun her monitor around. But after last year's scare, we've been doing everything in hard copy as well. Scare? Frost nodded. We almost lost Christmas magic. If Lux hadn't figured out how to save us, she shuddered once and then brightened. She's the first Kringle to scientifically study Christmas magic. She's a pioneer in science. Frost glowed with pride. And I thought you couldn't quantify magic. I must have sounded like an idiot. You look like you drank last year's eggnog. Quick chuckled. The Christmas vernacular was going to take some getting used to. I pretty much told Lux I didn't believe in Christmas magic. Frost layered her hands over her heart. That's horrible. He held up a hand. I didn't mean it personal. Doesn't matter to a Kringle. She sniffed delicately. I hope you apologized. That starch guilt feeling was back. I haven't really had the chance. Frost's purple eyes flashed, and he saw a bit of her father in her. Make the chance. Yes, ma'am. Frost smiled, and all traces of anger disappeared. He could appreciate her sticking up for her sister. That's what siblings were supposed to do. If his son ever had a brother, he'd expect them to stick together. Of course, for a brother to appear, that would mean Quick and his ex-wife would have had to stick together, too, and that wasn't an option. There was always the half-brother option. He and Lux, one day, maybe. He stared at the computer screen, lost in thoughts about family dynamics. Are you thinking about your son? asked Frost. How did you? She flourished her hand to indicate the vast number of wooden filing cabinets. The place was like one large card catalogue. Record keeping is my thing. Yes, what do you have on Oliver? She typed and clicked for several seconds. Last Christmas he was four years old. He asked for a telescope and likes pirates. Pirates, he said quietly, contemplating this little person whom he loved but hadn't seen for years. Oliver probably didn't even know his name, it wasn't like he and Amy parted on good terms. Quick doubted she spoke of him to their kid. She thought she'd married a hot army guy who wanted to travel the world, work out on the beach, and flex just for the fun of it. Finding out she'd married a fit geek was disappointing at best and devastating at worst. 
No matter how much he disliked her shallow side, Amy was a caring and invested mother. At least, she had been several years ago. Hopefully she still was. What else can you tell me? He leaned over the desk. Not much. He lives in California. Frost cocked her head. Why don't you know this? Quick tapped his fingers on the desk. I left to protect him. That's, noble. It's selfish. He'll never know why I left. But I couldn't stand the thought that my son would be hurt because of me. I wanted him to grow up as far away from the danger I faced as possible because it gave me peace of mind. Oh. Frost looked away, clearly uncomfortable with his honesty. He was uncomfortable with his honesty. Lux said Kringles didn't lie, but he'd assumed that was a choice they made, not a compulsion. He cleared his throat. Did he get the telescope? Of course. He's a solid nice list kid. That's good to know. You know, you're a part of all this now, of making children's Christmas wishes come true. Kids like your son. He nodded. We're kind of intense about things. He smiled at that. I have a military background, I think I can handle intense. I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to help you. She tipped her head. You haven't opened your heart. To what, Christmas? What am I supposed to do, dress like an elf? Lux nodded seriously. If that would help. But what you really need is a purpose for being here. I have a purpose, I'm building the substation with Lux. Yeah, but why? To convert Christmas magic into electricity. But, why? Quick tamped down his irritation. So the North Pole doesn't shut down. Why? He threw his hands up. I don't know. Frost tapped the computer screen, and a cherub-cheeked boy with light brown hair and brown eyes grinned up at the camera from Santa's lap. Quick stared, knowing it was his son right down to his bones. He would do anything to spare Oliver the disappointment of not getting his deepest Christmas wish. He pointed. That's why. Frost grinned like a teacher whose struggling student aced the spelling test. Yes, it is. Oliver and every other child around the world. She smiled. But mostly him. Quick nodded. I've got work to do. He waved at the door and Frost waved back. She was intense, but in a good way. Lux was like that too. Focused on the mini-sub, braving his doorstep to get the answers she wanted. Marrying him. He swallowed. He'd had all these romantic notions today, telling her she was beautiful, holding her hands, kissing her cheek, and believing there could be more between them, after they built the substation, of course. But she could have married him for his brain. Wasn't that what she'd said? That she'd searched him out for his mind and what he knew, not because she wanted him. They'd made a deal. The deal was his idea, but he hadn't said a word about love and cherishing when he talked her into getting married. He'd bargained his safety and her project. He walked back down the hallway in a daze. The project was most important. Helping Oliver get his Christmas wishes every year without fail was most important. His bleeding heart was secondary to the greater good. He reached the Hall of Santa's past and his feet picked up speed. By the time he threw open the apartment door, he was running. Lux, he yelled. She burst out of her room. What? She looked around as if there were danger. We've got a substation to build. He began rolling up his sleeves. And not a minute to lose. A normal substation could take two full years to build. They had six months if they worked right up to the last minute. Six months to do two years' worth of work. Does Christmas magic work miracles? he asked. She swallowed hard. Depends on your definition of a miracle. Can it slow time? We have six months. Lux lifted one side of her mouth in a lopsided smile. You ever wonder how Santa delivers all the gifts in one night? Really, Santa can slow time? No, Lux frowned. 
but it allows us to stay awake, extends our days in that way. And we work fast. How fast? She tied her shoelaces in less than a second. Quick stared. He'd forgotten what it had been like to work alongside Lux when they rewired the church building. He'd reach for a tool and she'd have already completed the project. Oddly, that gives me hope for Christmas. Lux smiled sadly. Come on, I'll show you the work site. Chapter 29 July 3rd 174 days until Christmas Eve Lux entered the building site. They'd never put anything in the large cavern that had been around as long as Lux could remember. This was a place where magic floated like snowflakes. She and her sisters used to sneak in and have dance parties. Stella even brought a disco ball once. The magic tickled against their arms as they spun in circles. Frost was partial to ballet and often wore a white tutu with silver tights and a matching headband. She was as beautiful as a snow fairy. Robin preferred hip-hop moves. You wouldn't know it to look at her today with her perfectly coiffed hair and pressed aprons, but that girl could shake her booty with the best of them. Lux smiled at the memories, and her thoughts drifted to another dance she'd shared, this one with Matthew in his barn. They truly had transformed his barn into a ballroom through Christmas magic. She'd seen it, felt it, lived it. That was the moment she truly fell in love with him, and the magic had overflowed into everything around them. They were back to dancing, although the steps were much different. Instead of floating around the room in his arms, they stepped lightly to avoid contact. Instead of staring into one another's eyes, they spoke to the floor or just over each other's shoulders. Instead of being caught up in his arms, she wrapped herself in the knowledge that they were doing good for the children of the world. The building site was far away from the living quarters with a twenty-foot wall of ice between it and the toy factory. That meant running pipes and cables through the ice, but the magic was accommodating. She and Matthew would discuss what they needed, and the next morning it would be there. He seemed to have accepted the fact that Christmas magic existed, embraced it, even. But there was a part of him closed off to all of this, to her, and she had no idea how to open that door. Entering the room behind Lux, Dunder pulled the sleigh with the interloper's pressure indicator inside. I finished the center brake disconnect switch, she called to Matthew, who was inside cleaning the dead tank. He came out holding a pair of wire strippers and magnifying glasses that made his intelligent brown eyes look huge. Lux held back a giggle. Six weeks at the North Pole had been good for him. The stress of always looking over his shoulder was gone. The result was a studious man, a quiet man with a quick wit and manly pride. His shoulders had widened. He enjoyed climbing ice with her in the mornings, and the upper body workouts had done good things to his physique. His clothes were in better shape, too, thanks to Frost. She'd picked up on his military background and had him dressed in cargo pants and tight tees with faded flags or the word army printed across the front. She also found him heavy black combat boots that were pretty sick. Dunder huffed, breaking Lux out of her drool zone. The pressure indicator is done. She pointed with her thumb at the gauge nestled on a bed of foam mattresses. They didn't like to have sparks flying near the unfinished substation, so all welding and mitering work had to be done in a separate location. Stella wasn't too happy I pulled elves off the production line to help, but I think the final product was worth an irritated sister. Matthew circled the pressure indicator, inspecting the welds and nodding in satisfaction. His approval shouldn't mean so much to her. And it really didn't. If he told her it was substandard, she'd fix it without getting her feelings hurt. But every nice word from his lips was like a golden toasted marshmallow in her life, only making her want more. Is she still upset? Who's Stella? Lux lowered her brow. She's fine. I promised her I would go with her to the Christmas pageant in Clearview to make up for it. Matthew opened and closed his mouth. 
She held up both hands. Don't worry. I didn't volunteer you to go. He glanced down. I wasn't worried about that. Oh, well, she tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. If you're worried about the magic, it still works if we're not both here. You can stay tucked into the apartment on your own and it won't matter. He turned away and she thought she heard him say, it'll matter to me, but couldn't be sure. He'd probably miss the pageant and services. He'd gone last year, and maybe every year before that, for all she knew. They talked in depth about the substation, but every time they tried to talk about other things, silence stretched out between them like old-fashioned taffy. Frankly, it was getting old. I'm sorry, did you say something? Matthew tugged at his beard. Another improvement, he kept his beard trimmed and his neck shaved now. He was, in a word, scrumptious. If you've got something to say, just get it out there. She flipped an unruly curl off her forehead. I'm so tired of being careful around you. You're tired. He laughed mirthlessly. Let me show you the problem. He stepped closer, and the air between them crackled. Lux's cheeks burned with embarrassment. Her feelings were right there, arching like electrical currents in red and green between them. Matthew's hard edges all softened as the power between them magnified. Lux, he ducked to catch her eye. Do you remember that night in the cave when I said I didn't believe in Christmas magic, and you said nothing was more hurtful to a Kringle than someone who didn't believe? She nodded. His words still stung as if they were attached to her heart by those little hooks used to hang ornaments on a tree. I need to apologize for saying that. Obviously, he held up both palms. I believe in Christmas magic, and I believe in you. One by one the unwanted ornaments fell away as she stared into his soft brown pools of kindness, finding sincerity. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to apologize. I should have said something right away. Why didn't you? I was overwhelmed with the dangers we were facing, thunder was all over me this place, the magic, your family, you. He whispered the last word, and even though it was quieter than the others, it carried much more weight. We can be overwhelming. You are overwhelming, he stated again. I don't try to be. And that's exactly why this is such a problem. He moved his hand closer to hers, several threads of energy going from his fingers to Lux's fingers. We've got to keep the energy levels in this room to a minimum. Lux's cheeks burned like sugar and water over high heat. Oh, the humiliation. She'd never had a man tell her she liked him too much. How did girls ever survive middle school? I'm trying to keep it under control. I don't think it wants to be controlled. He brushed that rebellious curl off her forehead. She sighed hating to admit that he was right. With every passing day, her admiration for Matthew's cleverness grew. Probably not. She began to sway, her body remembering the feeling of being held in Matthew's arms as he hummed in her ear. Robin to Lux. Lux's phone crackled. Thankful for the interruption Robin's timing saved her from doing something stupid. And flirting with her husband was stupid on so many levels, including, but not limited to, shorting out several key departments. She stepped away from Matthew, the magic fading the farther she got. Lux here. Whatever you're doing, stop it. You just burned a vat of chocolate. Lux cringed. How do you know it's me? Because Ginger is standing right here. It could be Stella. Lux. All right, all right. Lux out. She tucked her phone into her back pocket. If Matthew touched her again, she might just explode. She was mortified that he was aware of her feelings and thought they were a problem. But what was she supposed to do? From now on, she'd only discuss work and do her best to keep the situation platonic. 
she swatted away the sparkles that floated around her body. Platonic would be a lot easier if she wasn't literally creating magic with her love for Matthew. The sooner the substation was completed, the better. Chapter 30 September 8th 107 Days Until Christmas Eve Quick came out of the bathroom wearing a fluffy camel-printed bathrobe. He hated the thing, despite the camel print, it was not manly. His army buddies would laugh their buzz cuts off if they caught him in this. Frost continued to leave army-themed clothing for him in his closet when he wasn't around. Since he had no other way to get clothes, and she did the same thing for everyone, he thanked her politely. Layla was her favorite project. That child had more skirts and shirts and hair bows than any kid he'd known, and he'd grown up in Richville, California, attending private schools and hobnobbing with politicians and their families on the weekends. Lux stumbled out of her room. Her bathrobe hung open, one side of the belt touching the floor and the other barely hanging in the loop. Her hair stuck up in all different directions, and she didn't have her glasses on. She wore fleece pajama bottoms with video game controllers and a navy tee. He sucked in, forgetting to breathe. He still hadn't gotten used to being around her so much. Even now, his heart pounded a beat at the sight of her, as if she jump-started the organ with an electrical jolt. The past couple months had been an education he never knew he wanted and yet was fascinated by. He asked where the magic came from. She blushed the color of her hair and explained how Christmas magic was fed by the love between Santa and Mrs. Claus. She talked in depth about her family history, the changes that had taken place when she and her sisters were born, and how the magic split five ways. Ginger had been chosen to succeed her father as Santa, the subsequent search for a husband, and her marriage, which he had witnessed. She explained the need for each of them to get married, one a year so as not to overwhelm the process. There were charts of the power surges and dips. Spreadsheets full of data. The magic increasing quickly wouldn't be a problem if their machines were wired for it. They weren't, they were wired to run off electricity. That's where the problem started. Too much power and wires fried, hard drives went up in smoke, chaos ensued. Quick understood immediately that Lux was really telling him he couldn't touch her, kiss her, or explore his love that grew every day or he'd blow up the factory. He worked hard to keep his hands and his lips to himself, but when she stumbled out of bed looking sleepy and so cuddleable, remembering why he wasn't holding her was much more difficult. Morning. She stretched, her t-shirt lifting to show a sliver of her beautiful, creamy skin. He quickly glanced away before the air could start to crackle. Good morning. There was a knock at the door, and Lux hurried to answer it. Stella, hey. Hey. Stella skipped into the room. Hi Quick, did you know you're dead? She dropped a newspaper on the kitchen counter. Quick and Lux bumped heads leaning over to read the headline. They laughed awkwardly and rubbed their new goose eggs. Renowned scientist dead after explosion. There was a picture of Quick's cabin. The roof was missing, and the front door was on the ground. The windows were blown out, and his bed was in the middle of the yard. Quick straightened. I thought the prototype didn't blow up the barn. It looked fine before we left. He shook his head once in an effort to reconcile his memory with the newspaper image. It didn't. Lux scooted the paper so she could read it better. This is the house, not the barn. She leaned in. It looks like a gas explosion. See the burn marks on the walls? His arm grew warm from being too close to Lux, so he moved to the automatic hot chocolate maker on the counter and pushed start to heat up the water. Besides, it's been months since we were there. Yeah, but the cabin is far enough out that no one would have gone looking for me. Not until the mud was gone and I didn't answer the radio calls. She hummed in reply. You're up early. He pointed to Stella's clothes. She had on one of the fur capes she wore to fly. Still up. Stella yawned. I spent the night delivering school supplies to kids in Clearview. Quick measured the cocoa. Besides her busy schedule that got busier with every incoming letter Stella took on any project Clearview needed. 
How she understood the needs of the community so well was beyond him, especially since she lived so far away. Aren't you worried? Lux asked, tapping the paper. Quick settled against the counter. I'm not. Who's going to find me in Santa's ice palace? Who would believe me if I told them I lived at the North Pole? I wonder if there's an obituary. Stella tapped her chin. Lux, grab your laptop. Lux rolled her eyes but disappeared into her room. She came out with her glasses on, her hair pulled back in a ponytail, and the laptop. Quick was disappointed that she'd pulled her hair back. He liked it down, liked the way it tickled his arm when they worked closely. She and Stella crowded round the screen at the table. Quick finished making the hot chocolate. His was dark chocolate with a dash of peppermint oil. Lux liked hers straight up dark in the morning, and he really liked Lux in the morning. For Stella, he added lemon flavoring. Balancing the three mugs, he made his way to the table. Here it is. Stella accepted her cocoa as Lux squinted at the computer screen. Quick leaned over her to place the mug by the computer. He drank in her cocoa peppermint scent, all warm and deep with a pop of cool. Somewhere in the room Stella was reading the obit out loud. Parents, Jerry and Jennifer Quick. He swore. My parents. Lux's eyes grew wide. You have to tell them you're not dead. He scrubbed his hands through his head. How? It's not like I can show up there. I'll bet they're being watched. His chest constricted. It wasn't like his family didn't know the dangers of his enlistment, but the image of his mother holding a folded flag and sobbing was too much, he had to do something. Lux twisted her hair between her fingers. For a moment Quick got lost watching her, wondering what it would feel like to do the same thing. She jerked up. Mom. We'll send Mom down there. She'll look like a neighbor taking in a bereavement casserole. They'll let her in and she can explain. He thought about all the bad things that could happen. There really weren't that many. No one knew where he was. No one had any idea he was tied to this family. As far as he knew, no one knew Gail Kringle existed. Harvey would draw too much attention with his Santa beard and cookie belly. But Gail was perfect. No one would see her as a threat. Okay. I'll write a note, something that they will know came from me. With that figured out, the band around his chest loosened. Just as he was about to take a sip of his cocoa, an image on the screen made his blood go cold. Click on that. He pointed, his finger shaking. Lux tapped the link, and his ex-wife's face filled the left side of the screen. On the right was a smaller picture of a mangled SUV. His hand went slack and his cocoa poured onto the floor. Amy? Stella got out of her chair and forced him into it. Without him behind Lux, she was able to jump up for a towel. She dropped it over the mess and left it there. Did you know her? Lux asked. Quick ran a rough hand down his face. I was married to her. Stella gasped. Lux whipped around to read the article. She was in a car wreck. In critical care. My son, he rasped. He's in the hospital too. Cuts and bruises. Due to be released soon. Quick swore and got to his feet. He paced behind his chair before putting both hands on the back of it and leaning forward. This is my fault. Lux tipped her head, and he could see the cog spinning. I can't see how. I was supposed to stay in Alaska. If I hadn't left. If you hadn't left, you would have been caught by the men in those planes or inside your house when it exploded. Maybe. But at least they would be safe. Lux bit her bottom lip. Quick, I, I don't know what to say to make this better. You can't. He pushed away from the chair. Lux recoiled, and he instantly regretted his harshness. Stella, who had been quietly watching the exchange, leaned across the table. There is something you can do. What? Quick and Lux said at the same time. Quick's, what, was full of disbelief and challenge while Lux's was curious. 
Stella's eyes sparkled. Reconnaissance. What? They said again, this time they sounded equally incredulous. Spy time. Stella grinned. He and Lux exchanged a look, and he caught a sense of possibility from her. We do have reindeer and a sled. She plucked at the corner of the laptop. No one would see us coming. There you go. Fly down there and check it out. Stella folded her arms in triumph. Quick shook his head. We have so much to do, and not enough time to do it in. Lux pressed her lips together. Your son has to be your top priority. He stroked his beard. I would feel better if I could talk to Amy. Lux glanced quickly away. He wished he could see inside that beautiful head of hers, really get in there and find out how her mind worked. When she didn't look at him, he doubted himself. There's too many variables. I don't know if it's safe. Lux slowly got to her feet. Then we have to go to the hospital and fill in missing information. Are you sure? There might be people watching her room, waiting for me. Lux stared at her slippered feet. You need this. Trust Lux to think more of others than herself. He ached to hold her to his chest and tell her how wonderful she was, to draw from her well of strength. I'll be ready in five minutes. He hurried to his room. As he turned to shut the door, he caught Lux and Stella leaning their heads together and whispering. They stopped when he paused to watch them. Ah, so they were whispering about him. He nodded once and shut the door. The only person he told about his ex-wife was Lux. Frost knew he had a son, so he assumed it was common knowledge. Maybe Stella wasn't in on that info, what with being stuck in toy production. Was having an ex-wife a mark against him? He didn't think so, being married and then not married to Amy had been a huge education in how to treat a woman and what kind of a woman he wanted to be with for the rest of his life. If anything, the lessons he'd learned had made the heartbreak worth it. Except that his heartbreak wasn't the only one he had to consider, he had Lux now. It didn't take a genius to understand that an ex-wife and a current wife were a bad combination. Lux didn't have any reason to be jealous of Amy, she was ten times the woman Amy was in his eyes. As soon as the substation was up and running, he'd tell her. He'd tell her how amazing she is, how pretty she looked shaking off what little sleep she needed, and how much he wanted to be a full-time husband with all the perks. Especially with perks. To keep his mind off perks, he thought about his son. Changing out of his pajamas was an effort with his hands shaking. He hadn't seen Oliver since he was three months old. His own kid wouldn't recognize him. He couldn't think about that now. He yanked his old army backpack off the shelf and filled it with items they might need, while having no idea what they were getting themselves into. Chapter 31 Lux glanced at Matthew's door and put her finger over her lips to shush Stella. She took her sister's hand and pulled her into the bedroom. It might be right next to Matthew's, but the walls were several feet thick. Boughs of holly. Stella, I have no idea why they got divorced. Lux sorted through her t-shirts. Captain America's shield with a caption, I'd flex but I like this shirt. She didn't even feel like wearing her, I'm Batman, T. Ugh. None of these are appropriate for meeting my husband's beautiful ex-wife. And Amy was beautiful. The image on the screen showed a woman who could have been a model. Her glossy blonde hair hung in perfect beach waves and framed her oval face. Clear, impeccable olive skin. Here. Stella reached past the t-shirts and pulled out a form-fitting, emerald green sweater. He won't be able to breathe if you wear this one. Perfect. Lux snatched it and threw it over her head. Her hair was everywhere. Stella. Stella rolled her eyes. Honestly Lux, you're prettier than you give yourself credit for. She shoved Lux into a chair in front of her desk. Sit. Lux did so, silently thanking the Lord for blessing her with sisters. 
Stella used a large brush to work out the knots and then smoothed coconut hair serum from the roots to the ends. Matthew knocked on the door, his rap tap tap echoing the furious beat of her heart. You bow ready. Lux panicked. Almost, as she called back. To Stella she whispered, nothing too fancy. I don't want to look like I'm trying too hard. Stella nodded. I know just the thing. She started an inside-out French braid, pulling the loops loose as she went. In thirty seconds Lux had a stunning braid wrapped around her head and draping over her shoulder. The loose loops were on purpose messy, but she could pass it off to Matthew as just messy. Guys didn't know the difference. How'd you do that? Stella grinned. Just because my hair is short doesn't mean I don't have skills. Thanks. Lux gave her a quick hug. Okay. I think I'm ready. Really? Stella asked. Not really. I might throw up. This is so awful. What if he still loves her? She wrapped her arms around her middle. I don't know. This is your chance to find out. You're his wife, so act the part. Lux nodded. Okay. She pressed her arms down and away from her body while exhaling. Here I go. She pulled the door open to find Matthew leaning against the door jamb, filling the doorway. He smelled of a pine forest with a dusting of snow, and he was staring at her like he'd never seen her before. Lux watched his Adam's apple move up and down. You look ready, Quick said. I need my bag, Lux replied. She'd left it by the front door. Okay. He didn't move. Lux's cheeks grew warm under his heated gaze. Honestly, the man had more fire in him than the old candy ovens. Stella cleared her throat, loudly. Quick jerked out of his spell and pushed off the doorway. Lux turned to give Stella a knock-it-off glare and was met by a gigantic smile and a thumbs-up that made her chuckle. With a small wave, she headed to the door where she retrieved her bag. Let's go. They made their way to the stables. Lux pressed her hand into her stomach to keep from losing her hot chocolate. If Matthew still loved Amy, she was going to come apart like a nesting doll. Are you good to drive? His hand briefly touched her back and was gone again. I would, but... Dunder snapped his teeth at Matthew. Lux scratched the reindeer's favorite spot behind his ears. Depending on how this goes, I might let you take a bite out of him, she whispered. Dunder chortled with glee. Please remember I'm in the sleigh too, she pleaded. He looked contrite enough that she felt safe getting into the sleigh. I can drive, she told Matthew. Matthew went to step in, and Dunder took three steps, moving the sleigh out of his reach. Lux buried her grin. Knowing she had one person, animal, on her side gave her a shot of courage. She'd considered herself a pioneer in the Kringle family, the one who took on the science of Christmas magic like none before her. As far as she knew, this situation was a new one for a Kringle, too. However, there wasn't a thrill of anticipation zipping up her spine. Instead, she had a block of coal, hard and lumpy, in her stomach. She wasn't built for this sort of thing. She was fragile. Tender. Lost. How did women survive love? Because if anything was going to kill her, it would be the trials she faced because she was married to Matthew. How could she blame him for all this? He'd done his job for the military, and now they'd rather kill him than let him fall into enemy hands. And the enemies who wanted him alive would use him for their own purposes. He hadn't seen his son in years, and yet he cared enough to risk life and limb to check on the five-year-old. If there was a silver lining in this situation, it was meeting Oliver. Lux had to focus on the needs of the child, for a child she could and would do anything. She glanced at Matthew out of the corner of her eye. 
He stood next to her, his foot on the bracing block instead of settling into the seat. His fingers gripped the post, his jaw muscle twitched. He was beautiful in a scary, determined way. She sighed and flicked the reins. She would do anything for Matthew. Even meet his ex-wife. On, Dunder. Chapter 32 Lux guided Dunder to a quick, though fairly smooth landing on top of the hospital. The roof was covered in pebbles, and the runners splayed rocks as Dunder turned to keep the sled from going over the edge. That was exciting. Quick jumped out. Dunder thumped his back leg in distaste. You did great, boy. Lux handed him a fresh carrot from her bag. What if someone sees the sleigh? asked Quick. He motioned toward the door on the other side of the roof, and they headed that direction. Lux scanned the area. This is the tallest building in the area. She tipped her chin up, scanning the skies. If someone flies over, it's unlikely they'll look down. Even if they do, adults don't believe in magic. She gave him a teasing shove. He chuckled. I'm never going to live that down, am I? They reached the door. I don't anticipate it going away any time soon. Quick jiggled the handle. Locked. No problem. Lux reached into her bag and wished for a key to unlock the door. Here. She handed it to Quick. His jaw tightened momentarily before he tried the key. It worked. Of course it did. She glided past him as he held the door. Stella says you're, um, she is on the twelfth floor. You know, if I were to ever go back into the military, I'd take Stella with me. She'd blow their intelligence staff away. Lux forced amused sounds out of her throat, even though it was closing off at the thought of Matthew leaving. And why would he take Stella? Why not take Lux? Had it even crossed his mind that she might like to be, not shown off? No. She would not like to be shown off. Do you think about that a lot? She started down the concrete stairs, her hand gliding over the green painted handrail and her movements fast as if she could outrun an answer she didn't like. About what? About going back to the army. I used to. It was the only place I felt like I fit. She stopped and spun around. With her on the lower step, she was staring right at his chest. Right at his Captain America chest. What about now? She rasped out. Dang those ice climbing trips. He wore the blue scarf she'd given him so long ago. The end was frayed. She reached for the loose thread, intending to tuck it back into the weave. Lux, I. Before her fingers even touched the scarf, a green spark arched between her and Quick. That hadn't happened outside the building site. She yanked her hand down, severing the connection and making the spark flash and disappear. She spun around and ran down the stairs. Lux, he called after her. His footsteps pounded on the concrete and echoed off the walls. At the door that had a number 12 in tan paint Lux burst from the stairwell and into a quiet hallway. Matthew caught up to her. Lux, he said with caution. A man in blue scrubs scowled at them as he hurried past. The carpeted hallway, soft beeps, and quiet voices coming from the nursing station all said quiet. Not here. Come on. Lux followed the numbers on the wall, leading them to the patients' rooms. They approached Amy's open door with caution. Lux wondered how the woman would feel about being on a first-name basis. You're not in a position to care for him any longer, said a sharp male voice. Lux leaned to the right and saw a man in uniform standing over the hospital bed where Amy lay with a bandage wrapped around her head, one leg in a long cast, an arm strapped to her body, and bruises on her face. Matthew hooked her elbow and pulled her to the side of door. Sure. There weren't sparks when he touched her, 
but if she even thought about going near him, Christmas magic gave her away. She frowned. Matthew pressed a finger to his lips. Lux nodded her understanding. Where am I supposed to send him, rasped Amy. His father. Is not an option, Daddy. You know that as well as anyone. Amy's statement was met with stony silence. Couldn't you and Mom? No. Sigh. My plane leaves in two hours. Have a good flight. The uniformed man hurried out the door, not seeing Lux and Matthew pressed against the wall. Lux stared after him in disbelief. Had he really just turned away his own grandson? It's a pleasure to see you, General, Matthew growled. He searched the hallway. Do you see anybody who shouldn't be here? A cafeteria worker got off the elevator, pushing a cart full of covered dishes. Her hairnet crisscrossed her white bun. A nurse hurried into a room two doors down. A man with red-rimmed eyes occupied a couch at the far end of the hall. Matthew shook his head. I think we're safe. Lux's mouth went dry. You think? Pretty sure no one here wants to kill me, except Amy. She grabbed on to that info like a lifeline. Come on. He went into the room first, his shoulders practically touching his ears. With a deep breath Lux followed. Chapter 33 Quick stared at the woman in the bed who looked nothing like Amy. Amy had been vivacious, the life of every party, refined and driven. This woman was beaten and lost. Matthew? She rubbed her head with one hand as he made his way to the side of her bed. Yeah, it's me. What are you doing here? Her voice was groggy. They must have her on meds. I heard about the accident. I wanted to make sure you're okay. Amy's eyes shifted to look behind him. Her eyes narrowed. Matthew turned to see Lux standing just inside the door, her one arm wrapped around her middle. Amy could always pick out her greatest competition, even in a crowded ballroom. Lux was staring at the chairs where the light didn't quite reach. Matthew followed her gaze to see a little boy with his legs tucked to his chest and his head down. My son. Did you see my dad? Amy brought his attention back to her. Matthew almost said no. The lie was right there, but he couldn't get it past his lips. He tried again, but it was like the word glued his mouth shut. I saw him, but he didn't see me ran out like hot chocolate from the machine in their kitchen. He thought it was silly the first time he saw it sitting there, but being able to make Lux's favorite drink and see her face light up wasn't silly at all. Probably for the best. Amy tried to shift, rustling the sheets, and grimaced. He wants me to send Oliver to St. Catherine's. Boarding school? Quick's hands balled into fists. He's five. Her eyes sharpened. Exactly. How can I care for a five-year-old? I can't even take care of myself. He nodded. You're right. I just, I feel so responsible. He glanced over his shoulder at Oliver and nearly jumped to find him sitting on Lux's lap. She read softly in his ear as he turned the pages to the trouble with Santa's suit. The two of them were, perfect. Why? Amy's question brought him back to the real reason he was here. Why what, he asked. Seeing Lux holding his son had shifted something inside of him. The wanderlust that sent him into the military filtered out of his blood and was replaced by domestic needs. Wife. Home. Family. Peace. Quiet. Hope. Why do you feel responsible? He blinked down at her. I left for Alaska and… She snorted. The accident was my fault. What? I was arguing with my boyfriend. He's being transferred and wanted me to go with him but didn't want to take him. She lifted her eyes to indicate Oliver. With a heavy sigh, she sank into the bed. Who is she? Oliver likes her. She's… my wife. 
He'd never been so proud to say those words. His wife. Your wife. Even with the black eye, Amy managed to give him a disbelieving look. Quick couldn't help but grin. When he thought about all that had happened to bring Lux into his life, he was overwhelmed that she'd agreed to marry him, even if it was an easy deal made in a cave while they were in mortal danger. Yeah. So you're in a good place? He couldn't stop the grin from spreading across his face. I'm in the best of places. Then I want you to take him. Quick blinked several times. Excuse me? Amy closed her eyes as if the light made it difficult to think. She was probably in pain, but she was keeping it together like the general's daughter he'd known once upon a bad decision. When she opened her eyes, they were clear. Take him with you. I can't take care of him, not now. But you're going to get better. And my life will be less complicated. You're already married, settled. Lux appeared at his side with Oliver on her hip. Oliver cuddled into her shoulder, tucked there as if he had done it a thousand times. We'll do it, Lux affirmed. We will. Quick asked. Lux adjusted her hold and pushed her glasses up her nose. We will. Her words had a force to them he'd never heard from her before. Do you want to go for a ride with us? Lux asked Oliver. His eyes went big as he stared at his mom. I look scary, but I'm okay, bud. Amy smiled. Will you go with your daddy? He swung his gaze to Quick. Unsure what was appropriate in this situation Quick gave a weak smile. Oliver ducked back into Lux. He'll be okay, Amy assured them, though he couldn't be sure who she was trying to convince. Her eyes shone with tears, and her lower lip trembled. We'll bring him back to visit. Quick spoke without checking with Lux. He wasn't trying to rip the kid away from his mama. He didn't want to create trouble between them, and he didn't want Oliver to feel like he was being kidnapped. Amy relaxed into the pillows. I'd like that. Lux reached into her bag and came up with a card. This is my number. Please, call any time you want to talk to him or have questions. Who are you? she asked again. I'm, Lux shrugged. Lux. She said her name as if it was inconsequential, as if she had no idea how amazing she was. He'd met women who would kill to have the brains and looks Lux shrugged off as if they were less than amazing. You make me feel warm. Amy fought against heavy eyelids. She has that effect on people. Quick watched Lux with a new fondness. Amy wasn't the only one falling asleep. Oliver's eyes fluttered shut as well. Lux held his child as if she'd been doing it for the last five years. She pulled him closer and pressed a kiss to his light brown hair. Quick put a hand on Oliver's back. Will he be welcome back home? The magic had taken him in because of their marriage vows, but Oliver wasn't theirs. He wasn't even Quick's. Amy had full custody. Lux's eyes went wide. He's family, she said firmly, like her words could make Christmas magic except this little boy. She leaned closer. Layla lives there, and she's Joseph's niece. There's no reason to believe your son would be any different. He couldn't argue with that logic. We should go. He looked around to see if they'd left anything behind that would indicate that they'd been in the room. He couldn't even find a bag for Oliver. Lux headed toward the door. His son was big. Oliver's legs dangled out to the sides, and Lux was arching her back to make up for the additional weight, but he doubted he could convince her to let him go. They took the elevator as high as it went and then found the stairwell for the last flight. When they stepped into the sunshine, Oliver woke with a groggy, mommy. Lux rubbed his back. Are you ready to go for a ride? I want mommy. I know you do, little twinkle. Quick, with his empty arms and full heart, was once again at a loss. She already had a nickname for the kid, and he had yet to speak to Oliver. He had five years to make up for and no idea how to go about doing something so monumental. He hadn't even been around his nieces and nephews enough to learn how to talk to kids. Dunder snorted, drawing Oliver's attention. 
He stared wide-eyed at the sleigh, his mouth slack. Lux made her way over to the reindeer. Quick stayed close, not knowing what else to do and worried the often ornery reindeer would nip at Oliver as he did every time Quick was within biting range. This is Dunder. Lux took Oliver's hand and showed him how to rub behind Dunder's ear. Unlike when Quick tried to get close, Dunder moved slowly and with tender care. He's soft, said Oliver. Lux caught Quick's eye, a small, triumphant smile on her lips. He is. And he's going to take us home. How? Lux cupped her hand as if telling Oliver a secret. He can fly. The look of wonder on Oliver's face was precious. Quick wondered if he'd ever looked like that, had he ever believed in Christmas magic? He must have as a child. How he longed to tap into that uncluttered belief. And your dad is going to drive the sleigh. Both Dunder and Quick snorted. Quick looked at the reindeer, who was just as offended as he was. That's right. Lux kept right on talking as if neither of them had objected in the least. Your dad's going to fly the sleigh so I can hold you, and Dunder is going to fly real nice or I'll tell the elves not to give him carrots for a week. She smiled sweetly at the two of them before heading for the bench in the sleigh. Quick regarded the reindeer. I think we've been bamboozled. Dunder huffed. Quick lifted both hands. Hey, I don't like it either. Let's just get through this for the kid. Dunder shook his whole body sending hair flying. I'm taking that as a yes. Quick climbed in the sleigh and lifted the reins from the loop as he'd seen Lux do. Like this, he asked over his shoulder. His back muscles tightened and his knees shook. Not that he'd tell Lux he was scared. He wasn't scared. Brace your foot against that block. She pointed to the piece of wood in the middle of the floor. The bench was too far back to use for stability. He pushed his heavy boot in place. Lux put her arm around Oliver and nodded for him to go. He slapped the reins and nothing happened. Dunder, she warned. He huffed, which sounded a lot like he was laughing at Quick. Lux laughed too. I have to ask, what did you ever do to him? Quick's neck burned as he thought back to the night in the cave where he'd almost kissed Lux awake. Thought hard about how to tell the truth. I promise I didn't do anything to Dunder. Lux's disbelief was written across her face. She didn't press him, though, a fact he was extremely grateful for. You have to give the command. And say it like you mean it. He rolled his eyes, feeling like a complete idiot. On, Dunder, he bellowed in his best Santa impersonation. Dunder lunged against the harness, the runners scratching against the gravel. Quick pulled with the right rein and they turned, giving them room for a long run across the length of the roof. Riding in a flying sleigh was one thing, flying it was an entirely different experience. They cleared the edge of the roof and began to drop. Give him rein, you're pulling too tight, yelled Lux. Quick forced his arms forward, moving his hands away from his chest, and they slowly began to lift. His arms were frozen in place. Take us north, said Lux. Which way's north? He glanced back. Lux pointed. With a nod of thanks, he maneuvered the sleigh in that direction. He'd relax, except that flying a sleigh over California wasn't the most difficult part of this journey. With much tribulation and turbulence, they made it to the stables. Quick fell out of the sleigh and kissed the sawdust-covered ground. Dunder growled low, their temporary truce at an end. Just do it, he gasped. He'd been hyperventilating the entire flight. Besides worrying for his own life, the two most precious people in the world were in that sleigh. He'd never known pressure like that, and he'd worked on top-secret bomb projects. Dunder leaned within biting distance and quick put his hand on the animal's neck. I swear, I'll do everything in my power to never drive again. Dunder puffed out a hot breath. Lux and Oliver stared down at the two of them. If you two are done behaving like children, we have things to do. Oliver looked from Lux to Quick. He reached up and took Lux's hand. Are you ready to see the palace? she asked excitedly. 
He nodded, but stopped with his chin up as Selora arrived to take care of Dunder. Bumble bustled in. Ah, Miss Lux. I see you've brought home another stray. He smiled kindly at Oliver, who beamed in return. Quick scrambled to his feet and reached for Oliver's other hand. Oliver allowed him to take it, though he was reluctant. That was okay. Quick didn't want to miss one gasp of delight or hand clapping as he gave Oliver a tour of Santa's ice palace. He was eager to experience this place through the eyes of a child. Maybe Oliver could unlock the part of his heart that hadn't opened to Christmas magic. Maybe Oliver would teach him how to be like a little child again. Maybe Oliver would want to stay. Maybe he'd get a chance to be a father. After all, if reindeer could fly, anything was possible. Chapter 34 Where are we going to put him? Quick opened the door to his and Lux's apartment. He wouldn't mind setting up a bed on the couch in his bedroom. That made the most sense. He didn't get much further in his plans. A third door had appeared on the wall to the bedrooms. This one was painted blue with wood paneling. He tossed his arms in the air in defeat. Never mind. Lux and Oliver swooped in, holding hands. Well, Oliver clung to her hand. The elves were jolly, welcoming Oliver to the North Pole and shaking his hand like he was the King of England or something. He laughed and giggled at their antics as they took care of Dunder. Before the reindeer was taken to his stall and given a double feeding of his favorite oats, Dunder bent his head so Oliver could give him a good scratch. Quick wondered, several times, if the elves and reindeer were that welcoming to everyone but him, or if they pulled out all the stops for a child. Layla was highly favored around the palace. Everywhere she went, elves' faces lit up like the Griswold's light display. He tried, very hard, not to take it personally. Are you hungry? Lux asked Oliver. Oliver yawned and shook his head in response. Would you like a story? He nodded. Doesn't say much, does he? Quick commented. He's had a big day. So have I. Quick rubbed his stomach. Why don't you make sandwiches? I'll get him down for a nap. She disappeared into the mysterious new door. Quick made quick work of their lunch. Turkey on whole grain wheat for Lux, with lettuce, mayo, spicy mustard, and tomato. Roast beef for him, with lettuce, mayo, and salt and pepper. He found the celery sticks and put peanut butter on them for her and grabbed an apple for himself. He wiped crumbs off the counter. Not sure what else to do, he crossed the room and pushed open the door. Even Christmas magic had outdone itself welcoming Oliver to the North Pole. The bedroom walls were carved to resemble ship's timbers, the furniture rustic. A large mast supported a crow's nest in the corner, giving Oliver his own playhouse inside his room. A slide went from the nest to the soft carpet below. Lux was in a padded rocker, Oliver asleep on her lap. He looked so at peace that it tugged at Quick's heart. He slipped into the room, the plush blue carpet muffling his movements. Lux smiled contentedly. Quick squatted in front of them, brushing his finger over Oliver's arm. He doesn't like me. He doesn't know you. He doesn't know you either, but he likes you. I'm a Kringle. She grinned, and he could see the confidence she had in her heritage. He wished she believed in herself as Lux, not just as Santa's daughter. What she'd done with Oliver today was truly magical. I'm a Kringle now too. She shook her head. The magic isn't inside of you, not like it is in the rest of us. Haven't you noticed? She spoke softly, her words like a melody. He had. And it bothered him. Joseph could work for hours on end without a break. Quick was still forced to sleep eight hours out of every twenty-four. It's in Joseph. That's different. Why? She brushed Oliver's hair off his forehead and he sighed. Ginger and Joseph's marriage is different than ours. Of course. Quick rose to standing. His marriage was different, and the reason was as clear as the three distinct doors in their apartment. There should only be two. But there were three. 
It wasn't that he didn't want that kind of relationship with Lux, it was that he couldn't have it. He was here to save Christmas, not ruin it. Lunch is ready. He left as Lux stood to transfer Oliver to the boat-shaped bed. As far as he could see, the danger of ruining Christmas came in three different forms. The first was if he acted on the deep and abiding feelings he had for Lux, they would blow the roof off the palace. That would be unacceptable, especially now that Oliver was here. His son needed stability. Peace. Comfort. The second danger was if Lux didn't feel the same for him as he felt for her. True love was required to keep Christmas going, if they weren't in love, building the substation was pointless, because there wouldn't be any magic to regulate. The third danger was not finishing the substation in time. If he was ever going to profess his love for Lux, he had to have the proper safety measures in place. And all of this needed to happen in 107 days or less. Quick scrubbed his face. If he didn't get to kiss Lux soon, he would explode in one big boom. He was looking forward to Christmas like never before. And that counted the year he'd asked for a Nintendo. Instead of sitting down to eat, he wrapped his sandwich in a napkin so he could eat on the way to the job site. They'd spent almost six hours on their errand. He wouldn't take them back, he wanted Oliver here. But they were six hours closer to their deadline. He suddenly understood the draw behind advent calendars. He'd count down. He'd work and he'd count and he'd do everything he could for his family. He paused, mid-step. He had a family. On shaky legs, he continued on, his determination to save Christmas grew three sizes. Chapter 35 October 4th 81 days until Christmas Eve Okay, let's move that over this way. Lux put her hand over Oliver's on the lever and they slowly moved the crane to the left. The supporting insulator swayed in the air, coming dangerously close to knocking Matthew off the ladder. Oh. 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 She squeaked in a breath, which she held. She pulled Oliver's hand away from the lever, pressing a kiss to the back of his hand to let him know she wasn't upset. The back swing wasn't as big and the insulator's movements became manageable once again. Sorry, she called through the open window. Quick waved. The noise from the crane made it difficult to communicate. She would have used the radio to talk to him, but her hands were full trying to keep a five-year-old from touching every button and lever in the cab. Seriously, how had her mother done this five times? Especially with Stella in the mix. Lux had to admit that she wasn't much better, always taking things apart to find out how they worked, including the microwave. It was a wonder she hadn't died of radiation poisoning at some point. Props to mom. A little over a month had passed since the visit to the hospital, and Oliver still had a hard time letting Lux out of his sight. Or maybe it was just that Lux got to do cool things like drive a crane that drew the kid to her. She pressed a kiss to his hair. Let's try this a little slower. He nodded, his straight hair bouncing off his forehead. Matthew wanted to buzz it off, but Lux thought Oliver should retain parts of who he was before he came here. Too much change could overwhelm him. As it was, he woke with bad dreams about the accident and the hospital. It was a good thing she could go without sleep, because otherwise she'd be a zombie. Together, they moved the insulator into place, and Matthew attached the bolts. Auntie Lux Lux turned to find Layla and her dog, Timber, by the back of the crane, where Dunder stood inside a hamster wheel. He wasn't happy about his new assignment, but Oliver adored him and spoiled him with carrots. Mom waved from the doorway. Look, there's Layla. She pointed as she spoke in Oliver's ear. Matthew would be busy for another fifteen minutes or so, instead of trying to entertain Oliver in the small space, she decided to let them both out to stretch their legs. Let's go see what she's doing. K. Oliver beamed. He adored his older cousin and only playmate. 
Lux couldn't say that she hadn't worried about Oliver's social development without playdates in school. She promised herself that she'd be a better stepmom and find him friends, right after Christmas. They scrambled out of the cab and down the tracks to the marbled ice floor. Lux pointed to the hallway, where it was much quieter. She took Oliver's hand, and Layla reached for her other hand. Lux's heart warmed. She'd always loved her family, but there was a different kind of love that came from and for little ones. The trust they exhibited in the smallest actions was magnificent. Lux shut the door behind her. The quiet made her ears ring. Mom smiled. How's it coming? Good. We're hoping to be done before Thanksgiving. That's wonderful. We'll have a feast to celebrate. Layla giggled. Don't you always have a feast for Thanksgiving? Mom tapped Layla's nose. Smarty. She handed Layla a card. You give it to them. Layla grinned. We made this for you. She handed the card to Oliver. He looked up at Lux to read it. She tilted the envelope so she could make out Layla's handwriting. For a seven-year-old, it wasn't bad. Nice penmanship, Layla. Your cursive is really coming along. Thanks, Layla chirped. What's it say? asked Oliver. It says, an invitation for the Quick family. His eyes went wide. That's us. If he got any cuter, he may just burst her heart wide open. Open it. Lux nudged his shoulder. Layla clapped her hands before clasping them in front of her. Mom glowed with excitement. Oliver ripped off a corner of the envelope, then tore through the back of it to get to the card inside. Lux eyed the hallway to make sure her youngest sister wasn't around. Frost would have flipped her lid over his sloppy envelope opening. The card was black and orange and white and green with a ghost in the top left corner. You're doing Halloween again? Lux asked. Mom played with her long necklace, a silver chain with a small bell at the end. This is Layla and Oliver's first Halloween at the North Pole. I got to thinking about how much fun you girls used to have dressing up and trick-or-treating with the elves, and I thought, why not? I think it's a great idea. Lux hugged her. Oliver tugged on her shirt. What's it say? Lux laughed at herself. In her excitement, she'd forgotten to read the invitation to him. She knelt down so she was on his level. It says that we're invited to a Halloween party. You can wear a costume too. Layla spun in a circle. I'm going to be a princess. Which one? asked mom. Princess me, Layla replied. Auntie Ginger is going to help with my costume. She's going to be a queen, and Uncle Joseph is still thinking about it. Lux exchanged an amused look with her mom. Joseph was quiet, reserved even. Getting him out of his wood shop was an effort. She could only imagine what it would take to get him into a costume that didn't involve a flannel shirt of some sort. We have more invitations to deliver. Do you want to help? Mom held her hand out to Oliver. He looked at Lux. Can we tell Dad about the party first? He should almost be done. She stood up. Can you two wait for a minute? Sure. Mom smiled. But I'm waiting out here where it's not so noisy. Layla nodded in solemn agreement. Okay. We'll hurry. Lux opened the door and held it while Oliver went under her arm to enter the room without a name. She'd batted around several ideas, but still hadn't found one that sounded right. She hurried over to the crane and pulled the lever that locked Dunder's will in place. Without his powerful hooves pounding against the wood, the room was much quieter. They moved to the bottom of Matthew's ladder. How's it coming? I'm on the last bolt. To add. We got an invitation. Oliver held the paper over his head and waved it. That's great, Matthew replied, 
barely loud enough for them to hear. Come see. In a second. Lux gave Oliver's shoulder a reassuring squeeze. After much longer than a second Matthew made his way down the aluminum ladder. He was almost as loud as Dunder in the wheel. I've got it bolted into place. You can bring in the next part. Oliver tugged on Matthew's shirt. Dad. Just a minute, Oliver. Lux used her eyes to tell him to look at Oliver. Are you okay? You're twitching. She resisted the urge to throw her hands in the air and scream. Oliver has something to show you. She smiled sweetly. Oliver held up the invitation with both hands. We're having a party. Quick scan the card. You guys have fun. Wait. Lux shoved her glasses up her nose. What do you mean? I mean have a good time. You aren't coming, she asked. Oliver's hands dropped to his sides. There's too much to do here and not enough time to do it in, replied Matthew. You make time for what's important Matthew quick. She worked to keep the censure out of her tone. A party is not important. Oliver's chin dropped to his chest, and it was all Lux could do to keep from sweeping him up in her arms. It is important. It's a family tradition. We did this every year until Frost was in eighth grade. What, the biggest Christmas party in the world isn't enough for you guys? He placed a hand on the ladder. Uncalled for. Lux put her hand on her hip. Matthew lifted both hands in the air. You're right. Sorry. So you're coming. She stated the information. She wasn't going to ask him again. And we are all wearing matching costumes, Oliver gets to choose the theme. She nudged his shoulder. What do you want to be for Halloween? He finally lifted his chin off his chest. A pirate, he whispered. A vast, ye matey. Pirates it is. This earned her a smile from Oliver. Come on, Grandma is waiting for you, and I'll bet the last stop on her route is the cookie oven. Oliver made a dash for the door. Bye. He waved and was gone. Lux folded her arms and glared at Matthew. You didn't handle that very well. He stared at the ladder. I know. Believe me, I know. You need to get excited about what he's excited about. Get into his world. Matthew rubbed his forehead. Lux, one imaginary world is enough for my life, okay? What's that supposed to mean? I live at the North Pole. I'm building a substation for Christmas magic. I flew a sleigh. There are days when I forget that there's a real world out there with real problems. We have real problems. Name one. A son who hungers for his father's love. Matthew rocked back. I love him. It's not enough to feel it, you have to show it. Fine. He hitched up his tool belt. What do you want me to do on top of everything else I'm already doing with half the awake time you get? Lux bit back the fact that she spent half her awake time taking care of their family. Washing clothes, cleaning up the apartment, playing with Oliver. Take over reading his bedtime story. Fine. And you're a pirate for Halloween. As long as I don't have to wear makeup or a wig. Fine. She marched back to the crane, and Matthew climbed the ladder. Inside the cab, nothing felt right. The seat was hard. The air was stuffy. Her hair kept getting in her face. She'd gotten what she wanted out of the conversation, but she didn't feel satisfied. It bothered her that Matthew didn't want to go to the party or dress up, even after it was clear that they were doing this for Oliver. She would swim across the Atlantic for that kid, and technically he wasn't even hers. A sick feeling swirled low in her belly. 
Matthew was bound to her by vows and the magic welcomed Oliver into the family, but there were no guarantees the two of them would stick around after Christmas. The way Matthew obsessed about finishing the substation made her wonder if he was counting down the days till he was set free. She pressed her fist into her stomach. She didn't want either of them to leave. But what could she do to keep them here? Nothing. They weren't tied to Christmas, and Matthew was still closed off. She rubbed her hands up and down her arms, trying to brush away fear's icy grip. Chapter 36 October 31st 54 days until Christmas Eve I don't see why I have to wear a mask. Lux bit back her groan. Getting Matthew to participate in anything that wasn't related to building the substation was harder than two-year-old caramels. She stepped back to examine his costume. Instead of going with a traditional pirate or Peter Pan slash Captain Hook ensemble that would have required a wig, she'd chosen Dread Pirate Roberts slash Sweet Wesley, all black clothes, flowing sleeves, and the open collar. Dang, but his chest, visible in the deep V, was something to behold. It's part of the costume. She swallowed the euphoria that threatened to bubble up any time she let herself focus on him for more than thirty seconds. But your beard is pirate enough if you'd like to leave the mask behind. She used her messenger bag to conjure up a bowl full of Halloween candy. He rubbed his jaw. My beard looks like a pirate beard. She nodded, her eyes roaming all over his costume, from the thick black boots, up the black pants fitting just right in all the right places, to his trim waist and the black leather belt that matched the cord hanging around his neck. They crossed his broad chest and shoulders and settled on his neatly trimmed beard. Captain Hook Alla once upon a time. Is that a good thing? Lux held her breath. She couldn't count the nights she and Stella had stared at the large television, transfixed as Hook swept Emma off her feet over and over again, wishing he'd run those pirate fingers through her hair. That image brought up the image of Matthew taking her in his arms, his hands in her hair, it had her skin tingling as if charged with static electricity. If she wasn't careful, her hair was going to lift into the air like she was holding a static-filled balloon. She frowned. Quick's costume was a bad idea. A very, very bad idea. It's fine. She adjusted the wide belt accentuating her waist and holding a plastic sword. Her black Santa boots made the perfect pirate boots. Who knew? Long, gray sleeves came to her elbows and flared wide. She wore several chains of pearls around her neck in different sizes and large hoop earrings. Oliver is going to love it. That's it, keep the focus on the kid. Oliver was still in his room with Frost, who was putting the finishing touches on his costume. Since Lux and Quick spent so much time installing the current Transformers this week, she barely had time to pull something out of her bag for the two of them. She could work alongside him, avert her gaze, and make sure their skin never made contact, and the pounding desire for him stayed under control. Having Oliver around helped too. He was the perfect interruption to every conversation, the excuse to leave the room, and a nice little wall between them. He was also a fantastic kid who soaked up the love and attention she and her family dished out like Halloween candy. You can handle one night in costume. Even the elves are dressing up. Yeah, because pointy shoes with bells aren't costumes, he grumbled. Lux laughed, and their eyes met, sending sparks out of her fingertips that connected to his. Or maybe they'd met in the middle. She schooled her feelings. He'd caught her off guard. What really worried her was how easily she'd flipped from being in control to out of control. But then, there was that sense that they'd both created magic. She hardly dared hope he was falling in love with her, and yet the hope was there, glowing in her chest like a furnace. A future together was possible, love beyond this Christmas was attainable. She wanted to twirl and spin. There was a knock at the door and a group called, Trick or Treat. 
She flung it open, grateful for the distraction, to find Ginger and Layla dressed as a queen and princess respectively. Ginger's gown was gold with delicate beading in the shape of snowflakes. The flakes started small and got bigger as they tumbled down the dress. Layla's dress was pink, of course. She had on a simple tiara and a dusting of glitter on her cheeks. She held out her pink purse. Trick or treat, Auntie Lux. Lux smiled so hard her nose wrinkled. Happy Halloween, Princess Layla. She dropped a piece of chocolate in Layla's purse. Where's Joseph? If Joseph didn't wear a costume, there was no way Quick was going to leave the apartment in his, and Oliver was counting on them going together. I'm here. Joseph stepped into view, and Lux bit her cheek to keep from laughing. She was sure there was never a more uncomfortable Cinderella's prince charming on the planet. He wore the white pants, white shoes, and a red coat with the white and gold sash. His face was almost purple with embarrassment. Ginger's eyes pleaded with Lux not to say anything that would make this harder on the man who was being a very good sport for his wife and niece. Happy Halloween, Joseph. You look quite awkward. Dashing. That's what I told him. Ginger grinned. Thanks, he muttered. Do you guys want to come in for a minute? The plan was to trick or treat their way to the family room where mom and dad had set up carnival games for everyone. Frost made costumes for the kids, sewing as she read letters. Robin dipped apples, pressed cider, and fried donuts. Stella decorated between shifts in toy making. The production schedule was much busier than it had been just 15 days ago. They were on target and as long as the magic continued to flow at a steady rate, they'd be fine. Sure. Layla ran straight for Oliver's room and pounded on the door. It's me, she yelled into the crack. Matthew leaned close enough that she could smell his pine forest and frosty scent. Her knees went wobbly. Okay, it could have been worse, he mumbled as he discreetly pointed at Joseph, who tugged at his collar. Lux lowered her lashes in an effort to veil the desire she knew shone through. Wait till you see Frost, she replied. Oliver's door burst open and Frost stepped out. She dressed as Sandy from Greece with the poodle skirt and high ponytail. If she had a boyfriend, he would have been in black jeans, a leather jacket, and pomade greasing his hair. Presenting the terror of the high seas, the dreaded pirate Oliver. Oliver came out grinning. His smile ruined the scary pirate look, but everyone owed as if he were terrifying. Even Matthew. Which was a good thing, because Oliver's eyes were glued to his father, begging for approval. Lux held her breath, praying Matthew would know the right thing to say. He'd been distant with his kid, and she could feel Oliver's hurt. She'd explained that it takes time for people to relax around one another but kids didn't get that. They made best friends in ten seconds, accepting everyone. Matthew smiled softly and shook his finger at Oliver. Listen to me, young man. Oliver's smile faded. There will be no making your cousin walk the plank. Matthew wagged his finger. It took Oliver a couple seconds to catch on to the fact that Matthew was playing with him. Arg, he agreed. The princess goes free. Ginger swung the door open. How about we break out of the brig and get us some candy? Yeah. Layla charged through with Oliver on her heels. Wait up. Joseph darted after them. Ginger rolled her eyes. Like I could run in gold slippers. She lifted her hem to reveal the most delicate kitten heels made of gold. They fit. Frost clapped her hands. Her yellow poodle skirt swished as she followed the kids. You know, if we really were pirates, Matthew quirked a devastatingly handsome eyebrow. He should really put on the mask. Lux hated when they were left alone. 
She stepped into the hallway where they were in full view of the trick-or-treaters and several elves dressed as Star Wars characters carrying pillowcases. You'd steal her shoes. She looked up just as he shut the door and glanced down. His eyes dropped to her lips. Among other things. Peanut brittle. Dad. Oliver ran right into his legs. Look at the chocolate eyeballs Stella gave me. Chocolate eyeballs, really? Lux folded her arms as Stella approached. She was dressed in a prison outfit, complete with a ball and chain attached to her foot. And jelly brains. Oliver giggled. Come on, Captain. Robin held out her hand. I heard one of the elves set up a haunted house a couple doors down. Lux grabbed Robin's arm and gave her a warning look. She'd finally gotten Oliver to sleep through the night. He'd had nightmares about the car crash for weeks. Robin laughed. Totally kid-friendly, I promise. We'll come too. Matthew fell into step behind her. They walked together without brushing against one another or having to actually touch. They spoke mostly to Oliver, who lapped up having them all in the same place at the same time. Still, the invisible current that had burst into existence, created by the new hope that the two of them could one day soon share their love, tickled her skin. Before they entered the family room Lux paused. You did good back there Matthew. With him. You should know that. Thanks. He looked everywhere but at her. You know, she'd been bothered by something he said before. There are kids all over America trick-or-treating tonight in the real world. She put quotes around the last two words. Yeah. The same thing we're doing here. He laughed and shook his head. It's not even close to the same thing. It is. She cocked her hip. It's not, but it's cute that you think so. He reached up to pat her arm, but pulled back at the last second. Lux glared. I don't see how this isn't real to you. Because there's no heartbreak, there's no pain, you all don't even get sick. After all this time you set yourself apart from the magic. At first, I thought you didn't believe hard enough, but now I think you believe you're above it somehow, like it's a child's toy you've outgrown. Lux pressed her hand to her throat as it threatened to close off with emotion. I believe in the magic. I've seen the magic. But this isn't real life, darling. This is fairyland. She stepped away from him, from his harsh tone. The hallway dusted with silence as everyone from Kringle to Elf to Timber the dog turned to watch the two of them argue. Thankfully, Oliver was still in the haunted house and oblivious to their disagreement. Matthew glanced around the room while avoiding eye contact. I can't pretend there aren't problems in the world. Lux kept her back to her family. She didn't want to see the accusation in their eyes. She'd brought a man who could see the magic and still locked it out of his heart. That's not what we're about. We don't pretend there isn't evil in the world, you, she scrambled for a nasty name to call him that wouldn't upset the children. Jacob Marley. His forehead wrinkled. She rolled her eyes. The ghost of Scrooge's partner who comes back rattling his chains. She shook her fists in the air. Hearing chains, she flipped around to see Stella shaking the ball and chain hooked to her ankle. Thanks, she told Stella, before turning back and poking Matthew in the chest. He was as unredeemable as you. He pointed to his chest. Unredeemable. I'm here, aren't I? Understanding cracked over her head like an egg, the knowledge dripping and gooey. You're not here because you want to bring joy to the world and fight against the forces of hate and envy and malice, which is what we do. Not to love me. Not to do good. You're not even all the way here. You're keeping one foot outside the cave in case you have to make a hasty exit. She lifted her chin and glared. 
She thought the sparks were going both ways, that the magic arching between them meant he was falling in love with her, too. He folded his arms and sealed his lips. His lack of denial was as good as a confession. Kringles couldn't lie, but they could keep silent. She reached into her bag and pulled out a manila envelope, which she thrust at his chest. What's this? The world thinks Matthew Quick is dead. Those are birth certificates, social security cards, a driver's license, everything you'll need to start a new life under a new name as soon as the substation is done. Even as she stood there, her hand trembled with the desire to snatch the envelope away. Lux! Mom exclaimed. Lux couldn't turn from Matthew. She had to see his reaction, had to know if he wanted to leave. What about us? he asked quietly. You tell me. She threw the weight of confession back at him. He met her gaze, and she tried desperately not to let her breaking heart bleed through. He didn't say anything. She couldn't stand there, staring into Matthew's eyes, and say goodbye. Tell Oliver I said goodnight. She lifted her skirts and hurried back to their apartment, sure that no one in history had done so much damage to Christmas as she had in the last five minutes. She shut herself in her room and hugged a pillow to her chest. Maybe she was just as selfish as Matthew, because even though she knew this was going to cause problems, every tear that fell was for her own unrequited love. A few minutes later there was a light knock on her door. Lux pushed her face deeper into the bed covers. Go away. The door opened. Is that any way to speak to your mother? Lux found herself in her mom's hug. She sniffed. I'm sorry I ruined Halloween. Mom handed her a small package of tissues. The kids are completely unaware. Thank goodness. Lux blew her nose and then tossed the tissue into the garbage. I don't want them to go. That's not what it sounded like to me. Mom tucked Lux's hair over her shoulder. It sounded like you were pretty set on sending Quick away. He shouldn't be here. He's not one of us. Mom smiled sadly. Neither was I. She looked around the room. This takes some getting used to, and I knew what I was getting myself into. Did quick. Lux thought back to their two-hour whirlwind engagement. She rubbed her bare finger where a wedding ring should be. Probably not. She deflated. Even so, he doesn't, he isn't. What? I thought he cared for me. Not Christmas or magic or all of that. Me. He does. Lux didn't want to argue with mom, so she didn't say anything. I've seen him look at you when you're not looking. He does. But he'll leave. You watch. He'll leave. That doesn't mean he doesn't love you. What good does it do me if he doesn't stay? Give it some time, sweetheart. Time was the one thing Lux didn't have. Mom kissed her head and then went to the door. I'm going back to the carnival. Would you like to come? Bobbing for apples and throwing bean bags didn't sound as much fun as it had a while ago. I don't think so. She took off her necklaces. I'm going back to the workroom. Matthew is right, there's too much to do and not enough time. Chapter 37 November 11th. 43 days until Christmas Eve. Frost to Lux. Lux reached for the walkie-talkie. Lux here. Their cell phones were malfunctioning. Dad was working on it. I've got an issue in letters. Can it wait? Lux spliced two wires together. We're in the middle of final checks here. Can't wait. Christmas is in 43 days. I'm coming. Lux hooked the talkie on her belt. Are you good here if I go? Lux called to Matthew, who was on the other side of the machine. 
He lifted a hand in acknowledgement but didn't look up from the schematic he compared to the panel. An icy chill made the hairs on her arms stand up as the fear of losing him surfaced. She rubbed them briskly as she hurried out the door. The hallway was warmer. Which was strange. The workroom should have been the warmest in the house. She sprinted, not wanting to waste a minute, not having one to waste even if she wanted to. She didn't bother to knock on the door to letters, but pushed it open. All right, I'm here. Whoa. She stared at Frost's empty desk. You're on top of it. No, Frost's eyes grew so wide she looked like they were under magnifying glasses. No. I'm not on top of it. And do you want to know why? She made her way around the desk, leaning on it for support. Lux grew leery. Why? Because the letters aren't coming through. Not like they normally do. She started stomping. We get two, maybe three bags a day. Where are the letters, Lux? Lux leaned over and looked under the desk. Frost grabbed her shirt and pulled her up. They aren't here. Her nostrils flared. Ginger burst through the door. She was in full-on Mrs. Claus clothes with a red velvet skirt trimmed in white and a fitted fur-lined red jacket. I heard you over the talkies. What's going on? There's no mail. Frost wailed. Okay. Let's not panic. Lux put her hands on top of Frost's, which were still clutching her shirt. Have you called the post offices? All of them. All the post offices in the world are slow with Santa's letters. That doesn't happen. Something's wrong. Frost let her go, shaking her fingers out and hyperventilating. I think Lux meant the North Pole, Alaska, post office. Ginger pulled off her black gloves. Mittens were great for fashion but made holding reins difficult, the gloves worked better for Ginger and her small hands. North Pole, Alaska, worked as a hub for the North Pole's mail, accepting delivery to their location. An elf would take a reindeer and the mail slay down and pick them up. The closer they got to Christmas, the more pickups they made per day. At this point, they should be making two trips a day. I went there myself. The place looked like the Grinch just cleaned it out. Ginger slapped her gloves into her palm. Then you'll have to go farther south, pick up the letters before they clog up the delivery channels. Frost nodded. I can do that. She ran to the whiteboard with a map of the world and began scribbling names. I'll send Mom to Europe. Robin can go to North America. Joseph can do South America, and you and I can split the rest of the world between us. She gathered her magical bag. Do you think we can take all the reindeer? Lux sucked in air through her teeth. You've got to leave the core eight. They shouldn't be pushed beyond their regular workouts at this point. Ginger smiled confidently. We'll get it done with the middle agers. Lux bristled. Dunder can help. He's stronger than we give him credit for. He's a grandpa. Frost pulled a scarf out of her bag. She didn't need it to keep warm, but if they were going in public, they had to make sure they dressed like the locals, otherwise people tended to get curious. A grandpa with spunk, Lux defended her loyal friend. Speaking of grandpa, should we call him in too? Frost asked. Ginger opened the door and waved them out. If things don't improve in a couple days, then yes. I'm hoping that unclogging the delivery channels will take care of the problem. At this point, I'm willing to try anything. Frost slid her hands into gloves. Good luck, Luck said. They left letters at the same time and took different directions down the hallway Frost heading to the stables to arrange sleighs and reindeer ginger walking swiftly to gather the family. Lux headed back to the workstation. They were close, ever so close to being done, but a part of her didn't want the substation done. 
A part of her wanted to extend the project and keep Matthew here to Christmas and beyond. Sadly, she understood that not all Christmas wishes could come true. Chapter 38 November 23rd 31 days until Christmas Eve Quick tugged at the green tie. Somehow Frost had found his old dress blues and insisted he wear them to Thanksgiving dinner. The gold piping glinted in the light, and the blue braid was tight under his right arm. The shirt was pressed and smelled like starch. The smell brought back many memories of dinners, balls, and a time before Oliver was even a thought. He'd been idealistic as a youth, believing that people were inherently good. Probably because his parents were good people, the best, really. Dad? Oliver stood in his doorway, his bow tie hanging limp over his open palm. Do I have to wear this? Quick laughed. Hadn't he asked Lux the same question on Halloween? Sorry, Lieutenant. Thanksgiving dinner is black tie. He squatted in front of Oliver and took the tie. Upon inspection, he discovered that it was too tight. With a little adjustment, Olivier hardly knew it was there. You're all set. He got to his feet, snapped his shoes together, and saluted. Oliver did his best to salute him back, and Quick tickled under his lifted arm, earning him a batch of giggles. Quick's next thought had his heart pounding and his palms sweating. Should we, uh, see if Lux is ready? Oliver skipped to the open door. She already left. She said we could meet her in the dining room. Quick's heart screeched to a halt before pounding once hard and painfully against his ribs to get going again. Things between them were strained. He'd apologized for the fairyland statement. She said she forgave him, but her eyes were pools of uncertainty. How he wished to wipe that uncertainty away and replace it with a sure knowledge and belief in him. He paused, his hand going to his heart. He wanted her to believe in him. Light and understanding filled his mind. He understood the, believe in me, pleading in her eyes. He got it. Wait just a minute, he told Oliver. Dashing to his room, he grabbed a sheet of paper and a pen and wrote a few lines. Then he folded the paper and tucked it into his pocket. The substation was complete. They were turning it on tonight, and not a moment too soon. The mail was still slow. Grandma and Grandpa Kringle had come in last week to help with collection. But his letter to Lux would get through, he'd make sure of it. Today was Thanksgiving, and this day was all about giving thanks. Quick was hoping to have a moment before the big party to tell Lux how grateful he was for what she did for him, for him and Oliver. He'd hoped to be friends once again, at the very least. To walk into the dining room with Lux on his arm. He missed her something terrible. When they were together, even when they weren't talking, he had this sense that everything flowed through the right breakers. It was warm and peaceful and comforting. When they were apart, his thoughts were on a constant loop that brought him right back to her. He had visions of flipping the switch, the substation humming to life, and sweeping Lux into his arms to finally give her the kiss he'd been dreaming about. She'd be dressed up tonight, and he'd been looking forward to seeing her in the navy gown Frost dropped off yesterday. Oh. Come on, Dad. Oliver struggled to open the apartment door. I'm coming. He tugged on his black blazer and checked the hems of his blue pants to make sure they hadn't tucked into the back of his dress shoes. I'm ready. They made their way down the hall of Santa's past and to the dining room. I hope we aren't the last ones, he whispered to Oliver, who shrugged as he shoved the door open. He'd expected to find everyone seated around the massive table and food piled from one end to the other. That would have been nice. Instead Robin was dabbing her eyes with a gold napkin. Gail had her arm around Robin's shoulder and patted her back. Frost circled the room, yelling into her walkie-talkie, firewood and coal, as much as you can get in the big sleigh. Hurry! Harvey was in and out of the kitchen with dishes. Stella and Layla gathered plates and put them in the china cabinet on the east wall. Grandpa and Grandma blew out candles on the massive centerpiece. Did we miss dinner? Quick asked Ginger, who was holding her stomach and turning green. That would be just great. 
Nothing says, I'm thankful for your hospitality like skipping the meal. There is no dinner. Ginger had a cloth napkin spread out and was writing down notes as fast as she could. But I'm hungry. Oliver tugged on Quick's jacket. Quick snagged an apple off the centerpiece, verified that it wasn't made of wax, and handed it to the kid. Eat this. He leaned to see over Ginger's shoulder. Emergency procedures. Wood for ovens. Generators for toy-making machines. Lights for wrapping room, no candles. The one person he wanted to see wasn't even here, and her family had gone nuts. Where's Lux? He yelled over the din. Harvey dropped a vat of pudding on the table. She's not here. He looked everywhere, even under the table. She's gone to start the substation. He bolted for the door. Quick grabbed Oliver's arm. Stay with Stella. Okay. Oliver nodded, his hair bouncing on his forehead. Quick was right behind Harvey, running down the hallway. What is going on? The ovens went out. They broke. No, they went out. All of them. Like the phones. Tannenbaum. Quick Christmas cursed. Harvey let out one quick ho, that's what I like to hear. He huffed. Is the station even ready? Yeah, Quick replied as he pulled ahead of the old man. We were going to announce it over dinner. At least, that's what Lux said she wanted to do. He pushed harder, putting more distance between him and Harvey. If anything goes wrong, I'll never forgive myself. He sprang through the door in time to see Lux, in a stunning navy gown that fit every part of her just right, throw the switch. The switch clicked. Quick froze in place, his arms out to the side. His breaths were loud, echoing off the ice. Nothing happened. Lux stepped back and back and back to take in the whole machine. Quick slowly straightened. Harvey barreled into the back of him, and Quick fell forward. We made it. Harvey blew out a peppermint breath. Quick put his hands on his knees. She already turned it on. Why isn't it working? I don't know. Lux hurried over. Her glasses had been shoved into her hair like a headband. Tendrils of red framed her face. The dark blue dress was a beautiful contrast to her creamy skin. Quick fisted his hands to keep from trailing his finger up her arm. We'll need to shut it down and run a full diagnostic. Quick shook his head. That could take three weeks. It's Thanksgiving, bellowed Harvey. Lux chewed her thumbnail. Thirty-one days until Christmas Eve. That's cutting it awfully close Lux. Harvey pulled on his fluffy white beard. That thing was seriously impressive. Quick had shaved his face bare. Wearing the uniform didn't feel right with a beard. His hair was too long for military standards, but there hadn't been much time to get a haircut. Quick threw his shoulders back. We can do it, sir. Lux's hand fell away from her lips, and her eyes traveled over his uniform. He'd endured some intense inspections during his enlistment, but nothing that made him feel as hot under the collar as the look of appreciation in her eyes. Harvey's bushy eyebrows jumped up his forehead. Why do I like you right now? he asked. Quick quickly checked his grin. It must be the uniform, sir. Perhaps. He twitched his nose. We'll get started on this right away. See that you do. Harvey spun on his heel. I'll have Gail bring in some turkey sandwiches, and Oliver can spend the night with us. Quick saluted. As soon as the door closed behind him, the air in the room crackled. Lux sucked in and hurried over to turn off the machine. Her delicate but oh-so-shapely shoulders sagged. I'm sorry Quick. Sorry. It should have worked. Tonight was supposed to be your last night here. You were going to be free. Free? Lux, I'm here by choice. I heard. Thanks for volunteering to stick around and figure this out. She gave him a tentative smile. Of course. Robin bounded in with a picnic basket over one arm. Here. 
this is the best I could do. She set the basket by the door, brushed her hands, and left. So you want to eat something before we get started? She nodded. They took the basket to the middle of the room, setting up the picnic in the middle of the substation. Quick spread the blanket and luck settled, her dress billowing out around her. You look like a cupcake. She paused with her hand in the basket. I don't think I've ever been called that before. He laughed and unbuttoned his jacket. You're all fluffy, like frosting. He patted the fabric and it slipped and slid against his palm, triggering a memory of his hands buried in her hair while they kissed in front of a Christmas tree. He'd convinced himself that was a dream, but it came back as forceful as the memory of what he had for breakfast. Only this memory was much sweeter than Lucky Charms and way more satisfying. Lux rubbed her forehead. Quick, I'm so confused. What do you want? He tipped his head back, taking in the massive machine. I want this substation to work. I'm thrilled with the adjustments we've made to the original design. Christmas magic is unlike any power source on Earth. Everything we do here is groundbreaking. The science is so cool. Lux smiled wide, but it didn't reach her eyes. Choosing to put off her question, he said, This is nice. Do you picnic in substations often? Never. This is a first. He smiled softly. I wasn't talking about the picnic Lux. It's nice to talk to you. Without the stress. I've missed this. She dropped her gaze to her lap, her cheeks lifted in a tentative smile. I think you're rubbing off on me, I said my first Christmas swear today. Her chin came up. What was it? Tannenbaum. Nice. She nodded her head appreciatively. Lux continued to nibble at her sandwich. We should be running around like elves on Christmas Eve to get this done, but I don't want to. She folded the top over her sandwich bag and tossed it into the basket. I don't want you and Oliver to leave. Quick's heart pounded like a pogo stick. We don't want to go. Ever, she whispered. Never. Please Lux. Please don't mistake my discipline for distance. You love me. One side of his mouth lifted in a cocky grin. Excuse me. You're cute when you're confused. He used his hand to trace her cheek. Lux's whole body flushed, he could see the pink on her shoulders. You must love me if we spark like this. He pressed a kiss to her cheek. Don't you? Lux bit her lip. You have to believe quick. He pulled just far enough away that she could see the sincerity in his eyes. Lux, if you love me, I believe in us. I believe we can be a family. I believe we can make the world better with our love. He reached into his pocket for the letter he'd dashed off and handed it over. What's this? My Christmas letter. His nerves pulled tight and his palms grew moist. He tried to swallow, but his tongue was clumsy. Lux slowly unfolded the paper and read quietly. Dear Lux. I want us to be a family. I love you. Matthew Quick. Lux put her hand over her mouth and giggled. What? You signed your last name. She pointed to it on the sheet. He lifted his shoulders. So? So, did you think I wouldn't know which Matthew? He laughed at himself. I was nervous, okay. He reached out and tickled her side. You aren't supposed to tease a guy when he's trying to be romantic. Lux laughed. Oh, so this is you being romantic? She glanced around. Barnes, substations. Quick laughed, enjoying every second she looked at him like that. The stress and the tension and the darkness between them faded away. Snowflakes of magic began to appear. Lux lifted her face and let them brush her cheeks. Her brown lashes dropped and her light pink lips lifted into a contented smile. I love you quick. He touched her arm, and gold sparks shot out from the spot where their skin connected. He groaned in frustration. Lux bit her bottom lip. This is going to be tricky. 
he trailed his finger down her arm, the air crackling. We're smart, we'll figure it out. She placed her palm on his cheek. The magic snowflakes tripled in number, piling up on her dress, her creamy shoulders, and in her hair. Her phone alarm, tucked somewhere in the folds of that massive dress, buzzed loudly. They were pushing the limits. You are a dangerous man Matthew Quick. Her eyes twinkled at using his last name. I'm not going to live that one down, am I? Her lower lip poked out in mock sympathy. Probably not. He had military-grade discipline, but every man had his limits. Pushing to his feet, he reached for her hand and pulled her to standing. Lux quick. He had to throw in her last name too, just because he liked the sound of it. I promised you I wouldn't kiss you. Her brow dipped. I'd like to take that back. She put her hand on his chest, her elbow locked. Matthew Thomas Quick, I very much want to take you up on that offer. But I'm afraid we'd do some major damage. Her cheeks dusted pink, and passionate thoughts went to war with his self-control. You're right. He wanted to tear his hair out in frustration. Instead, he went for his tool belt. Let's get this done so we can really celebrate Christmas. Lux's smile lit up the whole room, literally. If Quick had any worries or doubts about her feelings for him, they were blown away. His hands stilled. Lux, I finally have my true purpose for being here. What is it? It's making you smile. If I can do that, every day for the rest of my life, then my life will count for something. Her eyes glistened. Matthew. She whispered his name, and it never sounded so sweet. They stepped towards each other and sparks of every color connected them. Their eyes widened and they took two steps back. Can you hold that thought for thirty-one days? He groaned. I am the master of my thoughts. I am the master of my thoughts, he muttered. Lux smothered another giggle and headed for the door. Her steps were lighter. Bouncy, even. I'm going to change, Jedi Master. She cast one long look over her shoulder that sent his blood pounding in his ears before she left. Ginger snaps, he cursed under his breath. Quick laid his head against the metal, wishing he could feel the cold so it would help clear his head. Instead, he noticed an increase in energy. With a start, he realized the magic was changing him. Or maybe he had changed and the magic was keeping up. Floating like a boxer entering the ring, he headed right for the circuit breaker. Bring it on. He cocked his head from side to side. I'm going to kick your sled, substation. No one and nothing keeps me from my wife. Christmas isn't going to know what hit it. Chapter 39 December 23rd One day until Christmas Eve Lux lifted the lantern higher so Matthew could see the wires better. Thanks, he muttered. What time is it? Lux rubbed her eyes. Two in the morning. They'd been working non-stop on the substation. Everything checked out. The last item to check was the wiring. Lux had gone over it that afternoon, and Quick was doing a backup check before they flipped the switch again. Quick sighed. Everything's correct. Okay, then. Moment of truth. He gathered his tools and shut the breaker box. They walked together to the switch. Lux was so tired, even her pinky fingers wanted to sleep. Three, two, one. Quick pulled the lever. There was a loud click, and nothing happened. Lux set the lantern on the ground. The weight of her failure pulled down on her exhausted limbs. I thought this would work. She rubbed her eyes. She'd hoped with all her heart that it would work, that she and Matthew would be able to be a family once and for all. The last thirty days had been sweet, sweet misery as they both knew what they wanted, that they were in love, but were unable to act on it. It should. Quick put his hands on his hips. Lux thought back to their first meeting at the Christmas pageant in Clearview. 
They talked about taking Oliver this year, but instead had sent him back to his mom for the holiday. She was out of the hospital, and her parents had hired a nurse and a housekeeper to help her while they were gone. She wanted Oliver close for Christmas. Since they had no guarantees Matthew and Lux decided it was better to have him in a safe environment, and Lux had flown him down this morning. She thought about saving Quick from freezing to death, twice. She thought about teasing him that he couldn't survive without her around to rescue him, and the way he had held her close in the barn. And then her thoughts picked up speed, tripping over one another. Matthew. She grabbed his arm. Do you remember that day your four-wheeler died and I saved you? Yes. I used magic to jumpstart the battery. She had tried the movement Dad used to create the magic with his fingers, and it had worked. I knew I saw sparks. Her cheeks flushed. Yes. She took a deep breath. What if Christmas magic needs a jump start? He rubbed his hands together. I am liking the way you think. She stepped closer, her knees knocking together. Kiss me. Are you sure about this? Lux wasn't. She wasn't sure about anything except the fact that they had a giant substation that needed enough magic to get it whirling. They'd made the mini-sub whirl with their kiss, so... It should. Should. You're so cute when you're confused. She ran her hand up his arm, growing in confidence. This would work. She could feel it all the way to her toes, which tingled. She was tingling. Lux. Matthew slowly wrapped his arms around her. Where's the sparks? He searched around them. Lux's shoulders dropped. We've been so careful this month. Maybe too careful. She sagged against him. We broke Christmas magic. No, he tipped her chin up. You have done everything you could to save Christmas magic. You even married me, and I know that was a trial. Huge tears gathered in her eyes and spilled down her cheeks. You're not a trial, Matthew. She placed her hand on his bare jaw. He'd continued shaving this month, and she loved the feel of his skin against her palm. And you're not a failure. No matter what happens with Christmas, you're amazing. He pressed his forehead to hers. I believe in you, my love. She closed her eyes as their lips brushed. The contact made a noise like connecting the two ends of live jumper cables. Crackle. Pop pop sizzle. Um, Matthew. Lux tried hard to open her eyes, but they were too heavy under the blanket of love and desire that had settled on the two of them. Quick cupped the back of her neck and tipped her head, burying his fingers in her hair. Lux moaned softly as he deepened the kiss. The very air around them began to hum. The hairs on her neck stood up. Her skin tingled. I love you, Quick gasped between kisses. I love you too. Lux couldn't get the words out fast enough. A boom pounded through her chest, originating somewhere between their two hearts. Red and green sparks arched through the air and zigzagged behind her closed eyelids. Overhead, things began to hum and buzz and there was a whirling that charged low in her belly. They slowly pulled apart, and Matthew began to sway and hum, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Lux's heart hammered. You remembered. He pulled her close and began to sway. In case you were wondering, this is me being romantic. Lux grinned, burying her face in his chest and floating away on his foresty crisp scent. Ginger to Lux. The walkie beeped at her belt. Way to go, sis. Oh my holly berries, I've got an overload of letters. Ginger, I hope you've checked the list twice. I'm on it, Robin, how's the stocking stuffers? We're cranking them out as fast as we can. Toys too, added Stella. Lux's jaw dropped open. 
She and Matthew turned to see giant red and green and gold and silver arcs of power jumping from switch to switch. Ha! Matthew picked her up and spun them around. It works. It works. She threw her arms in the air, and lines of power went from her to the station and back again, flooding her with pure and clean joy. There was one person she wanted to share this with. She put her hands on both sides of Matthew's face and kissed him. He brought her slowly down his body, that wonderful body she'd been dreaming about for months, until her feet were on solid ground again. Moving his hand to her lower back and lifting her other, he led her in a small box step. Lux followed his lead, and they were waltzing through a field of magic that faded into a beautiful ballroom with a full symphony and a giant Christmas tree. Is this a dream? asked Quick. It feels like a dream. It's like a dream, Lux replied. It's love. This is love. This is our love. He lowered her into a dip, holding her close and strong, and fulfilled her every Christmas wish with a kiss that spoke of everlasting joy and the type of passion that would feed Christmas magic for as long as they both shall live and love. Epilogue Well, old boy, quick patted Dunder's neck. I hope you enjoy tropical beaches. Dunder snorted in reply. Quick placed his arm around Lux, resting his hand on her soft, curvy hip. She leaned into him, and he breathed in her scent. Can we leave the reindeer home? He's grumpy, and I don't want grumpy on our honeymoon. Lux giggled. You're tickling me. He ran his fingers up and down her ribs, eliciting a peal of laughter. That's tickling. She turned into his arms. My mistake, she said before kissing him softly. He pressed both hands into those hips and brought her body flush with his. Moving together, they deepened the kiss. Someone cleared their throat, and he reluctantly loosened his hold on his beautiful wife. Later, he whispered, and her cheeks dusted pink. They turned to find the whole Kringle family watching them. Ginger and Joseph had returned from delivering presents less than a half hour ago. They were both windblown and travel-weary. Joseph gave him a guy's approval in a nod, and Ginger smiled ruefully as she hugged them both. Layla bounced around the two of them, peppering them with questions as they trudged out of the stables. Frost's hair stuck out of two low buns, and her eyes were rimmed in red. She'd read non-stop for 48 hours, sending constant updates to Ginger as they flew around the world. She'd dragged herself out from behind her desk to send them off. Stella had bags under her eyes that matched her ACDC tee. She hugged them both. I'm sleeping the whole time you're gone. Don't call me. Lux huffed and shared a like I would I roll with Matthew. Stella left, grabbing Frost's hand on the way out. They leaned on each other as they left. Robin set a giant basket on the seat of the sleigh. There's enough food in there for a week. If you stay on that deserted island much longer, you'll have to live off fish and coconuts. Quick grinned. A whole week with no one but his wife sounded like heaven. Not even the threat of starvation could dim his excitement. They'd picked a small, uninhabited island in the Pacific for their honeymoon destination. Though the world believed him dead, they didn't want to take any chances that he might be seen. Gail swooped in and hugged them both tight. I'll miss you. Don't worry about a thing. By the time you get back, Oliver will be here. Quick grinned. Amy had Oliver for Christmas, but his parents had offered to take him for the week. She was grateful for the help. Over the years, his mom and dad had made efforts to reach out to her, but Amy had strong-armed them away. Now, she was starting to see that they loved Oliver too. Gail was going to pick him up and bring him home. Home. Quick tucked Lux close to his side. He'd finally come home. Gail elbowed Harvey in his big belly. He grunted before offering his hand to Quick. I'm taking you off my list. Quick smiled as he pumped Harvey's hand. I appreciate that, sir. Harvey nodded and then turned to engulf Lux in a fatherly hug. 
She sniffed and swiped at her eyes. I love you, Dad. Thank you for letting me be a geek. Harvey ho ho hoed. Then he sniffed. With a jolly, quick wave, he left the stables, Gale patting his back. Lux sighed. He has a hard time letting go. Letting go. She nodded. You're my lead scientist now. I like the sound of that. Should we make it official? He asked. I thought we already did that, with the whole wedding thing and everything. Not quite. Quick reached into his pocket and retrieved the large diamond ring he'd had Stella conjure in her magic bag. We missed something. Lux's hand flew to her chest. Matthew, she whispered. Quick got down on one knee and took Lux's left hand in both of his. Lux Kringle Quick, will you be my wife? A slow, happy smile spread across her face. Her wonderful scent of chocolate peppermint filled his senses as she put their foreheads together. Yes. Quick hooked his hand behind her neck and pulled her down for a long kiss. Dunder snorted impatiently. Quick growled in response. Seriously, any other reindeer? Lux laughed and pulled him to his feet where he slipped the ring on her finger and kissed her hand before waving to the sleigh with a flourish. Our honeymoon awaits. Lux beamed. It's about time. She grabbed the front of his shirt and hauled him into the sleigh. He clasped his hands behind her back and picked up where they'd left off with the kiss. A few minutes later, they slowed down and he pulled back to brush her hair off her cheek and stare deep into her exotic green eyes. Lux gripped his arms. Do you think the substation will hold up? Quick lifted one side of his lips in a cocky grin. I'd like to give it a thorough test. Lux laughed, the sound like church bells ringing in his heart. She picked up the reins. Quick stood behind her, his hands on her hips. On, Dunder, she called flicking the reins. Dunder took them up, up, up into the sky. As the North Pole fell away behind them Quick tightened his arms around Lux. What are you grinning about, he asked. My Christmas wish came true, she murmured while her fingers combed through his hair. My every wish came true. He kissed her neck, and sparks flew through the air. Merry Christmas Matthew. She snuggled into his arms and he allowed the peace and joy she offered to sink into his soul. Once he'd opened the door to believing, he found not only the meaning of Christmas, but the meaning of life. He pressed a kiss to her hair. Merry life, my love. You've been listening to Lux A Marrying Miss Kringle Christmas Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell Welcome back if you made it this far. That's a good sign for both of us, right? Um, no, I really hope you enjoyed this story. Uh, the second book in the Marrying Miss Kringle series. There are five, actually six books total. Um, but at this point in time, I don't want to give away where that sixth book comes from. You can find it on Amazon now. It is not yet uploaded to YouTube. So I am working on that and it'll be up by this Christmas. So you will have it then, which is really exciting. Um, if you have any comments, questions or anything, leave them in the comments below. Please like and subscribe to this channel so that it can be found by other viewers who are looking for sweet romances. And I appreciate you being here and I will see you next week. Remember that you are loved.